Here we are at Misfit Central, the one and only, because today we're going to discuss something that I've been wanting to talk about for a very, very long time. Wait, before we do, Pascal says, we never take... We never take our Halloween deco away. This year will be special since Remy, my son, can walk around, realize things. He likes skulls more than teddy bears. Haha. Ha. No idea what we will do, though. That's wonderful, man. It, there's no there's no finer uh, pleasure in life than taking your, your child or a young child that you might be connected to trick-or-treating. It's a beautiful feeling um, if there's Halloween this year. Okay, so here we are at Misfit Central, and... The plan today is to review. We're going to look at Jerry Only's mindset in 1993. So remember, we did that last time we went to 1983. Well, I've been wanting to do 1993 because this is kind of like a career spanning interview for Jerry Only in 1993, uh, going from 77 to 83. And the reason why it's I think it's so interesting is because a it's before Misfits 95. He's still in lawsuits. They're, they're, they're still in legal legal headlocks with Glenn over the name and the ability to tour and record as the Misfits. Um, Christ the Conqueror is not successful. The only thing that exists is the original band, and it's the original band after Metallica has, you know, and, you know, Guns N' Roses and all that propelled the band, helped propel the band into its cult-like status. So, you know, early 90s, the misfits really are punk. You know, Tony Matura said this earlier today in, in the group, and I really think I agree with him. You know, the misfits are sort of like punk rock's best kept secret, especially at that time in the 90s, in the late 80s, too. I would say. By the way, we have some really cool guest people coming, hopefully. I don't want to say too much more yet. I'm trying, working on it right now, but I think we have some cool shows coming up in that regard as well should mention that um so and the and then it's like well jeff why do we we know how we we've seen there's a million interviews with jerry only and and what's funny is the interview we watched last week and and or listened to last week in 1983 was really funny because it in it uh glenn is the one that's doing all the talking jerry is not the gregarious motor mouth that he normally you know you know is and instead it's like you know jerry's super soft spoken and now you know uh, 10 years later this this is 10 years after that interview in 1983 here here's jerry you know just bearing it all you know just talking a mile a minute i would imagine and he did this for ugly things number 12 now ugly things number 13 featured joey image and that interview is actually used in 1979 i i i, I pilfered from that what I did was I read the interview like I do want here. I read the interview. I recorded myself reading the interview and then spliced that into the, the film to sort of help Jerry, sorry, Joey, tell his side of the story for, for things that happened in London, England. So this uh, this article was reprinted with the permission of Mike Stacks, who did the interview. He also did the interview for Joey Image in the next issue. Joey Image did that interview in response to Jerry Only's interview here. So Jerry's, excuse me, Jerry's interview here is uh, uh, causes uh, Joey Image to speak up and sort of try and set the record straight from his angle of things. Um, and yeah, I just really like I like dissecting this stuff because, like I said, you're you're sort of hearing like unfiltered, less bias, or you're hearing truths in 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 different light. You know, it's not to say. You know, the thing about interviews and interviewing the same person over and over again is you're going to get rehearsed answers. That's what happens with these guys. They rehearse their answers. They give you the, the, the same sound bite that they give to everybody. I mean, if you do that many interviews, look at Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney does so many fucking interviews, has done so many. Been, he's been interviewed about the Beatles for 55, 60 years at this point, right? At some point, you're... You know, every interview is going to start to sound the same. And so the thing about the misfits that every, you know, every year as, as the longer they're around, the more the history sort of changes, gets revised, gets, you know, uh, uh, rose colored glasses come on and off 
depending who's on who's in bed with who, who's making money with who. And so this is interesting to hear Jerry give his side of the street 10 years on since they broke up uh, before uh, Jerry's probably, you know, Jerry's spending a lot of money at this point. Cause you know, what some, what happens is in the, in the mid eighties, uh, you know, Jerry, we've, we've sort of gone over this a little bit. I, I'm not going to rehash it too much. Cause I want to dive into this. I don't have all the time in the world tonight, but basically Jerry, uh, Jerry's dad, Jerry senior, right. Jerry Kaffa senior is like, what the fuck? Like, like, what are you fucking crazy? Go out there and get your name back. You know, uh, go, you know, you spent all that money on all those recording, you know, you should be getting royalties, yada, yada, yada. So th- with motivation from, from Jerry and Doyle's father, Jerry and Doyle, you know, see, s- strike legal action against Glenn and start this long, long legal battle that lasts for, I mean, years and years and years. They really were preparing for that battle. I think the I think the legal proceedings really started actually in 88 maybe. They had a they had a one lawyer and he didn't work out too well. And then they had a second lawyer and that's the guy who they they sought victory. They 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 won victory, I guess if you can call it victory. It was a settlement. It was actually a settlement that was not even paid by Glenn, it was paid by Caroline who who had struck a deal with Glenn for all the Misfits master recordings and you know that Caroline can't make any money if these guys are not squared away. So Caroline paid Glenn's share of the royalties, I believe, something like that, uh, back royalties uh, to all the former members who, who were in on the suit, of not which everybody was in on the suit. Uh, I don't believe Bobby Steele and Joey Image were in on the suit initially. I think eventually they got in on the suit or eventually they got a piece, but not initially. They did not. They were not, they were not in on that. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, so... Here it is. Well, we're just going to read through this. And if you have that issue, man, I mean, it's a cool issue. It's got tons of photographs in it. And uh, I've seen it. I've, I've seen pictures of it. I've seen scans of it. It's it's a pretty cool issue. And at the time, the other thing to remember about this before we launch in, it's like, Jeff, shut the fuck up with the preamble. Get on with it. I know. I know. I just love hearing myself talk. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is that this is like, this is like the goods from the source in a pre-internet age. There's no internet right now. Does the internet exist? It does, but not in the way, not, not in the way it would. And so therefore, like, if you wanted to find out about a band, man, like these zines, there was like a time where these zines kind of ruled the roost in the sense that, you know, you're getting these breakdowns of these bands that you virtually can't find. There's nobody's writing about them in books. You know, there's the music, there are the word of mouth stories, and there are the memories from the people who were there. And then you get articles like this, and this is like the basis of everything, you know, uh, at least at that time. So, so, so that's another thing to consider. It's like 1993, and you're like, holy shit, I'm like finding out about this band, you know, I'm like finding out all this information about this band that I didn't know. I'd only had, I only had a couple of cassette tapes that my friend gave me at the skate park, and I think they look really cool, and I love the pictures of them on their on their uh, LPs, you know, and their singles and stuff or whatever photographs I can get a hold of that I find in punk magazines. But here's a full tell all interview with Jerry only himself. Like, wow, I can't wait to read this and find out the information. So let's see what uh, Jerry says, because I'm sure if you were to match up what Jerry says in this interview with everything that Jerry says now in every interview post the year 2000, it's going to be different, slightly different. A variation. Uh, here's the interview. If you'd like to follow along with me, and I will stop from time to time to comment and or stumble over my words because, as we all know, I suck at reading out loud. Okay. All hell breaks loose. Section one: Misfits. All hell breaks loose. The misfits walked among us, flesh-eating astro zombies just arrived from Mars, grave robbers from outer space. Landing in barren fields to steal your children from their beds and indoctrinate them to their violent world. Only ones, lonely ones. It's a transformation with an urge to kill. Prime directive, exterminate the whole human race. Um, hey, what's up, Jeremy? How are you, buddy? Hope you're well and safe somewhere in California, right, Jeremy? Jeremy's from California, I think. Uh, the Jerry Only Interview by Mike Stacks. That little intro right there is essentially, it's just made up of Misfits lyrics. Just show you how visual this band, this band is such a visual 
band. Okay. They looked like they had just stepped off the stage of some long forgotten horror movie, a nightmare shock of ghoulish black leather, cool menacing muscle and scowling skull like faces, each bisected by a long point of hair. The devil lock <laughs> uh, live. They were chaotic, unforgettable. The stocky, powerful singer, Glenn, Glenn Danzig would Wound tight like a cold steel trap, howling, snapping in the kind of tense fury, towering on either side, the twins of evil, the brothers, Jerry and Doyle, their huge arms savagely attacking their guitars as if the instruments were the last barricade to be broken down before all hell really broke loose. And they waded into the crowd, tearing and plundering. Death comes ripping the world of dangerous fun. Prime Directive, exterminate the whole fucking place. And the music. There's not been a punk band before or since who could match the power and the fury of the misfits in their prime. They had it all. Energy, melody, hooks, all locked together in short, totally original songs filled with images torn from the pages of EC horror comics, 50 Bees movies, and Glenn's own twisted, morbid imagination Though they didn't release an album until 1982's classic Walk Among Us and weren't widely known until then. The, so that's so cool. This is so cool. In 1993, like this is pre-static age. So so people are like, you know, the, maybe like like insider fans know what static age is, but for the casual misfits fan, they don't know what static age is. So the first album is Walk Among Us. The first album didn't come out until 1982, not 1978, and shelved. How crazy is that? That this is 1993. Another thing to to mention. Sorry, I have I have to trim my nose beard. I have like the 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 hair tickles my my nostrils. Sorry about that. If you see me, I did not do any lines of coke. It looks like I'm going. It's not the case. Um. So fuck. Why did I do that? Um. Mind you, also, it's 1993. Danzig, Glenn Danzig, is fronting Danzig, and Mother is huge in the metal world. It's huge in the, in the MTV world. The Mother 93 video has come out. That's the type of shit that's going on. So when Jerry's giving this interview, he's giving it when Glenn Danzig is at his peak of fame, I would say, in May, or, or reaching breaking peak mainstream success that he would as Danzig. You know, not 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 because of the cult of the misfits and not from a tendered uh, tenured career in Danzig, but because he had a hit song on the radio, top 40 hit mother and and a, and a video that was that was huge um, of the mother 93 video. That's why Glenn Danzig is big in 1993. Some people go, oh, yeah. And he also sang for the misfits. The misfits are not the misfits. The misfits today are not the misfits then. So these are all things to remember when Jerry's giving this interview. I really feel like context is necessary when, when reading whatever Jerry is going to say here. Um, so again, uh, reveling in the fact that Walk Among Us came out in 82 and you know, Static Age is, is virtually unknown by anybody um, not familiar with the band. Uh... They weren't widely known until 1982. The Misfits actually date back to 1977 when the first lineup of the band was formed by Glenn Danzig and bass player Jerry only. The band lasted from early 77 until Halloween 83, leaving behind a string of explosive records in their wake. Unlike many of their peers, the Misfits music has endured. And the reason why it's endured is because they left a string of explosive records in their wake. That's why um, you, uh, you know, again, I was talking about this on pizza punk in the first episode, little spoiler. We were talking about like, why aren't the stimulators who were such a important influential punk band to other punk bands? Why are they not as well known as the misfits or like, why are they not like as well known as they should be? You have to be pretty insider baseball to be familiar with the stimulators, which is Harley Flanagan's first band. Harley and Paris were in a band together. And the reason is they didn't record anything. There's no records. They had one seven inch single. You can hear 
uh, Nick from the stimulators in my documentary talking about discovering the misfits and whatnot, playing with the misfits and whatnot. But yeah, they had one single and they were on the thrash compilation. That's it. That's how no, nobody knows them. Nobody knows them. Otherwise the stimulators, but same thing with the mad, but the misfits were constantly recording and constantly putting out singles. And they were continuously putting out material for those seven years. It wasn't like they put out one record, waited five years, and then put out another record. They never stopped putting shit out. Like, there was always something coming out. Maybe there was might be a year between releases at most, but there was always material coming out, even two years past their 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 demise, all the way up to Legacy of Brutality. If you really want to for new material coming out, we spoke about that last week. Uh, so I mean, this is like all stuff to remember. That's why this is such a cool archival thing to unpack in my opinion um unlike many of their peers the misfits music has endured today they are more popular than they ever were when they were together and that popularity has only grown because this was written in 1993 collectors pay a small fortune for original copies of their early seven inches and bootlegs of all kinds multiply and now we were just talking about how a, a legacy brutality went for close to twenty three thousand dollars. holy shit who would have thought that it would increase and grow and expand and explode even more, you know? When Metallica covered two of their songs on an album, they introduced a new generation of kids for the Misfits, and the legend grew. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. More than any other reason, the Misfits have prevailed because they created a sound and an image that is exciting, entertaining, and wholly unique. The band's breakup in 1983 was bitter by anyone's standards. Glenn Danzig's subsequent projects, Sam Hain and then Danzig, have given him a platform that no other misfits have been allowed. That's right. So this is Jerry. Right now, I would say this interview is one of Jerry's like biggest platforms, really, truly. I mean, the largest one yet in, in that time, in those 10 years. Um, in interviews, Danzig usually seizes the opportunity to denigrate his old bandmates belittling their contributions while there is no denying that the creative vision of the misfits was glenn's the role of the other members was absolutely vital a fact that this article will make clear so at this time while during the lawsuit and this is why this is interesting shit at this time jerry only and doyle are both publicly claiming over and over and over again because you notice they stop after 95 that really mostly goes out the window for the most part that they wrote a percentage of the music and were fighting for publishing they wanted publishing they felt that they were entitled to songwriting credit for say helping in arranging or whatever it is that they did and i believe that, that there is some truth in that i think that Glenn may have written the songs, but from everything that I read and hear about Glenn, and you'll hear more about that in 1979, I think that Glenn would, would bring his, his songs, his songs, to people, and people, it was just like George Harrison and Paul McCartney and John Lennon. Any John Lennon, Paul McCartney composition has written contributions from George Harrison. That's the truth, man. Even if even if they wrote the song by themselves, even if they wrote the song together, George would do some little thing. He would add some little thing. He'd bring a bridge. He would do a little noodle. He would do a little thing, or he would just bring his his guitar flourishes. Do guitar flourishes equate songwriting credit? No, I don't think so. But I do believe that I do believe that Jerry and Doyle helped shape and structure some of those songs but not enough in a way that they would rightfully claim songwriting credit. So I think the, 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 the lawyer's decision was probably correct. And again, let us, let us say that when we 100% do not know, nobody fucking knows. All we have are what people fucking tell us. Cause you know what? The only people that were in those rooms were those fucking guys fleshing out those songs. Okay. That's the truth. That's the honest truth. But if you listen to every other fucking band member in any one of Glenn's bands, they all say they're Glenn's songs. Glenn brings us the songs. We shape them. Listen to John Christ. John Christ is, has absolutely no reason to fucking lie or embellish or make anything up. And that dude, I think, tells it the way it is. And he talks about it. There's a great interview uh, on this thing called Music is the Lifeblood. And they talk thoroughly 
about how Glenn, where Glenn got to a point where they were working together and Glenn would just, Glenn would hum humming shit. He would record into his, into your tape recorder and be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then, you know, John Christ would interpret that, you know? Uh, so it's like Glenn, you know, it's, I don't know, man. It's like that, that's the songwriting process. But John Christ does not take credit for those songs. He, and he doesn't go, I kind of had a hand in writing those songs. He fully admits it's Glenn's vision, Glenn's songs. But, you know, this, you know, Glenn, it was here I am interpreting them on guitar. Um, so at this point in time, though, Jerry is probably in this interview, I would imagine. Jerry is going to explain how, you know, he contributed this lyric, you know, uh, bedtime for the midnight masses for Devil's Whorehouse or, you know, just stuff like that. You know, uh, does that con does that does that equate songwriting? I don't know. I don't think so. What do you guys think? Why don't you all weigh in on this? You tell me what you think. I don't know. I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Anyway, um, so that's so this interview is 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 to set is to clear the air during a lawsuit, uh, to set the record straight and to get for the first time anywhere the full story of the misfits. I talked to the man who was a misfit for the duration, Jerry Olin. That's true, man. From 77 83, Jerry was fucking there. And here he is trying to tell the full story from his point of view. Jerry, or Mo, as he's now known, when he was in Christ the Conqueror, he was known as Mo. Christ the Conqueror would eventually become Misfits 95. In a way, Misfits 95 really is just Christ the Conqueror with Michael Graves singing and then trying to write Misfit songs and capitalize on the Misfits name, truthfully, honestly. And again, I like those albums. Yes. Even after all that shit with Chud and all Michael Graves, I still like those fucking albums, man. They have their time in their place. Are they misfits? Hell fucking no. No, they are not. Uh, are they fun nostalgia trips for me? Yeah, that's what they are. You know, I, I appreciate those songs for what they are. Not misfit songs. Um, Christian songs, actually. Yeah, they're Christian songs. Anyway, our story begins. Uh, Jerry or Mo, as he's now as he's as he's now known, is a great guy. He comes across as a direct, honest, no bullshit person. He was totally candid in answering all of my numerous questions. His recollection of events was sharp, colorful, and we had a lot of laughs. Our story begins in the line of New Jersey. I believe that too, man. I think that's really accurate. Um, in the sense of like at this time, 1993, Jerry is direct, he's honest. And he's no bullshit. And at that time, he view, fully fucking believes that he should have songwriting credit for his contributions. Because they were. They are his contributions. Um, and he just believes he should have songwriting credit for them. And the judge ruled that or they he settled with Glenn not to. And here's the last thing I'll say. Again, I'm not taking a side here. However, if you truly fucking wrote songs, like if you actually wrote those fucking songs, would you, would you not fight? I mean, those are like your children. Would you not fucking, would you settle? Would you agree taking the name and the ability to record and tour over publishing over things that you created? I don't know. I don't know that someone would agree to that, which leads me to believe that while Jerry may have had some input, that does not mean that he is the writer of those songs. I don't know. Our story begins in Lodi, New Jersey. Uh, MS Mike Stacks. What first got you into music when you were a kid? Jerry only. When I was a kid, we used to go see Alice Cooper and Kiss and the Allman Brothers and shit like that. Anything that was a, uh that was at the outdoor concerts during summer vacation. Actually, what really what made me really want to play was that I saw Di David Bowie's Diamond Dogs tour in 1974. I believe it was. I think I was a junior in high school. I wasn't one of those people who played their whole life, you know. I actually picked up bass in March and in April I did my first show. Ha <laughs> ha. So it was a real quick learning procedure, but I think that it speaks for itself. Uh, I got down in a relatively short, I got it down in a relatively short amount of time. When I saw that diamond dog stage show, I said to myself, man, this motherfucker is getting paid for this and I got to go to work. There's something totally wrong here. Cause what I, uh, cause I would do that for nothing. You know what I mean? Ha <laughs> ha. When I saw it, when I saw him, I said, how much money is this guy making at the time? 
it was like 12, uh, 10 or 12 bucks a ticket. It wasn't actually the money, though. It was the love of what I saw. I kind of liked the entertaining with the stage show and everything. The music just puts it all together. Um, so, yeah. So he says he doesn't. He picked up the bass in March. and He was playing his first show in April. He did that at the CBD, CBGB's audition showcase. He had gotten the bass or he had ordered the bass in December, and it took a long time to get there. But that's interesting. So Jerry isn't so if the misfits started in january that leaves that leaves those two months for those rehearsals or that time where diane or maybe even in 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 fall of 76 as if you look at some of those lawsuits glenn claims that he was using the misfits name in the fall of 76 so guys like jimmy battle and diane di piazza and manny and mr jim catania are you know all involved during that time uh right up until march when jerry joins the band so jerry joins in march interesting um mike stacks but it was actually a few years later that you actually picked up a bass right jerry only i got it for christmas 1976 but it came late there you go there there's the that's that's the thing i had to wait for it and i actually got it at the beginning of february so i practiced two months and then glenn and myself formed the misfits in march of 77 so that's what Jerry says. Jerry says, Glenn and I formed the Misfits in March of 1977. While if you listen to what's his face, uh, Manny, Manny will tell you that him and Glenn were jamming in his basement as the Misfits uh, with just uh, Glenn on keys and Manny on drums. And then Glenn said to Manny, hey, we need a bass player. And that's when Jerry comes in. But from Jerry's perspective, as Jerry saw it, Jerry might have not considered that the misfits. Jerry considers it the misfits when it's the three of them. And frankly, I consider it the misfits when it's the three of them. When those three formed and they started and they played that CBGB showcase, that's the misfits. Is Diane Di Piazza the misfits? No, she's not. Was she there at the beginning? Yeah, she was there as the band, pro the project is forming. Glenn might have had some of those songs written already. You know, I still think of Jerry. Jerry is the is is a, is a necessary component element for the Misfits to be the Misfits, and that's the friggin' truth. Um, Mike Stacks asks, "How did you meet Glenn?" Jerry only says, "I met Glenn through the drummer Manny, who played on the first single. I used to hang out with friends at a park in town. It was the local hangout, and Manny's house happened to be next door to the park. The side of his house was at the gate to the park, so I would hear them playing and shit." And I never thought much about it. Manny was a bit uh, Manny was a bit jazzier than the kind of shit I like to play. He'd go down there and jam to Santana for you and shit like that. And for me, I didn't want to hear Santana play to Santana. What I would want to hear Manny. Uh, why would I want it? Sorry. Why would I want to hear Manny play to Santana? You know, ha <laughs> ha. So Manny introduced me to Glenn, and that's how he formed the band. I think that's a, there. You go. There is an appraisal. He introduced Manny introduces Glenn to Jerry, and there you go. That's the fucking band. Um, Mike Stack says, "What kind of music was Glenn into when you first met him?" Jerry only. I don't know if you'd call. Uh, I don't know if you know a band called the Adverts? Question mark. Mike Stacks. Yeah, Jerry only. He was into the Adverts. He was into Generation X. We were all into the Damned along those lines. Basically, British punk. Let me take that again. Mike Stacks, what kind of music was Glenn into when you first met him? Jerry Only. I don't know if you know a band called The Adverts. Mike Stacks, yeah. Jerry Only. Glenn was into The Adverts. He was into Generation X. We were all into The Damned. Along those lines, basically British punk. I did that for a purpose because I'm going to use that soundbite in 1979 and stick it in a place where I needed it to be. Perfect. I needed that soundbite. Uh, what first and and I've heard that in interviews that Glenn was a big fan of the adverts. The adverts are a great fucking band. If you're not familiar with them, uh, they have this song called uh, Welcome to the New Church, the uh, New Model Army. Great fucking band. Check out the adverts. Um, Mike Stacks asked, what first got you into punk rock? Jerry only. Well, I just liked it. You know, I was always a big Ramones fan. We used to go down to CBGBs and stuff to see the Ramones. At the time, they had just they just had one single out. At the time, they just had one single out. I wasn't hard. It wasn't. I wasn't hard right away. What? 
I wasn't hard right away to just grasp the concept. You look at them and you said, Hey, these guys are a band, but we're fucking wait. <sighs> hey, these guys are bad, but we're fucking badder than this. You know what I mean? Uh, Mike stacks right away. What was the sound of the original misfits when you first formed? This will be interesting. Let's see what he says here. Jerry only the sound of the misfits was very talking heads ish Devo type sound. I'd say with keyboards at the time. Wow. So he thinks of it as Devo, as a Devo talking heads. I, I'm st I stand by everything I said in the first episodes. If you have not watched them, check them out. We talk in depthly about the three piece that was the Misfits in '77, and I believe that they are just they're just like an art rock Doors. That's what they are. They're just the Doors, man, straight up. So, but Jerry says um, the sound of the Misfits was very talking heads ish Devo type sound. I'd say with keyboards at the time, it was just bass. It was just bass, keyboards, and drums. We didn't have the image yet. We really didn't know what we were doing yet. We were feeling our way in. But we got there and did it as we played our first show. I think it was April 18th at CBGB's. Uh, Mike Stacks, were you opening for somebody? Jerry only. It was actually like an audition night. Mike Stacks. What was your set like to start? Was uh was it stuff that Glenn had written? Jerry only. Yeah, it was stuff like she cough cool bullet was written because Glenn actually had bullet written six years before the band. A lot of the earlier stuff Glenn had ideas for, and sorry, a lot of the earlier stuff Glenn had ideas for, and he was working on it for a while, but it didn't really gel until it all came to be. Until it came to be, I mean. I mean, ideas are great until, I mean, idea are great until get them, put them down, worked out, and you work a little bit of a buzz about them, and then they become something tremendous as opposed to just a good idea, you know? So that's interesting. Sorry for the broken English there. Let's take that one more time. So Jerry says it was stuff like she, cough, cool, bullet, um, Glenn had Bullet written six years beforehand, uh, before the band. So in 1971, Glenn had Bullet, apparently, according to according to Jerry. Glenn says it was three years before. A lot of the early stuff Glenn had ideas for, and he was working on for a while, but it didn't really gel until it came to be. I mean, ideas are great until you get them, put them down, and work them out. And you work a little bit of a buzz about them, and then they become something tremendous, as opposed to just a good idea, you know? Mike Stacks, how long, blah, blah, blah. how long until after the band first started did you do the first single? Jerry only. Wow, this is really, pff, this is some interview. Jerry only. Not long, uh, not long at all. It actually came out in like June. Glenn was a stickler at getting in there right away with something. Me, I'm more of a sit back and prepare and practice and get things ready kind of guy. He was like, hey, let's just go. The good thing about just going, you get a little bit of experience of playing shows and stuff like that. But at the same time, I think it distracted us from what we should have been working on. We should have sat down and said, hey, we'll work on the band this way or we'll work on the band that way. But over the years, it found its own way. Things will find their own way if they're not pushed in a certain direction. Cough Cool was a tentative first step. It builds quietly from the simple pulse of Jerry's bass and Glenn's electronic electric sync piano. The gaps being filled with Manny's complicated drum patterns. That's a great way to put it, I would say. As the song progresses, it has a dark, intriguing quality. Matter of fact, Raphael, the guy who I thought was talking shit uh, from the Chud thing, he actually posted something very thoughtful in our Misfits group. Check it out. Credit to Raphael. Uh, he basically is saying that Glenn is writing cough. Cool is actually about a vampire. And if you read those lyrics, they're the way that they're broken down, check it, find the thread in the, in our, in our fan, in our Facebook fan group. It's really great thread. And I think it really breaks the song down in, in a wonderful way that, that really makes sense to me. I don't know. Um, it has a dark, intriguing quality, but Glenn, but Danzig, blah, blah, but Danzig silky and leather voice. Something somewhere between Elvis Presley and Jim Morrison is the only part already in place in a record which sounds very different to what the Misfits would become. The B the B side 
She is a step closer, picking up the tempo and letting Jerry's thumping bass attack give the sparse sound some guts at the bottom end. Later, a guitar track was added to She. Actually, I believe it was completely re-recorded. And it is this version which appears on the Legacy of Brutality album and the Misfits collection. So there is no static age. It just appears on, on, those, two on those two recordings. 500 copies were pressed of the original single, though, as with all the Misfits records, several bootleg versions exist. It caused barely a ripple on the New York punk landscape, but it was an interesting beginning. Jerry only. We switched personnel immediately after the first single. Ma Manny wound up being a drunk and not practicing. The thing was musically, he, he and I didn't gel too much. Take that one more time. Jerry only. We switched personnel immediately after the first single. Ma Manny wound up being a drunk and not practicing. The thing was, musically, he and I didn't gel too much. I wasn't an experienced musician, so to say. But at the same time, I knew what was cool to play and what sucked to play. Trying to play shit that's all over your head when you're not good enough to pull it off sucks. You know what I mean? But that was Manny's attitude. Hey, let's do solos. I said, Manny, I'm not interested in playing a fucking bass solo. I don't know if you've even heard a bass solo, but they're very boring. Ha ha ha. I mean, I like the bass, but I wouldn't want to sit there and sit through a bass solo. And I don't think there should be one just so there's a drum solo. If you catch what I mean. Ha ha ha. I really, I, I agree with that. That's, I think that's very, see, this is a cool interview with Jerry. I really feel like Jerry, I think this is like the real Jerry. This is like the, the brass tax, like, you know, uh, like just, just uh, uh, super open, super receptive Jerry. Who's, who's going to talk about this stuff. Um, so we blew off Manny and got this guy, Mr. Jim. Then Glenn got off the keyboards and we brought in this guy, Frank Licata, whose name is Franche Coma. Mike Stacks, who was Mr. Jim? Jerry only. Jim Catania. He was from Lodi also. He was about the same uh, age. He was about the same age as Glenn in that area. Then what happened was, so Jim, Mr. Jim, Manny, Glenn were all roughly the same age, along with Steve Linder, Jerry Byers, uh, fucking Tony. Fuck, what's his name? I forget. Tony something. Um, Pete Tiago, I think, is another guy. Uh, all these guys are like the Lodi. They're, they're, they're all just like Lodi musicians. And all you do is back then, there was just a pool of musicians, and they'd all jam together and jam on various projects. And that's how you get something like Kudat and Bujang or Talis or um, Pony, which is prostitutes in New York. Um, then what happened was we had a label called Blank Records. If you ever notice, Cough Cool came out on blank. Immediately afterwards, Mercury Records came out with a Pere Ubu album. I, I, you know, I never know if I'm saying that name correctly. Pere Ubu? Pere Ubu? Pere Ubu? It's one of those things you read, but you never say out loud until you say it out loud. It doesn't sound right. And put it on a label they called blank. But we already had Cough Cool out, and nobody knew about it. So legally, so legally the release of Cough Cool wound up binding us to the name and put them in jeopardy of being sued by us. But we had no money to sue them. They came to a compromise where they would buy the name blank from us for studio time. So we went in and recorded Static, TV Casualty, Angel Fuck, Bullet, Teenagers from Mars, a, a whole album. It was supposed to be called Static Age with 13 cuts on it. So right then and there. I don't know if this is the first time. There, have been men there were a bunch of interviews prior. But could this be the like the the public being revealed that static age exists like outside of like punk circles like this is where people casual skateboarders who picked up ugly things number 12 who are reading this are like going wow there's an album called static age whoa who would have thought that's pretty interesting um the tracks which would make up the aborted static age album showed the new Harder edged misfits as a band who could easily hold their own against or even surpass their contemporaries. In particular, Glenn's creative songwriting and powerful, wide ranging vocal di dynamics. Check out the songs, uh, check out the incredible comeback, for example, set the misfits apart from the pack. The song Static Agent TV Casualty 
present frightening real life portraits of the world as seen through the eyes of a new generation of children raised by the icy blue glow of their television and video screen, a theme that lay at the core of the misfits future direction as B movie horror mutants. The horror obsession was already taken form had the horror session. The horror obsession was already taking form in spinal remains return of the fly and most importantly, an earlier version of Teenagers from Mars, which portrayed them as nihilistic, avenging invaders from outer space. Eight of the Static Age songs can be found on the 1986 Legacy of Brutality album, although clumsily, rem uh, remix although clumsy remixing has obscured some of the group's power in a drum-heavy balance. Let me say that one more time. Eight of the Static Age songs can be found on the 1986 Legacy of Brutality album, although clumsy remixing has obscured some of the group's power in a drum-heavy balance. This is particularly evident on the otherwise brilliant hybrid moments, which should be sought out in its original form on various boots to fully appreciate its impact. However, the recordings do show that by the beginning of 1978, virtually all the pieces were already in place. Wow, that is so interesting. So I guess, yeah, so I guess people did were familiar with boots, with the boots that were out there at that time um, that you could get those Static Age songs. Jerry only. That stuff was ready to go when Blondie's first album was out. The Ramones' first or on the way to the second was out. Yeah, uh, their stuff was already recorded, but no one understood what it was. You know what I mean? That stuff was already recorded, but nobody understood what it was. You know what I mean? That was one of the problems with the band was that we were too underground. Mike Stack says, yeah, if they would have, if that would have come out then, yeah, if that would have come out then, you would have been at the forefront, which brings me to a point that Tony Matura made, again, in the group today as a part of that earlier comment. What would have been like if, if Static Age had come out on Mercury Records, they had option the album because they were thinking about it, and it did come out, and it was a smashing success. What would that mean for everything? Well, for starters, I don't think, I think Mr. Jim and Franche Coma would have stayed in the band. That's number one. You would have seen a, a follow-up album with those guys in the band. You, there would be no Walk Among Us, and there most certainly would be no Earth AD. Uh, Frank still might have been replaced by Doyle at some point. Who knows? Uh, essentially, you just wouldn't get any of those awesome. We wouldn't get any of the awesome singles that we got. I don't think so. I really, really don't think so. A lot of the songs that were recorded on those singles were written in 1978. So they might have come out in just a follow up. You know, Frank plays on a lot of that stuff and they would have come out as a follow up. That's what the follow up would have been. The follow up would have probably been something more along the lines of 12 Hits from Hell with a bunch of those songs on it. Uh, Jerry only. Well, the thing was, if it would have come out, then everything would have uh, moved up five years. We wouldn't we would have been. <clears throat> well, the thing was, if we would have come out, then everything would have moved up five years. We would have been the forerunners of the new scene instead of the new scene happening in 1987. You know, that was the main problem with our band that we didn't focus and get someone to sit down and look at the imagery. But, you know. We were a band and we were having a good time and we could give a fuck, you know? Haha. <laughs> so basically that was the problem with it. We had some really great stuff ready to go at the same time, like generation X's first album uh, at the same time. So I'm getting lost in the, the lines here. We had some really great stuff ready to go at the same time, like generation X's first album came out, but we didn't get an album out till 82. And then it came out on Slash, and they were pushing fear at the time. What happened was our thing went right down the tubes. It's unfortunate, but the but the Misfits was doomed to drop out once we didn't get that first project out the door. So Jerry only believes that the Misfits, this is what Sean was saying. This is totally what Sean was saying um, in, in our Little Fiend deep dive that this is what th this is what doomed the band ultimately had they had had static age come out when it was supposed to 
things would have been so different. What happened was our thing went right down the tubes. It's unfortunate, but the Misfits was doomed to drop out once we didn't get that first project out the door, which is why, in a lot of ways, I'm taking my time the second time around. And he's referring to Christ the Conqueror. I don't think he's referring to Misfits right now. Alberto says, Franche has come out and said he knew the band would have become as huge as it did if he wouldn't have left. Well, I think that's a different thing than, than, you know, what, than saying that Static Age would have been huge. And by, by proxy, so would have him had he, you know, uh, but not because he stayed or didn't stay in the band. It was all, it's all predicated on, on Static Age coming out, really. Um, the four song bullet EP on the band's own plan nine label after plan nine from outer space natch was in a way the misfits real debut consolidating their consolidating their transformation from the subtle art punk sound. So that's what, yeah, art punk. That's what it is. Art punk sound of cough cool into a roaring high speed guitar driven punk rock band somewhere between the Ramones and the early damned. Every song is top notch. Bullet, an incredible sex and death fantasy about the JFK assassination set to the fury of a gale force hurricane, the stomping anth anthem anthemic, 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 anthemic. How do you say that word out loud? Anthemic, anthemic, anthem, anthemic, anthemic, anthemic. We are 138, Hollywood, Babylon. A sinuous, a sinuous, mood-drenched look at the evil side of Hollywood, inspired by Kenneth Anger's book and the snotty, threatening attitude. It really is snotty. That's a great way to put it. With the band proving they could employ melody and even harmony with the danger, without the danger of being called pop. Uh, Mike Stack says, not long, Mike Stack, not long after Bullet, the horror image really started, right? Jerry only. Yes. As a matter of fact, it came out right between bullet and horror business. That's when I came up with the devil lock thing. Mike stacks. How'd you come up with that? Jerry only. Well, at the time when horror business was released, I had, I had this electric blue hair, not that sissy turquoise color. It was like brand new denim jeans. Ha <laughs> ha. It was really slick. So I had this thing and my hair started to grow. What happened was as it got longer, I just kept messing with it. So I did this wave thing with it, this tidal wave do. And as it got longer, it just grew down the front. Then we did our hair black and that was it. Once we got this hard business thing, all of the sudden we had an identity. We looked good. And all of a sudden the sound was right. Mike Stack says, what did you use to keep the devil lock in place? Hairspray? Jerry only some hairspray, but in the end, I would end up using Vaseline because hairspray was really burning my eyes. Um, uh, when I toured with uh, this guy, uh, Joe uh, Vasta, JV bastard, what he would do, uh, what he and some of the other guys would do is they, they wouldn't use Vaseline. They would put, he put KY jelly in his hair. That's how he kept his hair from getting all messy in his face. He would put, goops of of ky jelly before every show that that, that 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 he would go out and do 55 nights i watched him do this he just goop his hair uh kind of gross and i guess it was water soluble so it came out real easy um mike stacks in between bullet and horror business you got bobby Steele and joey image uh what was the change how did it happen uh jerry only the change was that we picked up two local boys from the city who were more into the scene. Cause that's the thing. Those guys, they're both in New York city. They're both a part of the New York city scene. And Glenn and Jerry at that time, they're the, the band is playing Max's Kansas city constantly. They're not touring. They're not out, you know, exploring the, the Midwest and, and the West coast. Um, but like, you know, they're just, they're just, they're just uh, uh, mostly local in New York. And therefore, they get a couple of local guys to, to be, uh, to be the new drummer and new guitar player. It makes sense. Um, the change was that we picked up two local boys from the city who were more into the scene. 
Mike Stacks, in between Bullet and Horror Business, you got Bobby Steele and Joey Image. What was the change and how did it happen? Jerry only. The change was that we picked up two local boys from the city who were way more into the scene. We went on the road with Frank and he couldn't handle the road. It was beyond him. He didn't want to go on the road. And when he did it, he freaked. So we couldn't count on him as a perpetual thing. Sort of, oh yeah, I expect to be touring with Frank. Frank. Oh yeah, I expect to be touring with Frank 20 years from now. Because you couldn't go down the street without him uh, going nuts. So eventually, we had to do something about that. At the time, I was grooming my brother. So he's grooming his brother even as Frank is becoming you know, weary of the road. Jerry is grooming his brother. And he's just too young to, to, to take him out. So in the meantime, they get Bobby Steele. But again, now here's the thing. Doyle, um, this is Jerry talking in 1993. Did they, why did it, did he really, was he really waiting two years until Doyle turned 16? Is that why? I mean, I guess that actually kind of makes sense. But look, Harley Flanagan was 12 when he was in the stimulators and the stimulators were big back then. So un unless it had something to do with uh, Jerry and Doyle's uh, uh, parents, you know, who knows? I don't know. Um. So we eventually, so we had to do something th about that. At the time I was grooming my brother, my brother Doyle used to roadie for me. So what happened there was later when Doyle was ready, we brought him in because Doyle was playing with our band when he was in the eighth grade. He's younger than me, you know, five years, six years difference. Mike Stacks, after you got Bobby and Joey, it was pretty quick that you did the horror business EP. Jerry only. Well, that was 78. We banged out a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. I had come up with the money for all this stuff. And that's what hurts. I had to get the band financially off the ground. There was no other source of money. None of the other jerks that played with the band could come up with the money. Mike Sachs, you were financing the records and all that. Jerry only. Yeah, I sacrificed a lot to make that band happen. I could have been dumping my money on things for me instead of things for the band. But I guess you learn your lesson the hard way, you know. So this is where, I mean, this is a huge part of the case too, you know, uh, for the settlement and stuff i mean jerry is is pumping a lot of money into the band that's not to say that george germain wasn't either george germain also it was an investor i believe in plan nine and plan nine records so it wasn't just it wasn't just jerry except i think the difference might have been maybe george germain was was getting paid back while jerry it was his band so he's putting money into the band and he's not seeing a dime back and you can he feel the, the resentment, especially if you think about the fact that right at this time, Glenn is jet setting around the world with his rightfully earned success. And Jerry in the back of his mind is going, well, you know, I, I, I financed all that stuff, which got you to the point of doing Danzig. So fuck you. You know, I'm sure there's some sort of resentment on some level on, in some way, shape or form there with that. Who knows? Uh, again, complete conjecture, complete speculation. I don't know. I, th th beyond me, beyond my comprehension, just, just, just aiming in the dark here. Um, by early 1979, when the horror business EP was released, the evolution of their ghoulish B movie image and furious yet tuneful punk sound was complete. The EP was their strongest performance to date, featuring three compelling songs: the tre the treacherous, careening title track, which featured imagery from Hitchcock's Psycho. You don't go in the bathroom with me. I'll put a knife right in you. A newer, faster, tougher Teenagers from Mars and the Desperate Children in Heat. According to the records insert, we already know it. I'm not going to read it here. Um, I asked Jerry the story behind the haunted recording session. Uh, Mike Stack. So horror business that was recorded in a haunted house. Uh, Jerry only uh, that shit. Ha 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 ha. Mike Stacks. What's the story behind that then? Jerry only. What happened was there was a weird sound on there and we didn't know what the hell, where the hell it came from. So we said, what are we going to do? Are we going to remix it? I said, well, I don't got no more money. This is it. You got to like what you got. We thought about it and we thought we don't want everybody to think we're a bunch of jerks. So I think I mentioned it. Let's just say it was recorded in a haunted house. Everybody will love that. Ha 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 ha. Now you'll hear in 1979, the thing that I'm working on, um, the extended episode of this, Dave Street, the guy who wrote that little insert thing for horror business, claim, you know, uh, says it was it was Glenn's idea. It was Glenn's collaboration. It was Glenn and, and Jerry's collaboration. I mean, Glenn and 
Dave's collaboration. Uh, and here's Jerry kind of taking credit for it. So this is what's so interesting. This is like the, the, uh, the, the rewriting of certain history, you know, or, or I should say, that's not the right thing to say. The right thing to say is history from particular points of view. And it's not that it's invalid and it's not that it's valid. It's just interesting to hear and allow us to sort of make our own, come to our own conclusions about what is what and, and, and who is this, and that is that, I don't know. Um, blah, 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 blah. Mike stacks. I kind of expected there was an element of bullshit involved. Jerry only. Well, actually there was, there was weird shit on there. We were just covering up for that. You mean the noises at the end of teenagers from Mars? Yeah, it might be. It sounds weird. I don't even remember exactly what it was, but that was my answer to the problem rather than giving more money to do it again. Jerry's literally saying it's all about, all about money. Um, Mike stacks. I heard Glenn claims he played guitar on that record. According to what I heard, this is Jerry only. Mike Stacks. I heard G Glenn. Mike Stacks. I heard Glenn claims that he played guitar on that record. Jerry only. According to what I heard, Glenn goes around telling everybody that he re-recorded re all the tracks on the guitar so that he could say that he doesn't owe anybody any money. Now on horror business, you may be right because I don't know if Bobby knew how to play it. He may have, but Glenn's not really a good guitar player, to be honest with you. He can fake his way through a Buddy Holly song or something like that. But as far as being a guitar player, he is not. He comes up with something halfway decent. He comes up with some halfway decent chords that are offbeat, like the beginning of Earth AD and shit like that. But he's not a good guitar player. So there was this point down the road where Glenn was going, oh, I'm going to go back into the studio to re-record everybody's guitars and everybody's basses. Why? He's got nothing better to do? So this is fucking interesting. I mean, now is here's my question. Is Jerry specifically referring to horror business or is he mixing up what he knows happened for legacy of brutality in the sense of G Glenn goes back in and re-records the guitar and the bass on all the tracks for legacy of brutality because he doesn't want to pay anybody any royalties. I believe the drums remain unchanged. So all the drum tracks are original on Legacy of Brutality tracks. So essentially, the Legacy of Brutality songs are sort of re-recorded newer versions, new versions of, of stuff. Now, what, what I would be curious to know, and I wonder if anybody could tell me, are the vocal, I wonder if any of the vocals feel or sound different. I've never listened to them back to back, so I don't really know. But I wonder how different the Static Age vocals are from the Legacy of Brutality vocals. It's been a while since I've listened to Legacy of Brutality. I used to love Legacy of Brutality. Um, but yeah, so is is Jerry referring to the Legacy of Brutality stuff or is he referring to horror business? You know, uh, that's interesting, though. That's interesting. But here, but Jerry knows. Jerry knows that Glenn, this is why Glenn is not this is why the misfits are not a trio either besides the fact that glenn just wants to be a vocal vocal vocalist wants to be a front man you know because i'm sure if maybe if glenn had enough chops he would have been it just would have been a trio and that would have been it that would have saved them so much trouble replacing guitarist after guitarist after guitarist so much so that even with doyle's you know minimalist you know inferior playing glenn would rather have that than his own but then again, who knows how Glenn is in a studio setting? You know, look at how Earth AD sounds in a studio setting. You tell them to play Earth AD in front of a, a, a live audience, and it sounds like fucking garbage. But when they play it in the studio live, it sounds like it's a fucking masterpiece. So I don't know. Go figure. Go figure. Um, shit. Where was I here? Mike Stacks. Well, you'd be able to tell if he redid your bass parts, right? Jerry only. I heard I heard one I heard one that he claimed. Blech. Jerry only. I heard one that he claimed and I heard my bass right on there. So I know it's just a lot of shit. But my lawyer says it doesn't matter what he does. He can shit on the tapes if he wants. So, you know what I mean? Ha ha ha. It's past history. So he can do whatever he wants. But you're in the middle of a fucking lawsuit with him. Um, 
Mike Stacks. What happened between Horror Business and Night of Living Dead? Jerry only. Pretty much dead wood. Local gigs. At the time we were uh, in the scene, we would be like, pff, pretty much dead wood. Local gigs. Sorry. Mike Stacks. What happened between Horror Business and Night of Living Dead? Jerry only. Pretty much dead word. Sorry, I'm trying to do this because I want to use this. I'm going to repurpose this later so it has to sound perfect. So you're hearing me record voiceover essentially right now. Pretty much dead wood. Local gigs. At the time we were in the scene, what would be like the New York punk scene between projects, between big gigs. There's lots of running around. You're going out to clubs and seeing other bands. You're hanging here. You're hanging there. Everyone would go see The Clash if they came to town or The Jam. That was pretty much our bopping around at the time. That's when we had Bobby and Joey in the band. They were local boys. They used to hang out around the city all the time. You didn't have to drag them out to go out. You'd run into them. Mike Stacks. When this was going on, you guys were still working day jobs? Jerry only. Oh, yeah. Except Glenn. Glenn doesn't work. He never did. That was one of the problems we had, too. The thing was... He wouldn't have respect for what anyone was doing because he didn't know what it was to get the fuck out to work. The next record in October 1979 was another three-song seven-inch on Plan 9. Night of the Living Dead continued where horror business left off, although this time the performances were a little rougher. The title track allied a great sing a great sing-along melody with fantastic lyrics that mix comic book humor with gory, ultraviolet, images stumbled in sonambulance pre-dawn corpses come to life armies of the dead survive armies of the hungry ones only ones lonely ones ripped up like shredded wheat only ones lonely ones be a sort of a human picnic um on the b side where eagles dare includes the timeless chorus hook i ain't no goddamn son of a bitch you better think about it baby while the band's sense of fun ran amok on an anarchic rave-up version of Rat Fink, kidnapped from an Alan Sherman B-side. Mike Stacks, Night of the Living Dead was the first Misfits record that was the title of a horror movie. And there was a lot of them after that. That's not true. Teenagers from Mars uh, predates that. Um, You guys are real big on horror movies. Jerry only. Oh, yeah. And that was when the band was really at its best, to be honest with you. The band was really cranking at that point because that's what it was. It was a 50s horror band. If we would have marketed it that way, we could have done very well. Mike Stacks. Whose idea was it to cover Alan Sherman's song Rat Fink on the EP? Jerry only. Well, we were all into models at the time. Those big daddy Roth those Big Daddy Roth models. So we figured we'd cover it. At the time, we were all into wearing Rat Fink shirts and things like that. I didn't like that cover that much. It could have been a lot better. Bobby Steele's guitar sounds like shit, the playing on it. But what are you going to do? In my opinion, we could have done a better job of it. Wrong, Jerry. Wrong. Fucking Bobby's guitar sounds great. You can't. Come on. You're being a hater right now. I understand why you got sour grapes. But let's not, I mean, we, we both know that fucking Bobby's guitar player. Bobby's the best guitar player, man, you had. Come on. He had the most chops. That's not to say we don't love Frank, you know, but Bobby was the most finessed. He had fucking finesse, dude. Um, Mike Stacks. In 1979, you toured England with the Damned. Jerry only. Yeah, it was a hell of a lot of bullshit. The thing is, I don't like working for people. I don't know. If you get that about me, I'd rather work for myself and struggle and struggle along than have myself a bad, uh, a bad attitude because someone's telling me what to do in England. We ran into a lot of trouble, a lot of people bossing you and shit and fucking with your sound, trying to make you sound stupid. So the damn would look better. You know what I mean? Um, Mike stacks was the damned person. Uh, was that the damn personally or their road crew or Jerry only their whole management? You know what I mean? They were just a bunch of fucking jerk jerks following nothing, nothing against the guys. But at the same time, they have 
no authority to say whether the bus is going to turn fucking left or it's going to turn right. Uh, when we're getting fucked over, nobody's got to say, and that's what aggravated aggravates the piss out of me. <sighs> Hold on. Let me take this again. Their whole management, you know what I mean? They were just a bunch of fucking jerks following dot, 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 nothing against those guys. But at the same time, they had no authority to say whether the bus was going to turn fucking left or going to turn fucking right. When we're getting fucked over, nobody's got to say, and that's what aggravates the piss out of me. If I'm in a band, record company's going to work for me. Ha, ha, ha. And that's the different attitude I have about the situation. So we got shit on. They burned us on money and we're in England. Don't go fucking burning the band on money when they're in another country because you can't do nothing. It's not like I could pick up the phone and call my lawyer, Mike Stacks. What was the reaction as far as the crowd? Jerry only. Er, they were a bunch of assholes. Ha ha. If I could find the plug, I'd pull it out and let the whole island sink. Ha ha ha. At the time, it was a bunch of little kids who were getting into spitting and throwing shit at you. You ran into a lot of these clowns, you know, Mike Stacks. Do you think that there was some hostility because you were Americans? Jerry only. Yeah, there was that too. Mike Stacks. So what happened with the tour? Jerry only. We walked off the tour. Oh, shit. We walked off the tour because, see, the guy was supposed to pay me $100 for, that, for the night. We walked off the tour because, see, the guy was supposed to pay me $100 a night for the band for 25 shows in 28 days. That was 2500 bucks. The whole tour came down to money. So I worked day and night to get the money for my old man to pay for everyone's plane ticket to England. I didn't even get to practice for three fucking weeks before I left. I wanted to go to England with my shit together. And that was the one thing I was deprived of, I think. So we get there. We play two or three shows, and the guy, he was handling Motorhead at the time, and he was handling the damned. He fucked us on money. He said, well, basically, I'm not paying you guys. And we were in the middle of fucking northern England somewhere, and we just said, oh, pretty easy, fuck you, ha, 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 and we split. We walked off the tour because we weren't getting paid for nothing. I wasn't going to let this guy fuck us over, so we split. Whew. And then it says to be continued. What the fuck? I thought this was the full interview. Wow. Did I fuck that up? Oh, Jesus. I think we're going to have to do a part two because I'm going to have to, man, I'm going to have to track down that part two. Shit. All right. I'm putting my feelers out right now. Who's got, ah, oh, Jesus. Who's got ugly things number 12 scanned? Who's got ugly things number 12 scanned? We Fuck, I wish we had that from the beginning. We could have just done it like that. That would have been a lot more fun. If you have ugly things number 13 scanned, uh, I'll put it out there in the group. I'll put it out in a bunch of places. Fucking get at me. Let's like, let's fucking get that shit on our, our, our tiny little share screen here so that we can do um, a full on Man, I should have had the screen like this. I was not thinking. So we can do a, a, a full-on uh, uh, read-through of the of the remaining of the interview. Uh, that's so terrible that we can't finish now. Man, to be continued? What? Why is it only... Ah, Jesus. That's so weird to me. It ends. Shit. All right. No bother. I mean, it's, we're, all, we're already at 90 minutes anyway, and I can't I can't be on here forever. So... So we'll we'll put a we'll put a pen in it there and we'll we'll continue uh if I can get a hold of it next week. In any case, there will be a part two to this episode once I get a hold of the second half of that interview. In the meantime, hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full-time. I want this to be my full-time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it gonna be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time 
uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> So right now, I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers, and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee. But it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. <laughs> the YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just wanna thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes, that's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents. Look at this. Look at this in person. Boom. Oh my goodness. From Jason Eben in his... November fire. Now notice it doesn't say November's fire. It's November fire, pure natural brand, sour cream. And if you don't know what that's about, listen to November's fire on Sam Hain three November coming fire. And you will understand why this shirt exists. It's not for everybody. This is not a shirt for everybody. This is a shirt for those who get it and understand it. And for Jason here, Jason, who's been singing, sour cream since he was a teenager like totally understood and appreciated what this shirt was and now he'll be walking down the street he'll be at a show hope god god willing when shows start up again he'll be at a show and someone's gonna walk up to him and go what where did you get that sour cream shirt they're gonna know instantaneously what it is and they're gonna laugh and that's what we capitalize on that's that's right. There's Jason now. There's Jason saying, hey, that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's right, man. Way to go, Jason. So, yeah, we were just talking. I was just telling everybody about your uh, your the situation that you mentioned to me. I, man, that 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 tickled that tickled my pickle to see that that tickled my fancy. I was pretty proud to see that shirt. So we have one more shirt, though. That is not the only shirt. Um, in addition, so Jason ordered his shirt from here. You can get your own sour cream shirt right here, or maybe you want it on a hoodie. Maybe you want a sour cream hoodie. You're like, damn, Jeff, why did this turn into the infomercial? This is really nice because it's, uh, I forget. It's the, uh, big, big graphic T right there. That's a, that's, that's a really sweet looking shirt. I like that one a lot. Um, you can get it on a coffee mug. You need to drink your coffee, stare at the sour cream. So that's the first design. So now I have a second design to unveil, and it is ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. there you go. You can have a They Came From Lodi t-shirt. And when you buy a They Came From Lodi t-shirt, you are not only supporting the creation of this content, you are supporting <laughs> the documentary and any sort of coffers that may be needed in the future you are supporting a lot when you buy this merch here we have it on the beautiful yellow you there's so many colors so many options you can get it on an orange shirt you can get it on a tank top look at that that neon yellow is making my eyes burn ah it's so bright too bright 
So check it out. Maybe you want a neon pink mug. Maybe you want a neon pink mug. I don't know. You decide. You don't have to. You don't have to. Maybe you want it on a mask. Maybe you want to walk around with a mask. Or what is this thing called? A neck gaiter. Get it on a neck gaiter, people. Your phone case? You do a phone case. All right. Enough with the infomercial. I just wanted to say all that. Look at all the colors that are available. Maybe your dog. <laughs> Maybe your dog needs a does your dog need a hoodie this is supporting an obscure documentary about a, a horror punk band? <laughs> really not a horror punk band, a whatever you want to call it band. Um, but you can do that too. Oh, fanny packs, fanny packs. Sure. There you go. Nice fanny pack. Green. Green looks nice. It's beautiful. Anyway, the combinations are endless. But enough of that. And enough of that. We are here for one thing and one thing only today. And that, oh, want to do a shout out to both uh, Voice of Doom John and Brown1974, BWN 1974, who both supplied me with ugly things, which is what I needed. I needed ugly things in my life. And, you know, we were missing. This is what we were missing. So this is what you got. We didn't have this. This is issue 12, summer of 1993. For 450, you could learn so many facts about the misfits that were unknown at the time. Because as we said last time, this was a uh this was uh like tantamount to the most information that you could call on this band at this time, right? So this is them on tour, I think in 81 or 82. Uh, at Universal Studios, uh, Jerry only tells all, and uh, it is a long friggin' interview. Look at that! All right, all hell breaks loose. So we already read this part, um, but we're just seeing it as it was designed, which is cool. We're not going to reread this here, but you can just see. And this was the the little intro. I mean, it is really cool, man. I mean, this is this is just so this is so important in a pre internet age. And there you go. Here's what we didn't get to see. We already read this part, so we're not going to read this again, as I said. But here's some pictures that you really don't see that much on the internet. There's Mo the Great, 78, Lodi's answer to Sid Vicious. And yeah, he does kind of, he is kind of doing, he's got, even got the chain necklace. He's kind of doing a Sid Vicious thing uh, at this point in time. Let me see if I can do a zoomy zoom on that. Yeah, yeah, we can. That's cool. Let's zoom in. There's, there he is. There's Jerry. Right. Oh, wow. We can. That's pretty great. That's pretty great. Here's another one. There he is again. He's got a pin. I don't know what's on the pin, but there you can see the locket right there. That's the um, the Sid Vicious locket, I guess you would call it. Right. And um, it just goes. It's a long interview. So we're just going to we're going to we're going to spin through this. Let's see. What, let's go to the next page. It's going to let me go to the next page. No. Uh, there we go. Hold the, f hold the phone. Hold the phone. All right. Maybe that'll let us. There we go. Now we can switch. So there's Glenn. This is a cool photo of Glenn from 78. Boom. Reaching, reaching for something. And then that's probably at that time there were, you know, how many photos could you find of Manny? It's the only photo. Really, the original band. And I believe that's in Glenn's basement. We've seen that photo a million times. And there's Jerry. This was for the Static Age. This is a Static Age photo session right here. And yeah, he's definitely doing that. Uh, he, he's doing that Sid Vicious thing. All right. So the only thing is, we. so where did we leave off last time? Does anybody remember where we left off? There, we've seen that shot a billion times. We've seen all these photos. Some of these were t taken by Rocky, I believe, but some of these were taken by Bill C. Bill Cangeloni. Cange, as he was known, he was like uh, Jer one of Jerry's best friends. He was also very good friends with Frank. Frank, Jerry, and Bill, they were all friends. And um, Bill Bill Cange, Cange, as he's known, was there from the very beginning. He was there for a very... He was there from 77 all the way up. I met him backstage at... Riot Fest in 2016. 
there's so there's Jerry and his he's got the teenagers from Mars knitted um, sweater that was mass produced. I think we we've read all that. This is a very familiar photo. This is a cool photo. A double exposure, Glenn and Jerry. Wow. So you can see, let's, let's zoom in on this one. Wow, this is so great to see this stuff so up and close. So that's Jerry upside down, and there's Glenn, and this was taken by Glenn. He did a double, double exposure. A double exposure. Um, there they are. Looking, I mean, Glenn looks pretty normal there. Mr. Jim, you know, people were talking about Mr. Jim in the Facebook group. Our, our Facebook group, Mr. Jim was in two bands at the same time. He was in Continental Crawler, the same, which, which whose music is so different from the Misfits, uh, and features uh, both Stevie Lynn Linder, who was also in a band with Glenn. They were all in Kudat and Boojang together, pre Misfits band. And uh, fuck, what's that other guy's name? Uh, Mike, I think it is. He was in, they were in um, another band, a um, uh, more recent band. God, I can't remember the name. Um, but yeah, Mr. Jim was in Continental Crawler at the same time he was in the Misfits. It's kind of amazing. J Jim was only in the band for like a year, not even like 11 months, 10 months, and he drummed on a significant portion of the songs, almost 20 out of 18, 18 out of the you know 53 songs, significant portion of songs that appeared on multiple, what's going on, Russell Casualty? That appeared on multiple releases. Um, there we go. There's another. I, we've seen all these photos once again. Taken these photos. These photos right here. These were taken around uh, Lodi. Just walking around. And then I don't know where this was shot. But this was all one. An, this was another photo shoot. I mean, that's what they were doing. You can see the little Plan 9 from Outer Space situation. Mike Morantz, Russell says, what, what about Mike Morantz that he took that he took uh, these photos or that the that was in his basement or something? I don't know what you mean. All right, here we go. By early 1970. All right, we already read this here. Here we go. This is one of the shots of the horror business lineup. 1979, the focus of the upcoming super grand special episode. Whoa. Um, here we go. Here's some more. This you might recognize from Live at the Perfect Crime. Um, we walked off the tour. Where, now, here's my question. You know what? I'm just going to go to Misfit Central and we'll find out. We got to figure out when, where we finished, where we finished off last. That should be, that will be helpful to fin figure that out. So let's do that real quick. So I'm just going to go to the sources section, go down to 1993, bum, ba -da -ba -bum. and you can see here too that that's not Joey Image, that's Arthur Googie. And this was taken at, Bob, that photo was taken at Bobby Steele's last show with the band at uh, Club Exile on Long Island. Um, I believe that set was recorded like so many things, they just just doesn't just disappears. Everything disappears. Okay, here I found the, the interview. A hundred dollars. Okay, wow, we're right here. Perfect. Here it is. How great is this? Okay. Um, Mike Morantz, was that who Mr. Jim played with? No, Mr. Jim played with I was saying Mr. Jim played with Continental Crawler. Uh, at the same time that he was with the Misfits. Because some, you know, somebody in the group was like, Oh, you know, why did he why would he leave the band? Why would he leave the Misfits for Continental Crawler? You know, I don't understand that. Why would Mr. Jim do that? But Mr. Jim was in both bands at the same time. You know, I mean, it wasn't like he—he he, he really, like he—he he didn't. Who who would have known? As 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 Frank Locato says, as Franche Coma says, who would have known what um what it was going to become? All right, so we're going to continue our reading. You're gonna have to bear with me. Hopefully, I'll have a better time reading this because it's bigger. Uh, so they're talking. So where we last left off before we get into this. So we last left off where Mr. Jim, not Mr. Jim, 
fuck am I talking about? They're in England. They're on tour with the damned. They went over there. They have no contracts, yada, yada, yada. And Jerry is explaining why they walked off the tour. Okay, ready? Jerry only. We walked off the tour because, see, the guy was supposed to pay me $100 a night for the band for 25 shows in 28 days. That was 2500 bucks. The whole tour came down to money. So I worked day and night to get the money for my old man to pay for everybody's plane ticket to England. I didn't even get to practice for three fucking weeks before I went. I wanted to go to England with my shit together, and that was the one thing I was deprived of, I think. So we get there, and we play two or three shows, and the guy, he was handling Motorhead at the time, and he was handling The Damned, and which also makes me remember that Lenny was actually in The Damned and played bass for The Damned for a short period of time. I wonder, when it, I wonder if that happened when this guy was managing both bands at the same time, I would imagine, uh, on, on some level. He was handling The Damned, and he fucked us on the money. He said, well, basically, I'm not paying you guys. And we were in the middle of fucking northern England somewhere. And we said, oh, pretty easy. Fuck you. Ha, 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 ha. And we split. We walked off the tour because we weren't getting paid for nothing. I wasn't going to let this guy fuck us over. So we split. Mike Stacks. So what's the story with the song London Dungeon? Jerry only. I knew Sid Vicious's mom. I knew Sid Vicious's mom. So I hooked up with Sid's mom when I got back into London. And she took me on a tour of the Canterbury Cathedral. All the really cool places, you know, and Glenn went to go see the jam, I believe, play at the rainbow and a bunch of skinheads started a fight with him. So he pulled a piece of glass out of a window and started going at him with this piece of glass. So they locked him up. So that's where he came up with London Dungeon. He couldn't wait to get out of England. I didn't like England very much either. Now, this this ties in with that interview from 1983 when, you know, Glenn's like, yeah, we just don't. The, the, they're just really, really sour on England, even four years later, three or four years after they had been to England. They were just really sour on the whole experience. Um, Peter says they were called the doomed, which Lemmy was in. Uh, so what you're saying that you're saying that the damned were called the doomed when Lemmy was a bass player for them. I'm not you got to you got to clarify that for me, uh, Peter. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Um, he couldn't wait to get out of England. I didn't like England very much either. I just thought we were treated very rudely for being foreigners. You know, when people come by me, Hey, I make sure you, when people come by me, Hey, I make sure you eat. I make sure you're cared for my house in Lodi. When we used to have the band black flag used to sleep over circle jerks. Everybody who came to town had to flop at my house and we would feed everybody too. Nobody would have to go into their pockets when they were at my house. That's the way I like to treat people. And when Dave Vanian came over here, I tried to treat him the same way. But when we were over there, we were at the mercy of the of those fucking swindlers. And, you know, I mean, that's true. I mean, that's isn't that that's part of the great, you know, New Jersey, Italian, you know, Lodi, but really just New Jersey, Italian hospitality. There's something about Italians. And this is so true in my personal experience. This has always been true. There's something about like Italians and like, you know, maybe it's and the, the Italians that I've encountered in New Jersey, they are incredibly generous and hospitable and will give you the shirt off their back. They're just that's just the way it's just they're in their blood. It's just it's a part of like this it's just this, this hospitality sort of thing. And um, I don't know, man, it's just I, and, and I think J that's Jerry's M.O., to a T, you know, especially when it comes to his fans, especially when it comes to fellow bands for the most part. And um, I mean, you've seen that time and time again. So Jerry had an expectation that was not met when, you know, being a foreigner in another country, Mike stacks. So how did you get to know Sid's mom? Did you know Sid? Jerry only. I met him the night he died. It's just a bad memory. I shouldn't have let that shit happen that I saw happen. I tried to keep my peace. You know what I mean? If it's not my business, I stay the fuck out of it. But if you see something you think is bullshit, I guess it's better to speak your opinion so that it doesn't lay heavy on you later. Mike Stacks. Was it the people that he was hanging out with? Jerry only. Yeah, I mean, the guy just gets out of jail. They go hook him up with some dope and shit. I didn't know what the fuck he was doing, and he keeps on passing out and shit. And then he was all right, you know? So we split, and we were saying, you know, what a hairy scene. So we split and we were saying, you know, what a hairy scene. 
The next day I had to drive up to Connecticut to drop off some parts and I heard it over the news. It said he was dead. I said, son of a bitch. I could have just picked up the phone and called an ambulance. Fuck him. I said, son of a bitch. I could have just picked up the phone and called an ambulance. Fuck him. Rather than become an asshole in my own mind, I became a real asshole by not saying anything. Well, there was a lot of other people there and he was probably like that many nights, you know, says Mike Stacks. Mike Stacks says, well, there was a lot of other people there and he was probably like that many other nights, you know. Um, and, you know, this is like, here's one of those things that I think has kind of conflated over the years. I mean, Jerry met him the night he died. Like how, how well did he really know Sid? You know, uh, I do think that, you know, there, I don't know. I think it was Bobby, you know, there was some sort of talk or speculation or some sort of situation where the misfits were going to back Sid, or there was, an, there was a, I should say there was a plan for the misfits to go and back Sid as his backing band. Sid drops out of the sex, the sex pistols implode. Right. And then Sid goes back to New York with Nancy and he's trying to like, you know, rebrand himself as a singer and a front man. And he's playing with, with, you know, a ton of bands and a ton of people. Pure Hell is opening for him. Uh, the Victims are opening for him. The Heartbreakers. Uh, he's got guys from the Heartbreakers and the Dolls in his band. He's got Jerry Nolan drumming for him. He's got uh, Arthur, Arthur Kane playing bass. Stuff like that. And, uh, you know, just different people on different nights. And, um, you know, he probably if, if he had found the right manager, I would imagine that had he not killed himself with heroin, had Sid found the right, you know, uh, the right manager who could handle him, you know, in a way where he could contain this dude, this wild dude and his wild behavior, that he pro they probably would have repackaged him as, as a front man and you probably would have had a modicum of success, whether releasing one album or maybe a, a string of albums, a couple of albums. But uh, who knows? Who knows what would happen? But yeah, I think that somewhere in the Misfits camp, probably, you know, Jerry had his sights on Sid and, you know, uh, in an effort to, you know, propel them, propel their status, you know, uh, maybe seeing everybody else, you know, taking a turn being the backing band for Sid. Jerry thinks, you know, and again, I'm speculating. I don't actually know. Jerry goes, hmm, maybe maybe the Misfits could be the backing band for Sid. Maybe we could, you know, have uh, you know, that that that'll, you know, elevate our our brand uh, as a band in the New York scene. And as it turns out, you know, too late because, you know, Sid overdoses. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man. I don't I don't think I don't really th I, I, I feel like and then over the years, Jerry gets asked about it because Jerry becomes a part of that legend. You know, I mean, that's that's what's so interesting about some of this stuff is that like you literally have to and again there's nothing right about Sid overdosing on heroin I, what i'm saying is i'm saying this in the sense of if you're there at the right place at the right time you get photographed you know baked in to the legend and so in that way jerry was there the night he died and therefore is you know entangled in the mythology of Sid Vicious. And that's why people interview him about it all the time. You know, he's been interviewed over the years. And then over the years, it becomes like a, a manicured answer. You know, I think at least again, you know, please, Jerry only tell me to shut the fuck up and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Fine. Uh, I always like to do that because I feel like if I don't, then people will think that I know, really know what I'm talking about. And I really don't. And this is just a fucking nerd talking about nerdy fucking minutia, man. That's all this is. That's all it is. So, um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I think that's what that is. Uh, but it's interesting to hear him talk about that in 1993. And then as, you know, the years have passed, you know, there, every once in a while, like some digital, <laughs> Robbie saying Simon Ferocious, he's referring to a story where the, the Sex Pistols were playing next to uh, we're recording the Sid, the Sex Pistols were recording in the same studio that uh, Queen was recording. At, Robbie, what was it? Night of the Opera, maybe. And Sid Vicious, you know, because at the time in 1977, the Sex Pistols were the biggest thing. I mean, they've captivated the you know international media, right? They have everybody's attention. Punk has broke broke wide open to this international phenomenon. And even a band as big as Queen is you know knocking on the door 
going um going uh hey um uh what's going on here and you know sid sid got trying to sid is trying to do this tough guy act and sid was not a tough guy at all he's a teddy bear you know and all the accounts that i read he was just a well, he's a quiet little boy you know you know this, all of it was an act and <laughs> And uh, Freddie Mercury, who's not even, who's so, it's like not even in his like stratosphere. He's just sort of like, it, he does, it doesn't even like register with him. And he's just called, he calls him, well, that, that Simon Ferocious guy. Like, you know, like doesn't even call him uh, Sid Vicious, Simon Ferocious. I think that's so funny. Sorry, I've been corrected. It, it was News of the World, West, West Essex Studios in 1977. I, that's a great, that's a great, great story though. Um, <laughs> Simon Ferocious. Um, what else? Uh, Gordon says, didn't one of the misfits end up with Sid Swatzika shirt? I don't know, but there is that photo of Joey image wearing the same Swatzika shirt that we've seen Sid in, which is detestable to me personally. I find it repulsive as a Jew. I find it absolutely repulsive, like disgusting. Um, all, all that fucking Swatzika shit. I hate that. I hate it. I just hate it. Um, even when it has the bar in the middle, I hate it. I just, I'm like, why do you got to wear it? Yeah, no shit, motherfucker. We all hate fucking, we're all anti-fascism. You don't have to fucking wear it on your shirt with a bar through it. It's like, it's like, I'm against people. <laughs> He's like, it's like, I'm against poverty. <laughs> it's like, we're an anti, yeah, we know you're against poverty. Like, you know, it's just so stupid. It's just so stupid. Like, we get it. You know, you don't have to have it on your shirt. Well, in that case, it's a shock, shock value situation. I wonder if that was the the i wonder if that was the same shirt because jerry did have sid shoes he had Sid shoes he had a bunch of personal effects i wonder if joey was given the swastika shirt because joey image did have an affinity for swastikas um and i believe he even had a tattoo of a swastika and i'm sure jerry didn't want anything to do with the swastika shirt you know because jerry got a bunch of shit from sid's mom and it stayed up in their attic for a very, very long time. I mean, the moment that he died, the moment that Sid Vicious died, everything around him became an artifact of collectability. Even um, at the Chelsea, he died at the Chelsea Hotel. Harley Flanagan had the, the, the key, the hotel key. You know, I mean, like all of a sudden becomes like a, a, a priceless artifact. I don't know. How's it going, Fred? Bringing an opera to the masses. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's move on with this. So, all right, Mike Stacks. Well, there was a lot of other people there. He was probably like that many nights, you know? Um, sorry, I got to flip to the next page. Oh, okay, so this is just before the interview continues. So this is fun. A, a pink haired pupil dressed in a pink suit almost didn't get his diploma at Lodi high school graduation where the principal was prompted by shouts from the audience. So this is Doyle at 14 couldn't graduate because, or had a, it'll probably explain this article. Look at this. This is so great. Teenage hoodlums on a ray gun rampage. That's so great. Mommy. Can I go out tonight? Pink haired 14 year old Paul Doyle, Kafia Kayafa outside Max's Kansas City. Look at that. That's him at 14, man. And he's got on the he's got on the chain necklace too. Wow, I've never seen the photo. Pink haired 14 year old Paul Doyle Kayafa outside Max's Kansas City, New York, 1978. Because he's going to shows with his brother, right? All right, let's just read this real quick. Pink <laughs> punk pinked. Look at that. We need a we need a headline where everything begins with a P. We want everything to, to go with the punk. Punk pinked pupil provokes principal. That's something you put on a fool. Uh, punk, punk pinked pupil provokes pr principal. Say that five times. Punk pinked pupil provokes principal. Punk pinked pupil provokes principal. Lodi. The punk rock generation disrupted Tuesday's graduation ceremonies for about 200 Jefferson Middle School students with its typical disgust for social conventions. Let's make that a little bigger. School officials received a shock when one of the graduates, Paul Kayafa, 14 of 281 Grove Street, 
showed up with his hair dyed a vivid pink from Manic Panic. He was wearing a matching pink suit with black shirt and white tie and pointed shoes. That sounds pretty stylish. I, I like that. I like that a lot. His brother, Jerry, who plays bass for the Misfits, a well-known punk rock group, was in the audience at Felician College, a girls' Catholic school dressed in black leather and blue hair. A well-known punk rock group was in the audience at Felician College. What does the college have anything to do with this? School principal Gary Carabin. Man, I got to find that guy. School principal Gary Carabin refused to give Kayafa his diploma by ignoring the youth and not calling his name with the rest of the graduates. In the middle of ceremonies attended by S. David Adler, country, county, sorry, county superintendent, in the middle of ceremonies attended by S. David Adler, county superintendent of schools, the youth asked if the officials didn't forget someone. So Doyle goes, hey, you forgetting someone? As Kayafa sat on the stage waiting for his diploma, people in the audience started shouting, give him his diploma, give him his diploma, give him his diploma, give him his diploma. Uh, Kayafa reportedly responded with a hand gesture, <laughs> but didn't get the diploma at the end of ceremonies. I just wanted to liven things up, the youth explained afterwards. It was all so boring, and they were such a bunch of duds. Kayafa says he has ambitions to be a punk rock musician. Outside the auditorium, he crumpled up the diploma, explaining that it actually had someone else's name on it. <laughs> and, and that guy, that punk, pinked pupil prov that provoked the principal would go on to sell out Madison Square Garden with his band. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, Robbie Bloodshed says, Felician College is where they ha held a lot of stuff for Lodi. I remember when, when I played basketball in school for Hasbro Heights, we played against Lodi. We played at Felician College. Okay, so that was the venue. Okay, so I guess that was, that, that's the venue where they hold graduations and stuff or, or events. Uh oh Or actually, Robbie says, um, Felician is a small, small college on the main street in Lodi. I had no idea there was a college there. Wow. Well, that's that's fun, though. That is so fun, man. I You can totally picture him, too, dressed like that, you know, in his in his. Um, in, he had his his hair dyed a vivid pink. He was wearing a matching pink suit with a black shirt and a white tie and pointed shoes. Now, that is an outfit. Hot pink against black with pink hair. That is cool. That's electric, man. That man, I'm going to start dressing like that from now on, I think. Let's see some of these other photos. And there he is, man. There he is later on. Here, here's, um, here's a shot. I think this is sound check, right? Look at his hair there. And this studded collar was in the possession of Elizabeth Boris. Boris? I don't know. I don't know how to say her name. But uh, I saw that on a stack of boxes in the flesh and it blew my mind. because so I was like, how many times have I seen that in the photo? And look, here he's playing an ice man. But down here, wow, you never see this one, huh? That looks like a knock. Either it's either a Les Paul or it's a knockoff Les Paul. And then let's see. What has he got on there? Look at this. Look at that, man. He's got he's done some sort of bat. There's like a bat thing. I don't know if you could see it. I'm trying to highlight it with the thing. Pat, Pat Licata says, big auditorium used to house graduations if the weather is bad. There you go. That that breaks it down. So Jerry was there and Doyle was there and everybody's chanting that Doyle should still get his diploma. What a scandal. And there he is, a blurry picture at Max's Kansas City. Boy, man, Doyle really was a punker for life, man. When you think about it, 14 being at Max's Kansas City. I mean, Jesus Christ, roading for the Misfits, playing your first show with the Misfits at 16. What a life. Here's a great shot. Oh, there's Googie. Look at Googie and Jerry. Man, I wonder when that was taken. That's probably 80. 80 maybe? I don't know. Huh. And this is them in the cave, right? And this is somewhere. I don't know where that is. Uh, all right, let's keep reading, shall we? I kind of got a heart out at 9 o'clock, but we'll see. 
Jerry only. Yeah, but it's a shame. At the time, we had just seen him. He played Max's Kansas City and had the world by the balls, you know. You know what I mean? There you go. So, so Sid Vicious had the world by the balls, and he just fucked it up, man. Just fucked it all up. Back in England, that was when Joey left the group. Right? <sighs> Sorry. Um, Jerry says it was a shame. He had played Max's Kansas City, had the world by the balls. Right. Mike Stacks. Back in England, that was when Joey left the group, right? Jerry only. As a matter of fact, he blew us off. Shit. Yeah. Jerry only. As a matter of fact, he blew us off. The thing was, he was missing his girlfriend, so he couldn't make it over there. And he... What? Jerry only. As a matter of fact, he blew us off. The thing was, he was missing his girlfriend, so he couldn't make it over there, and he just wanted to get the fuck out. He Oh, he couldn't make it over there. Like, he couldn't make it in England. That's what he means. So he couldn't make it over there, and he just wanted to get the fuck out. He was just a bad vibe for the band. It was a bad move getting him, and he was just a fucking bum. Mike Stacks, what happened when you got back from England? So just, you know, and then immediately after this issue, uh, Joey Image responds to Jerry Only's interview to clarify things. But that's also kind of a puff piece, as you will hear in 1979, a year of horror business. Um. Mike Stack asks, what happened when you got back from England? Jerry only. When we got back, we were pretty much, oh, uh, Jerry only. When we got back, we were in pretty much of an uproar there. And then we got Googie in the band. Basically, every time we turned around, we had a new band, you know? It was a never-ending battle. And I guess it, that's how he's thinking about it in 1993. And I mean, I guess it's, I mean, it's true, man. It's just like every, every, ch every chance, every time, they try and do something, something happens, they lose members, and they got to get new members. The band was never, the band was constantly switching personnel, you know, um, and as a result, switching their sound, switching their, their image a little bit, like it just kept evolving, you know. Now, now, what's interesting is, how would the band, would the band have stayed the same if Frank and Mr. Jim had stayed in the band? Would the band have stayed the same. We were talking about this the other week. Would they have looked the way that they looked? Would the devil lock have come? Would the band have stayed the same if Bobby and Joey had never left the band? What would the band have done if they had, if England was a success and then they went on to tour with the, with the, um, with the clash, you know, what would things have been like? Would Doyle eventually have still replaced Bobby Steele would have been an inevitable inevitability or would Bobby be so integral to the sound by then? Who knows? Maybe Glenn finally would have relented. You know, Bobby was trying to uh, bring songs to the Misfits. Bobby, you know, when the evening comes, that was supposed to be a Misfits song. He wrote that for the Misfits and to give to the band. And Glenn was like, no, 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 no. I'm the guy who writes the songs here. And so when the evening comes, never, never materialized. And that's, again, to touch back on what we spoke about last week about like, how much did Jerry and Doyle actually write and contribute? You know, J I mean, Bobby, here's Bobby bringing songs to Glenn and Glenn's rejecting them because they're only doing Glenn's songs. That's another, that's another level of that whole situation, right? Like it's not just, it's not just, um, it's not just, you know, uh, the, 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 the mystery of like, well, why didn't, you know, what 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 who did what in the band it's like it's like glenn is full-on rejecting written songs i'm pretty sure glenn is the one that's bringing he's the mastermind and he's the one that's bringing the songs are jerry and doyle shaping the songs definitely on some level they're shaping the songs they have to they have to glenn is glenn writing those bass parts i don't know i don't know maybe he's writing maybe as an idea does jerry have a style does jerry have a style to bring to those bass parts we know that every guitarist had some style to bring to the guitar, especially Bobby, right? I don't know. It's interesting, though. All right, let's 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 continue. Um, Mike Stacks, what was the story with getting rid of Bobby Steele? Jerry only. Well, one, he was a jerk. Two, we were doing this big show at Irving Plaza on Halloween, and I built these eight-foot coffins with lids on them. So the way was... Pfft, sorry. Jerry only one. Well, he was a jerk Two, 
we were doing a show. Uh, we were doing this big show at Irving Plaza on Halloween, and I built these eight foot coffins with lids on them. So the way the show was supposed to start was that we were supposed to hit the beginning of one thirty eight and just start smashing out of these things, and then everybody get to the front and start playing. You know. So I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about it. And I thought, wait a minute, Bobby can't get the fuck out of this fucking thing. If I put him in laughs because he's got a bum leg. I said, look, there's no way this guy is going to be able to get out of there. It's a shame, but it's true. Um, then when we were working on the album, which was right before that, he kept coming to the recording late, then not being able to keep up. Then Doyle would have to play his part. So then I said to myself, why am I sitting in the studio paying money for the studio? Okay. Bobby comes late and then he can't play when he comes. So what am I waiting for? What am I waiting for him to come? God, this is done. All right. Let me, let's take this one more time. I'm sorry, people. One more time. I'm going to take this over. This is just fucking hard to read. His syntax here is so weird. He was a jerk. So Jerry is saying here that he couldn't, burst out of the coffin what a stupid jerry i'm sorry what a dumb fucking reason to kick bobby Steele out of the band not a good reason bobby Steele's the best guitar player you don't kick him you're not gonna you're gonna kick him out you're gonna you, you i mean think about how the band started to sound live once they got rid of bobby you know i just i don't know it's what a what a bummer that that is um as to him being a jerk i can't speak to that i don't know i don't know i don't know what bobby would say about that um, he can't get out because he's got a bum leg. Then when we were working on the album, which was right before that, he kept coming to the recording late, then not being able to keep up. Then Doyle would have to play his part. So then I said to myself, why am I in the studio paying the money for the studio? Okay. Okay. That's like a Lodi thing or a New Jersey thing. This okay. You put an okay at the end of a sentence. It's like, I've noticed that with Glenn. I've noticed that with Bobby. I've noticed that with Jerry, I had not, I Doyle, I don't know if Doyle does that. Uh, Kenny, the brother, their brother does that. It's like this thing, okay. Um, Bobby comes late and he can't play when he comes. So what am I waiting for him to come? It's one thing if you're waiting for someone and they come and play the whole fucking thing and walk out of there way ahead of schedule. You know what I mean? It's another thing if you got to wait an hour and a half and it's costing you 20 or 30 bucks an hour. At that time, that was the going rate. And the guy shows up an hour, hour and a half late, and then he can't get one song after two hours of paying money. So you're paying 120 bucks for someone to come in and fucking basically jerk you off. So you say to yourself, well, fuck it. Next time Bobby's not here, Doyle, you're playing it. Fuck it. So Bobby actually messed his way. Uh, um, so Bobby actually messed his way right up to getting the ax. He may tell you different that everybody had it in for him, but basically he wasn't cutting it. And I know he doesn't want to hear that. All right. So I got a couple of things. I got a couple of things to say about that. Pat Peter says, man, I would love to see a video of them popping out of the coffins. Well, apparently it was recorded. That would be the Irving. Pl oh, no. Maybe it was recorded. Maybe it wasn't. Tony Matura was there. I forgot to ask Tony about this. Tony. Tony watches these late. Tony, if you watch this, do you remember? Tell we never talked about the coffins, about them bursting out of the coffins. This is also the night Screaming Jay Hawkins opened for him. And supposedly, uh, supposedly Bobby didn't know he was kicked out of the band. Um, Gordon says, wasn't Bobby supposed to play at Irving Plaza? Wasn't he backstage and then got, uh, go on stage? And then they go on stage, Teenagers from Mars with Bobby Steele's an asshole. And no, you're, you're, you're mixing up like three things, Gordon. So... One, Bobby did think he was playing that Irving Plaza show in 1980. Two, he showed up and was basically informed that he was out of the band. Uh, three, apparently he was with Frank Zappa, right? He had met Frank Zappa and invited him to, to, to the show and was super humiliated because he was kicked out of the, he was kicked out of the fucking band because uh, Doyle was there. Doyle was there to play. And four... Four, um, the Bobby steals an asshole and a fucking cunt. That happened later uh, in 1981 when the undead opened for the misfits and they changed the lyrics because they were going back and forth with each other. So that that's the, the clarification on that. Gordon also asked, didn't they get the coffin truck truck? Didn't they get the coffin truck 
from Screaming Jay Hawkins. They sure did. That was Screaming Jay Hawkins' mojo, man. Screaming Jay Hawkins, you know, you talk about this idea of horror punk or death rock or spooky rock or ghoul shit. All of it, all of it, the fucking roots of that tree, the beginning of that whole situation is Screaming Jay Hawkins, man. Really, truly. I mean, there's a couple other songs. There's a song about the guy with the shovel and he's digging up his dead love or whatever. But I think it all goes back to I Put a Spell on You, 1956. I Put a Spell on You. Screaming Jay Hawkins. There's a guy, Alan Reed. Alan, the, the, there's a DJ guy or somebody um, who, 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 who pays Screaming Jay Hawkins $300 to jump out of a coffin in 1956 or 57. Screaming Jay Hawkins supposedly didn't even remember recording that song. He recorded it. Uh, uh, piss drunk originally it was a waltz dun 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 I put a spell on you dun 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 cause you're my so uh, and then he, they got incredibly drunk on wine and then it turned into I put a spell on you you know just get all like soul and just you know super eerie and haunting and whatnot. um you know, and he had some other songs, Little Demon, Feast of the Mau Mau, Alligator Wine. I feel like the, the origins come from that, truly. And now, here they are, 1980, opening for Screaming Jay Hawkins on Halloween night. What a cool situation. What a great first show for someone like Doyle, huh? Um, And so, all right, so here's the thing I want to say about what, what Jerry said here. So, it's like, Jerry's going, well, um, you know, like Bobby is coming late and he's not playing. He can't keep up. I don't know if that's what, what, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't, I don't think so, man. I think they just want, I think they were sick of, I think they were sick of his attitude or they were sick of his personality. They were sick of Bobby and they want really was Jerry Glenn Glenn. I think Glenn was indifferent because Glenn would later finance the recording sessions for the undead's first record and was going to put it out on plan nine. So clearly Glenn and, and, and Bobby had still had some sort of rapport. It was Jerry who just wanted him gone. Jerry wanted him gone. He wanted his brother in the band, you know, Glenn and Jerry had taught Doyle how to play, you know, um, it was the same philosophy that they had with Frank Licata about like Frank, not, you know, Frank kind of being somewhat of a beginner guitar player. And Jerry was like, this is okay. I'm glad you're a beginning guitar player. That's good. You know, we're, we're going to figure this out together. Doyle is like the paradigm for that, right? Doyle is the ultimate thing to be molded into whatever Glenn and Jerry want him to be. And Bobby was never going to be molded into whatever Glenn and Jerry wanted him to be. Bobby was always going to be Bobby. Bobby's an independent thinker in that sort of way or an independent, you know, mover. Doyle who's admittedly like this is just he 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 has he has a secret sauce but it's the only sauce that he's got right he makes his fucking devil lock he puts on his armbands he puts on some football pant, pants takes off his shirt he plays the songs he knows only two chords and that's it that's what he does he does that one thing and he does it very very well and he's a very good rhythm guitar player with those downstrokes you know Johnny Ramone style i mean he really can and then, you know, continue, you know, invented his own guitar and then, you know, learned how to punch the guitar and get a sound out of it and do these crazy neck bending things. Do you hear any other guitar player doing that sort of shit? You know, we love to shit on Doyle's guitar playing and his, you know, whatever. But at the same time, you know, it's just kind of like, I don't know. Peter says they should have kept Bobby and Doyle. And Peter, I 100 percent agree with you, man. What a what a power band that would have been. You have. Doyle, you have Doyle doing rhythm guitar. You have Bobby doing lead guitar. You got Glenn on vocals. You got Jerry on bass and whoever on drums, whether it was Googie or whoever, that would have been a powerful band. The 12, that the 12 hits from hell band, you know, it just, that, that would have been just so key. And they just couldn't, they couldn't, you know. And so, you know, Bobby says that Jerry was, um, Jerry couldn't pick him up or refused to pick him up. And he had all this heavy gear and he's a cripple and he couldn't carry it all. And uh, on the other side, you know, Glenn, Glenn Doyle and Jerry all say, well, he wouldn't show up. And I bet that's true on some level. I bet you that Bobby might have pulled like some move of like thinking that he was so irreplaceable that in order to flex, maybe he didn't show up once or twice. 
And so as a result, they're like, Doyle, get in here and play. But I think that paradigm could have been continued on Jerry's side of things to be to to show to shove it to to Bobby. So he goes, Oh, okay, you're gonna pull that shit. Well, then we're just not gonna, you know. So I bet there's a I bet there's some truth on both sides of that. I bet if we were to split the difference, we would find some semblance of the truth. It's not one way or the other. However, I think it was such a mistake to kick Bobby out of the band. He was so perfect for that band. His playing, he brought so much with his playing. Where are you going to find a punk as fuck guitar player who also had chops like Bobby? You're just not. You're not. You could have got, they could have gotten everything that they wanted from Doyle and still kept Bobby as a secret weapon on stage. So not only do you have the crooning vocals, not only do you have the fucking twins of evil, but you also have this secret weapon guitar samurai who is going to do all those little, you know, uh, frills on horror business. You know what I mean? All that, all that, all those little things where Eagles there, you know, you lose all of that stuff. Now, could Bobby have made the transition to playing hardcore music? like super fast earth ad stuff probably not but that's the thing if bobby had stayed in the band we never would have gotten earth ad just in the same way we never if any of these guys stayed in the band we never would have gotten earth ad earth ad is a direct result of all these people leaving the band and then the band going and playing with hardcore kids who knows would they have played with hardcore kids if bobby was even in the band maybe they would have stayed on the new york scene Maybe they would have gotten signed to the major label. Once again, they're like all these like these crossroads where maybe the Misfits would have gotten signed and been a bigger band than they were, right? As Jerry said in part one, the, the thing we were doomed the moment that Static Age didn't become a hit record or, or didn't, didn't get put out. The moment that Static Age didn't get put out, we were doomed. So who knows? Um, let's see what else is said here. Uh, bu- 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 sorry, Mike Stacks. So when Bobby was fucking up, you were recording the tracks for what eventually became Walk Among Us, Jerry Only. Yeah, Bobby kept showing up late, or he'd show up with no strings on his guitar, or not have strings and steal Doyle strings, or play Doyle's guitar and use Doyle's amp. So why the hell am I waiting for Bobby? Ha ha ha. So fuck it, Bobby. Take your guitar with no strings, put it back in your case, and get back on the bus and go wherever the hell you gotta go. Don't let us hold you up. Ha 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 ha. So, I mean, there you go. As what we were just, we, what we, uh, in, in terms of what we were just saying, I'm sure that there's some truth to that. Here's Jerry's getting sick of, of Bobby's, you know, sit, all this stuff with Bobby. I bet everything that Jerry just said is true. Truthfully. I'm sure that Bobby showed up late. I'm sure that Bobby didn't have strings on his guitar or use Doyle's equipment or whatnot. The flip side of that is Bobby going, Jerry's not going to, Jerry's refusing to pick me up. I have all this gear. I'm a cripple. I need to take the bus to get there. The bus came late. I'm sure the bus that, you know, you know, between the, you know, catching, catching a whole bunch of buses to get to some recording studio. You know what I'm saying? It's two sides of the coin. It's not any one thing. It's all of it. They're, they're both correct. Both Bobby and Jerry are correct. However, Jerry had an ax to grind with Bobby for sure. He had an ax to grind. And this, he saw this as his uh, moment. He saw this as a moment where he could just, you know, not deal with all of, you know, Bobby's things. I don't know. Um, By the time Three Hits from Hell was released in April 1981, it had been more than a year and a half since their last record. There had been, in fact, numerous recording sessions during this time. So in 1993, I mean, the, the history is pretty well known in 1983. This is like we all know this stuff. We all know this stuff today. There's no ma- there hasn't been too many major revelations the, the the history the oral history has been intact was, was 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 told between this interview and you know glenn's interview with pusshead i mean you have the story of the band really truly um there had in fact been numerous recording sessions during this time with the band working on material for an eventual album that would be 12 hits from hell the songs on three hits were drawn from some of these album sessions featuring the first appearance of Doyle on guitar, but with Bobby Steele credited for extra guitar on London Dungeon. So when 12 hits came out and there were like 13 tracks, 12, sorry, no, 13, including the second cut of London Dungeon. 
you know, you uh, you have all these 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 tracks, and everybody's going, "Oh my God, it's it's Jerry and Doyle on the same track!" Holy shit, this is so crazy. It's really not that crazy because even on Three Hits from Hell, Bobby is credited with extra guitars. Robbie Alter is also credited for extra guitar work, who is kind of producing the sessions. He's the guy who's doing the atmosphere guitar work on Halloween. I know we talked about this recently, Ian. Um, Ian, one of our moderators at uh, on the Facebook group says, people say that punk bands can't play, but on the contrary, the punk bands that get remembered have one or more outstanding musicians. The Static Age horror biz lineups were a testament to that. I absolutely agree with you. On the Static Age side, um, you have such a they are such a solid tight band when they were recording that live, you know. And it's the same thing with, even with the horror business band. Both bands are super fucking tight when they're when they're in the recording studio and pretty much everything was recorded live uh, at least up until that point right static age is recorded live and and the horror business and night of living dead eps were recorded live with tons of bleed through because of the amp situation jerry's playing with a big bass amp and 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 bobby has a tiny little 20 watt amp or something like that um Bobby Steele, credit, blah, blah, blah. London Dungeon, inspired by Glenn's experience in England, is perhaps the most unique track the Misfits ever did. It's dark. It's a dark atmospheric number anchored by Jerry's... On <sighs> London Dungeon, inspired by Glenn's experience in England, is probably the most unique track the Misfits ever did. It's a dark atmospheric number anchored by Jerry's ominous churning bass line and a simple, deep, Re reverberative reverberating guitar riff it's circulated by coils of sinister feedback that's from robbie alter and eerie background vocal vo voices and eerie background voices over which glenn delivers a masterful vocal performance the b-side tracks horror hotel and ghouls night out the latter with pounding almost dave clark five type drumming drum thumpage oh that's interesting the b-side tracks horror hotel and ghouls night out the latter with pounding almost dave clark five type dr drum thumpage were more typical but well up to par and horror hotel was written uh at the behest of howie pyro during the mad monster movie club the the the, the, the mon pfft. The monster movie club they were a part of howie pyro was there and howie pyro's favorite movie was horror hotel and suggested that they write a song about it and glenn wrote a song about it for howie and as we know howie would later go play bass and dancing all right next page does this thing ever end it does not okay uh so here's some more photos at the cave cave right um The addition of Doyle to the lineup not only stabilized the band, but also gave the Misfits' image a new symmetry. With the big warrior-like Kaafa brothers flanking Glenn's shorter figure, making for an unforgettable frontline visual effect, the Misfits' image now became more defined. The devil locks grew longer, physiques grew more powerful, and their clothes took a more unified look, incorporating their skull logo from the Crimson Ghost and leather gear equipped with huge metal studs and spikes, which the brothers made at their factory jobs. Well put. I mean, you d that well friggin' put, man. It did, and, you know, the sad truth is, you know, it did stabilize the band. Stabilize the band because Doyle is fucking Jerry's brother. I mean, that kind of solves the problem. I guess when you look at it from that situation, going back to the Bobby Steele debacle, I guess when you look at that from that situation, here is Jerry just sick and tired of replacing member members you know they've gone through so many man let's think about all the band members manny frank mr jim joey image bobby seal they've been through five band members at this point as they're trying to break in and get bigger and bigger and now that they have doyle all they got to do is worry about the drumming position and that's literally what happened once the doyle piece is in place now all they got to do is just keep the drumming situation intact uh which was also uh, which continued to be plague them until their demise in 1983. um mike stacks 
Now, when Doyle joined the Misfits in 81, he was only 15 or 16 years old. Was he still in high school? Jerry only. Yeah. Mike Stacks, what kind of reaction did he get from the other people in his school? Jerry only. Well, we had our problems with the faculty and shit, but the kids thought it was great. When he was in eighth grade, he had pink hair and they wouldn't give him his diploma. And my mom had to go down and get it and shit. That was in the papers. <laughs> Jerry only. Well, we had our problems with the faculty and shit, but the kids thought it was great. When he was in eighth grade, he had pink hair and they wouldn't give him his diploma. And my mom had to go down and get it and shit. That was in the papers. I got a write up in that. Ha ha. So they weren't too psyched at Doyle, but that's just what he wanted to do. Not too many people understood it, but that's what Doyle was into. And he wanted to play guitar. So he did. He was in school and he was playing football and all the normal things he would norm normally would. But in the summer, we would just go on the road, cover our ass at work and go take off on tour. The next release turned out to be a Glenn Danzig solo project, Who Killed Marilyn, uh, with Spook City, USA, released on August 5th, 1981, the 19th anniversary of Marilyn Monroe's death. The Misfits had already recorded the song much earlier, but according to an interview with Danzig in Thrasher, that's the Pusset interview, uh, the others weren't interested in releasing it, so he, re he redid it a little project. The Misfits version can be found on Legacy of Brutality, and it's a bristling indictment of the Maryland cover-up, which easily trounces Glenn's credible but stiff solo version. I wouldn't call it credible, but if we're being honest, Glenn's you know, I, Glenn at the time, they weren't doing much as a band. And Glenn was like, you know, hey, let's go. Let's let's do some shit because they're they're working. I mean, this is where the first Fisher, you know, this is where the first rift between these guys is happening. Glenn wants to do shit. Those guys are busy working or not doing much of anything. So Glenn goes with the help of George Germain, the mysterious, mysterious benefactor. Uh, goes uh, and records everything by himself, almost as if to prove to the band and to whoever else that he thought might be challenging him that he could do it without them. And the truth is, and here I think is a true testament as to why Glenn needed, you know, a, 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 a personnel in his band. Tom S. Mustache says, that's got to be tiring. I'm assuming you're talking about replacing people in lineups. I'm sure it is, man. I mean, there's there is, you know, every side to the story is valid between Bobby and Jerry on both sides. Uh, you know, Bobby is being sabotaged because of how Jerry about because of Jerry's fatigue in the situation. It's a two way street, man. Um, But getting back to this, this thing, you know, you listen to Glenn doing all the instruments. Glenn is not at the time, you know, because I got to tell you, his 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 drumming did improve. You listen to his drumming on November Coming Fire. It's great. You listen to his drumming on Death Red Sabau on Black Candy. He's a fucking great drummer on Black Candy. I mean, dude does know how to drum, but at this time, he you know he's barely holding a beat. You know, uh, and the guitar and the the guitar and the bass is so rudimentary. It almost feels like a jalopy airplane that is falling apart and just barely holding together as it puts along in the air. Or like a locomotive, the same analogy, a locomotive that's just not, that's just barely holding together at breakneck speed. It just doesn't, I don't know, man. I just like the Misfits version so much better. Gordon says the Misfits version of Who Killed Marilyn is the Glenn solo version on any albums. You can, I mean, you can find it on YouTube. It's it's in the box set. You can hear it on the box set. Um, You can hear it on YouTube. Otherwise, you can hear it on Legacy Brutality. And Spook City was a super rare recording. Before you could not hear the Misfits version of Spook City before the box set. So I would say it's one of the rarest recordings, along with In the Doorway and American Nightmare, are probably and Mephisto Waltz are probably the most, you know, obscure recordings of, of that band, you know, in terms of like, you know, and I guess Return of the Fly. If you well, Return of the Fly appears in two places though, now, uh, all these years later. But, you know, there was a time where Return of the Fly was like a never before heard track, if you can imagine. And now the rarest songs are the ones that, you know, don't exist uh, apart from live recordings, which are Infant Stranger, Lullaby, West End Avenue, Harpies in the Night. Those songs and Feline Nursery. I'm going to throw away the key to the Feline Nursery. 
get on the floor and whisper my name. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, so yeah, so that that look here, we're about to hear what Jerry thinks of Glenn's solo single in 1993. Mike Stacks, what was the story with Glenn's solo single? You guys didn't want to do that song? Jerry only. No, I had no problem with it. I don't know who the hell uh I don't know what the hell he was doing. Mike Stacks, what was the story with Glenn's solo single? You guys didn't want to do the song? Jerry only. No, I had no problem with it. I don't know who the hell he I don't know what the hell he was doing. No, I had no problem with it. I don't know what the hell he was doing. I think he wanted to play some guitar. I don't know. Mike Stacks, in an interview in Thrasher, Glenn said that you guys didn't want to do the song anymore. And so he just did it himself. Jerry only. That I'm not sure. I don't remember. I think he was looking for something different out of it. Whatever the case, I don't actually remember. But that was him and the guy across the street from us. I get the guy across the street from him. He's referring to George Germain. Um, oh, that's the end of that. Look at them carrying. There's Arthur with his suitcase and something that says misfits on it. You can see that right there. Peter asks, is there a version of feline nursery from static age? No, Peter. All right, Peter, you got to go back to the first episodes. We covered this in the very first episodes of the show. Go back. The first three or four episodes talk about these lost versions uh, in, in greater detail. So feline nursery was the name of spinal remains all the way up until they went to go record the static age album. And then what happened was in the studio, for reasons not not known, it might have been because I've heard that somebody bumped into a tape machine and fucked up the track to Feline Nursery that they had recorded it. But at some point, Glenn changed and rearranged the song to, to Spinal Remains. But it started off as a song called Feline Nursery. And the song is essentially Spinal Remains, except for I'm going to throw away the key to the feline nursery. Uh, Robbie says, George Germain, the guy across the street. I wonder if Jerry had a problem with him. Yeah, you know, like th those guys are like that, man. Uh, Glenn, too. It's like, you know, George Germain was a fucking father figure to these guys. I mean, he really took an interest. He was a lot older and he took great interest in what they were doing and he, he helped fund the the project you know he's funding all these these recordings and showing them how to customize their guitars you know and it's just like it's just it's just a bummer that they don't really acknowledge him that the way that i maybe they just don't want they don't want people to think that um they want people to think that it was all them they don't want to diminish they don't want to diminish their output when you know if, but if we're being fair like he really did he helped them out a lot um, Robbie says you're gonna throw away the key to the feline nursery down in the city where the pussies all play. I don't know what you mean by that, Robbie, but yeah. Uh, Pete, I thought they would have an outtake or something. Uh, I don't know. There might be. Oh, here we go. Ian says the tape reel story came from Mr. Jim. I'm sure when they recorded in 1978. It was more like Spiral Remains than the rockabilly sounding one with Manny. I mean, I don't know if Feline Nursery is really that rockabilly. I'm going to throw away the key to the Feline Nursery. Get on the floor and whisper my name in when you... Oh, I see what you're saying, Robbie. You got to throw away the key to the Feline Nursery. Down in the city where the pussies all play and blah, blah. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I really don't. Um, but it's very similar, and a lot of the lyrics are spinal remains, so I don't know. Um, if Glenn's solo experiment was the sign of some dissent in the band, it was quickly put behind them. Three months later, on October 31st, they released a great new single, Halloween, a rousing horror show screamer, which soon became a live favorite. On the B-side, its evil twin, Halloween 2, has darker demons lurking which Glenn would conjure up again in Sam Hain. It also reflected Danzig's growing interest in the occult. By now, the Walk Among Us album had basically been completed, and there was some frustration that after almost four years, they still didn't have a full-length record out. Finally, in early 1982, 
the band made a deal with Slash Records for a one-off LP on their Ruby subster- subsidiary, which was um, that Chris D from the Flesh Eaters was uh, uh, key in that whole situation. And um, Glenn even flew out. He flew out to the west coast and crashed on a couch where they remixed it they remixed it chris didn't like the mix of the plant because originally glenn was just going to put it out on plan nine and the plan nine version we've heard the plan nine version uh devil's whorehouse sounds way different so fucking different than it does on um than it does on uh, uh the walk among us the, the 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 slash walk among us and those dudes still own they still own that recording that's why we have 11 billion versions of walk among us coming out on vinyl in, in beautiful, wonderful colors. Um, also, you know, maybe Glenn is maybe, maybe who killed Marilyn Glenn on who killed Marilyn is starting to say, huh? Tanner says something interesting. Interestingly, there's a mix between plan nine and the Chris D mix. Um, I wonder if it's on the tape. All right, so there's this guy I know, and he has a mix down tape of Walk Among Us that he got directly from Jerry in 1981 or 82. He lives up by me. I've been trying to get a hold of this tape. I got I got to DM him again. I wonder because I'm dying. I have a feeling the mixes are different, much different. And I wonder if that's what Tanner's talking about. That's interesting. That's interesting. Man, um, Gordon says, I would love a plan nine version of walk, walk to be released. Well, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but, but, um, you can find it. It is, it is out there. If you look hard enough, you can find it. Um, and definitely hear, hear that. Um, I bet that's different actually. Maybe, I don't know. Ian says, was that the tape from Discogs? I don't know. Uh, pull it up, Ian. Show me the link. All I know is that this guy lives literally right, like in the same, like a town over from me. And uh, I've been meaning to uh, meet up with him uh, to listen to it because I want to hear it for myself. Uh, but I'm sure whatever is on there is different from anything that we've heard, which would be so fucking cool to hear that shit. Man, maybe I can get him on the show. Ooh. Oh, all right. You gotta, gotta, gotta think about that. Uh, Tanner says the one I'm talking about sounds more like the one Chris D did, but came right before him. So what you're saying is there's a plan nine mix and then there's another mix and then there there's another mix before the slash mix. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Peter says enter at your own risk. Are you referring to the box set? Was that the, you're talking about the box set uh, that, that, Glenn wanted to put out of of singles. Tanner says, "I believe it was Glenn mixing it." Huh. So Glenn did a remix after he had done the Plan Nine mix. Chris D's complaint about the Plan Nine mix was that it was the vocals and the drums were too loud, and you couldn't hear anything else. I love the Plan. I love the Slash mixes of that Walk Among Us material. I think they're great. Um. Different from what you hear on 12 Hits from Hell, but still great. Uh, even though those are two different things altogether. All right, let's let's get fit. Let's get through this. Fuck, it's already 848. Motherfucker. Um Mike Stacks. How did you get the deal with Slash Ruby for the album? Jerry only. Basically, we had to beg them to put the fucking thing out. Ha ha ha. As funny as it may seem. See. Now, you know, if you hear Glenn, if you hear Glenn, oh, Tanner says, interesting, the mix I'm talking about, the vocals are way higher. Well, that's the thing. Chris D, Chris D was, Chris D thought that the vocals and the drums were higher. And then when they remixed them, I guess what they did was they made them, they, they, they balanced it out, making the vocals and the drums more mixed in with the guitar and the bass. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't know. Um, did you... So Jerry only saying that we had to beg them to put the fucking thing out. Because I feel like Glenn, uh, on you know, and maybe in the plus interview, I don't think that, that's, a, that, that's not what Glenn has said. Um, Mike Stacks 
Did you get paid up front for the recording costs? Jerry only, no, we got ripped off up front. Ha ha ha. Mike Stacks. So what was the deal they gave you? Yeah, there was some bad record keeping. Ah, cool. All right. There it is. That That's what Ian, I can't access it right now. Shit, because of the thing. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Uh, I, I got I to gotta see this. All right, I'm going to be a little late to my other thing. And that's... Um, hold on, people. I want to see two, the tape, the tape that that we are referring to. Let's see if I can ah, let's pull that back up. Hold on one second. There we go. There we go. There we go. Got to fill in the dead air. There we go. All right, got to mute this for a second. There I am. Back in time. Get down. There it is. There she is. All right, let's take a look at this. If it'll let me. Yes. Uh, yes, I believe this is the tape. I believe this is the tape. That is correct. Here it is, man. No. No. I no, I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know if this is the tape. Man, I don't know if this is the tape. Hmm. Interesting. So this is weird. This has got two versions of Halloween 2, two versions of London Dungeon. Wow, there's two versions of Halloween 2. That is so cool. Two versions of Vampira. Whoa. I bet you that's stellar, whatever it is. This is from Rough Mixes. These are early run-throughs of Walk Among Us tracks. Several are missing lyrics where Glenn just vocalizes. Halloween 2 on Side A is entirely instrumental and very punky. Side A runs 26 minutes and 48 seconds. Side B appears to have a unique version of Halloween 2, which graphs on the ending of Halloween, which we've heard. And has a radio fade. Side B is only 6 minutes and 28 seconds. Sound quality is relatively good throughout. The left channel is significantly louder than the right channel. Unfortunately, the first 47 seconds of Night of Living Dead, Side A track 1 was recorded over. That's a shame. With Elton John's Dear John. Oh, my God. Definitely not by me. Happened before it got to me. So I don't think this is the same tape. I think this is a Walk Among Us tape. Fuck. There are relatively few dropouts and distortion. If needed, I can provide more clarity for my notes. I obtained this tape in early 91 from a 15-year-old that had moved to Yonkers from either Vineland or, or Lodi. It was given to him several years prior by one of the misfits. Jerry, this is the same tape. All right, this is the fucking tape. I can't remember who he said gave it to him. And now I'm again in the process of trying to track him down again. We'll update if I can provide more Info as to prove, yeah, 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 from Yonkers, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I know, I know this person. I know, well, I don't know this person, but I know this person, and this is the same tape. This is the same fucking tape. Cool. All right, folks, more on that another time. That, that, that has to be revisited. Haha. Ha. Um, how so, Ian? Ian says that I jogged his memory. How did the story jog your memory? Um, so Mike Stack says, so what was the deal they gave you? This is the slash deal for Walk Among Us. Uh, Jerry only. The deal was that they'd, uh, they'd put it out. If, uh, if we did get reimbursed, we paid about three grand for studio time. So if we did get reimbursed, they gave the money to Glenn because I never saw any of it. Then they had this guy, Chris D, who used to be with the Flesh Eaters. He remixed it. Uh, he remixed it for Slash. He was working for Slash at the time. So he still gets paid off of that, too. At one point, we sold 70,000 copies in two weeks when they re-released it. We were number five in the country for two weeks. And then we were right back off as quick as we were on. Wow, 70,000 copies pre-1993. Who knows if it's 70,000 copies? I don't know. I don't know if it's true. Um, 
Ian says, but yeah, Jerry is famous for giving away priceless pieces of memorabilia. Dude, it was definitely, I know it was Jerry. Jerry was the one who gave the tape. For sure it was Jerry who gave that tape away. Uh, and yes, he is notorious for that. Um, Peter says, someone needs to upload that to YouTube. Uh, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> would love to hear that. Love it. Uh, Walk Among Us Stands is probably the ultimate misfits recording. You know, some people are going to be like, what the fuck, Jeff? But I got I think I agree, man. I think it is the ultimate misfits recording in the sense that, like, if you really want to introduce someone to the misfits, start with fucking Walk Among Us, man. Astro Zombies, Night of the Living Dead, 20 Eyes, All Hell Breaks Loose. I mean, this is how people should come to know this band and then dive into all the nooks and crannies. You know, I feel like ask, you want to play someone the misfits, play them fucking Astro Zombies, right? From Walk Among Us. Um, the highlights include uh, blah, 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 blah. a thrilling, livid depiction of their horror movie vision of the world pummeled across thir- over pummeled across over 13 tracks of violent punk rock and roll. The highlights include the rabble rousing hate breeders, the brutal wrenching all hell breaks loose and a brilliant and the brilliant Astro Zombies with just one. All right, guys, maybe what I'll do, because it's nine o'clock. Let me see if there's enough material for a third episode. Oh, Jeff, three episodes of this interview. What the fuck? Well, I mean, you got to you got to give me a break here. Yeah, there is so much. Oh, my God. We're never going to get through all this tonight. No, not going to happen. Guys, we're going to have a part three. We're going to have to do a part three. Um, We're going to stop it here. We're going to stop it here. Okay. So that's that's where we end tonight's episode. Um, so that's interesting. I did not know that there were more mixes. Uh, Tanner, I'd love to know more. What does that mean? What what other mi- so what so when did this happen? Why was Glenn? Why was Glenn? If Glenn was going to put this out on Plan Nine, why was he remixing it? Was he remixing it for Slash? And then they were like, no, 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 we want to remix it. And then he flew out there and then they did a remix on their side of things. I wonder what 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 the reasoning behind another mix was. I guess we'll to be continued. Hey, guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full-time. I want this to be my full-time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know. But I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. (laughs) So right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 cents. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates. 
that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents. Uh, this is the latest and greatest way. There's a lot of ways to support this channel and the creation of the 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 art, the content, if you want, whatever you want to call it. One of them is 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 checking out our November Fire Sour Cream Pure Natural shirts, and this very documentary for which this page is a thing, for which this page is. I don't know how how to phrase that. These this is the official Lodi. Um, merch, as you can see, here is uh, JFK with uh, uh, a demon vein growing out of his forehead. Um, untrademarked demon vein. You get a pink mug. You can get a neck warmer. You can get a fanny pack in any color that you feel. I love the neon that neon just pops it's bright burns my burns my retinas the neon big fan of that actually my the, my favorite thing are is the hoodie the hoodie because it's got the you got the little image the little insignia on the on the front and on the back you get that big back logo decal and you can get that in a variety of colors people let's see what some of the colors wow you can do it in red you can do it in blue you can do it in gray in, you know, I can't tell what that is with my sunglasses on and look, that looks like a winter. Yeah. Winter green. I like the winter green one. Fuck. Did we lose? We lost, uh, we lost our picture for a second. Okay. We're back. Wow, that's really great, though, Pete. We're I'm glad you're going to pick up a coffee mug. So that, okay. Uh, Peter says he's going to do a hot pink. I like that. Yes, yes, that's great. All right, so let's finish off this. Uh, this has taken three. You know, I thought this would be one episode. This has taken three episodes to do, just because I'm such a chatty Kathy, I guess when we're going through this stuff. All right, I think this we we finished we were we were last on page 18. So we're gonna so turn please turn to page 18 in your workbooks, children, and we're gonna move on from there. Uh continuing on. We'll we'll start. This might be a little bit of an overlap. Well, this is overlap. I remember Mike Stacks asked, you know, um asked Jerry only about the 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 slash. And again, for those of you just joining us or for those who might this episode might be your first episode. We are pouring over an interview with Jerry only in 1993. We looked at an interview from 1983 and now we're doing an interview from 1993. And we also have a, an interview from 2003 with Jerry only. So we're going to look at that one next. And that's not next episode. As a matter of fact, God willing, I don't want to speak out of turn, but God willing, cross your fingers. I have a big surprise for the next episode. Uh, that is not 1979. But that also, too, is coming. Uh, and one last thing that I will say, uh, Pizza Punk is coming. Pizza is the shit. Don't you know it? Because pizza is so punk, 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 punk. It's punk. Ooey gooey cheese right down to my knees. It's so punk. It's punk. All right. Back to the material here. So this is Jerry only in 1993 talking to this guy, Mike Stacks from Ugly Things. Number 12. He's asking him about uh, the Slash Ruby record deal. And Jerry only saying, uh, we got ripped off up front. Uh, the deal was that they'd pay it, uh, put it out. Uh, if, and if that they, if Jerry, Jerry is unsure if, if they recouped money or not, um, because he doesn't really know because Glenn, Glenn was handling that sort of stuff. Uh, and Jerry also claims that 70,000 copies were sold in two weeks. Whew. Um, but that does, sort of tie in with what Chris D was saying in an interview about how walk among us became one of the best selling records um, for those guys. So, all right, moving on. Um, walk among us stands as probably the ultimate misfits recording 
a thrilling, livid depiction of their horror movie vision of the world, pummeled across over 13 tracks of violent punk rock and roll. The highlights include the rabble-rousing hate breeders, the brutal wrenching all hell breaks loose and the brilliant astro zombies with just a touch of my burning hand i send my astro zombies to rape this land prime directive exterminate the whole human race this and other tracks like i turned into a martian and their tribute to the horror movie mistress and plan nine from outer space star vampira employ their B-movie obsession to the hilt while Mommy Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight and Brain Eaters show a fiendish sense of humor uh, that is also at work. Walk Among Us shows us just what, what it was the Misfits had that other punk bands couldn't hope to match. Originality and imagination in their lyrics, fitting in with their unmistakable image, powerhouse musicianship, including a singer who could actually sing, true, uh, I, I, is there a different? There's a difference, right? Isn't there a difference between a singer and a vocalist? I would say, and this is not to knock him because I think he's an excellent vocalist. Keith Morris of Black Flag and Circle Jerks, he's a vocalist. I don't think of him as a as much of a singer, in the sense that he is singing, but he's more of like it, it, his. It's not like he's singing, you know, with classical. He's not singing class with like classical training. Or he's not singing like, you know, bravado or like with operatic scale or whatever musical theory sort of situation you want to cobble together. You know, Keith Morris is like a, a poet reciting poetry. And that's not to say that Glenn is not either, because Glenn is both of those things. He's a vocalist and he writes poetry that he but he sings it. He really sings it, you know, and, and that would only further that would only further develop uh, with Danzig. Right. But at the time, um, you had a lot of these punk guys who are just like sort of, I would say Henry Rollins is a vocalist too. You know, these guys, they're screaming, they're shouting, guttural. You know, there's a talent in doing that as well. It's not just, it, it, it's not just about like, you know, being able to sing in key, in pitch. It's about like the energy that you're putting out as the front man who's representing the band. And I think that is like another thing beside you have like vocalist, you have singer and you also have front man and front man usually winds up with being a vocalist and a singer, but sometimes a front man might be a guitar player. You know, maybe the front man is a guitar player, but he's also singing, you know? Um, and when you think of a front man, a front man is a person who's like the face of the band. Generally, when I think of a front man, especially when you think about these bands who like they, they, they break up or they get, um, you know, uh, there's various lineups with various members, and the only original member is the singer, songwriter, vocalist, who's also the face of the band. That's the front man. That's what I think of as a front man in that sort of way. Um, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> where was I? We got to finish this today. We really got to finish this today. The Misfits had all the ha had the other punk. Uh, <laughs> The Misfits had that other punk bands couldn't hope to match originally imagination in their lyrics, fitting with their unmistakable image, powerhouse musicianship, including a singer who could actually sing and songs that went way beyond. OK, here's where we go at songs that went way beyond the simplistic formula riffs of 95 percent of their peers. Glenn Danzig's songs have real melodies that soar and dive over crafty, intelligent chord changes. A song like Skulls, for example, is unmistakably punk rock. Yet the structure could be more easily belonged to, say, an Elvis or a Dion in the Belmont song uh, than something by the Sex Pistols or the Circle Jerks. And that's why the Misfits music connects in a way that your average Ramalama punk band never could. Unfortunately, instead of being a launching pad, Walk Among Us turned out to be a peak. Wow. I agree with that, man. Turned out to be the peak. That was it was true. It was the peak of their it was the peak of everything. Walk Among Us, you know, Um and yeah, man, those songs, Attitude too, like all those songs, they are Elvis songs. They're DM and Belmont songs. That's what Sean Garrison is saying from his Little Fiend series that we, we went over. Find it in the uh, find it in the old archive on YouTube. 
um, where he's talking about, you know, these Glenn and Jerry, like they revered as much as they revered punk rock, they revered the crooners. They revered Dion. They revered, you know, Elvis and the Everly brothers and this and that uh, so much so that um, after the, the, the 95 misfits imploded, Jerry put out a project 1950 record. Um, which again, if it was just like the Jerry only band, it's like, whoa, Jerry only enlisted, you know, Des from Black Flag and Marky Ramone to play in his backing band and do 1950s covers on paper. That sounds great. But when you look at it, it's like, this is the Misfits doing a cover record. It doesn't sound so great. It doesn't work out. It's not, uh, it doesn't work out that well. Um, Mike Stacks. Uh, what do you think of Walk Among Us uh, the way that it came out, Jerry Only? To tell you the truth, I think it's the best thing we did, you know? The problem here was that it was a stepping stone, and no no one intentionally wanted to accept that as what uh, accept that as what we were and what we would be. In other words, it wasn't time to draw a tangent. It was time to go forward, and that was the demise of the band after that point. Glenn wanted to get heavy into this thrash stuff, and me, I wanted more songs like Astro Zombies and Hate Breeders. If we had three albums with two or three more songs like that on each one, we uh, we would have been in. And you're not going to get there with Wolf's Blood. Death's, Death, comes, uh, Death Comes Ripping is a good song, but it's not an Astro Zombies. I mean, that's true, but man, there's nothing like opening those reunion shows with like that ass with uh, Death Comes Ripping that and then just launching in just jumping, jumping, seizing through the air as they, they cr come crashing down and there, there's a demon sweat thrall in the, <laughs> in the audience. Um, but yeah, I think as I've said in episodes past, man, Astro Zombies is like the best representation of this band. I love each and every song, but that is like, that for me is like, that's the pinnacle. That's the, um, that's what you want on the tombstone uh, for the coffin that's buried six feet below. Um, the point in the road was getting to the walk among us and then becoming better, but everybody missed the point. I saw it. It was clear as the nose on my face. I said, shit, this is us. This is when the image had taken old. And that's what, that's when we did that evil live stuff. We were there, Mike stacks. And then when you were doing a lot of the touring and stuff, you had a pretty high profile, Jerry only, right? We were prime time. Right then, we should have gotten picked up. You see, Slash, they wanted to write us off as a quick investment and a quick buck instead of taking it to the potential. Uh, Mike Stacks, where did you tour? You went all over the USA. Jerry only. Yeah, we did about three or four trips over the whole country. We circled it. We usually started high and came back low, going across the top, down the West Coast, and then through the South and back up the East Coast. We got around. It was good. There was a lot of money that came over the doors and I would pick up the tab all the way around most of the time. So any money the band was making was going right back into the band. And that's true, man. The Like DOA, like Black Flag, like a few other guys, the Misfits were one of those bands that were just out there friggin' touring. They were in Florida. You know, they were in fucking California. They were in, you know, Michigan, Ohio. Colorado, Arizona, Texas. I mean, they went all over. I don't know how much they cut through the, the middle of the country. Like, I don't think the Misfits ever play in Oklahoma or Nebraska or Tennessee. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, they, they really did get around, man. Um, Mike Stacks, what incidents stick out in your mind from being on the road? The band had a reputation for a lot of violence. All right, we're getting to that point in the story. Let's see what Jerry Only has to say. Again, remember, this is Jerry Only remembering things 10 years later after the band's demise. He's not yet back with the 95 Misfits. He's still probably pretty bitter. He's in the middle of the lawsuit with Glenn to gain back the control of the name and actually probably on some, some level trying to get some of that publishing. Jerry Only. Well, you know what it was? Every time we played, we were ready to play. We were psyched, you know? You get that knot in your stomach. And when we played, there wasn't ever a time where there was an audience so small that we didn't want to go out and still kick ass. You know what I mean? Isn't that kind of like a, a sportsman? It's almost like a sporty sportsman vibe. You know, like we're going out to play football. We're going to do the best. We got to score some touchdowns, you know, 
just like go out there and do your best to like just uh, crush it. You know, that's what I get. That's the kind of vibe I get from what Jerry is uh, saying here. Um, and when we played, there wasn't a time. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, who was there or, or, or what was there had no bearing on it. It could have been ho the Hollywood Bowl or it could have been Al's bar. It didn't matter. And I think that was one of the good things. They just that they just put 100% into what they were doing. They would just go out there, play to, you know, 50 people or played, uh, you know, the most they ever played was 3,000 people with Black Flag at Santa Monica Civic Center. One of their last shows, actually. Uh, and I think that was one of the good things. Everybody loved what they were doing. When we used to play, I would sometimes, I would stand up. He says, I would stand up. I think he means I would stay up. Everybody loved what they were doing. When we used to play, I would stay up until four or five in the morning. If we got off at one o'clock or something and not be, oh, no, okay, never mind. I don't know. I don't know what he means here. When we used to play, I would stand up until four or five in the morning. If we got off at one o'clock or something and not be able to sit down, just keep walking back and forth saying, oh, man, that was so great because we were into it and we were playing from the heart. That's what the band was all about. It was about doing what you believed. Unfortunately, it all came to a uh, peak out in that one time, you know. At that point, Glenn lost sight of what really should have been done. And I know what should have been done. We should have just kept our image, made our shit together, made our equipment better, bought our own sound system, bought our own light system, and stayed on the road, you know. I mean, we wouldn't have gotten a sold out Madison Square Garden show if they hadn't gone the way that they had gotten. But what would that band have been like that? Like these road warriors just out there, just doing it year after year, becoming a well oiled machine. Maybe Doyle does improve. You know, if Doyle never takes a break. He just keeps improving in that punk rock sort of way. And uh, uh, they just get tighter and tighter. Maybe they find a steady drummer. They put out a slew of albums. And maybe they break up in like the 90s instead of the 80s, you know, and then do a reunion. Who knows, man? I mean, you can you can go anywhere with that story. The American dream. Mike Stacks, you know, you were talking about being pumped up when you were on stage. I have a video of a show where you smash your bass on the first song. That's fucking insane. Ha ha ha. You always see bands smash their equipment at the end, but you smash yours at the beginning. And the reason why he did that is because he had a ton of knockoffs. George Germain, that guy, that, you know, that mysterious benefactor, the guy we're always talking about, the mysterious George, whose face you will see very soon in 1979. He taught the boys how to do shit. He taught the boys how to like, he taught the boys how to like, you know, uh, uh, buy their gear in bulk, switch out the pickups with better pickups. And then they would just smash those guitars, bringing all these guitars out on the road, you know? Um, Jerry only says, yeah, I remember one time I forgot to plug, plug one in and I got really aggravated and smashed it up. And then I saw the cord was laying on the ground and I felt like a jerk. Ha 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 ha. Mike stacks. Were you going through a lot of equipment at that time? Jerry only. We played one show with black flag at the Santa Monica civic center. We just talked about that. Doyle and I both went through about $2,000 worth of instruments. Exclamation point. We were buying them for a buck and a quarter. So they're paying $125 a piece for these guitars. Uh, so it was about eight guitars and eight basses in 40 in a 45 minute set. Ha ha ha. So I don't know what that figures out to in minutes. That's like Mike Stack says, that's like one every two songs or something. Jerry only. Yeah, that's what it was. But the thing was to do it quick and to get it out of the way. It was actually, it was an actual like karate chop thing, you know? You would smash it and it had to go on the first shot. Otherwise you'd look stupid. So that's what it became for them. It's almost like, <laughs> it's like Cobra Kai or like a uh, karate kid or something. It's like they're up on the stage, you know, here, let's take a look at this photo. Look at this photo. Let's see if I can Jimmy that closer for you. That's a cool photo. I don't think I've seen that. I mean, they're just, they're up on the stage. Just here, I'm going to make this my, my thumbnail real quick. Let's, let's try that differently. I'm like the only guy that poses for his thumbnail mid episode. I'm posing. That's perfect. 
<laughs> it's like, I just don't give a shit. Um, look at that, man. Look at that. And just breaking, breaking shit, man. Breaking bases, you know, left and right. For them, it was like a Cobra Kai karate chop situation. They're just, you know, it's just all about, it's about the spectacle, you know, it's just about the spectacle. Um, what and and he was more concerned about looking stupid for not breaking the base on the first try than say even breaking his base period because it was just it's about the show mike stack says uh what kind of base was that anyway jerry only i was playing rickenbackers then i would cut it all up and glue the headstock on i did that myself mike stacks that's an amazing looking base you still play that jerry only no i made a much nicer one he's referring to the devastator guitar right uh we're making a guitar called a rand what we're making a guitar called a rand guitar it's an excellent piece of equipment it's just the thing is we don't have the time or money to invest to get it off the ground otherwise i think we could make a real shitload of money with them so i guess maybe the rand guitar is the idea of what the devastator and the annihilator guitars were where the guitar itself if you look at jerry both jerry really doyle's but you look at jerry and doyle's guitar this is the whole guitar right this is the if you're strumming down here and this is like the fretboard and then all the little bat winged you know sharp points all that stuff is just accoutrement the, the working instrument is just a solid bar and then they put graphite it's all made out of graphite so it's super lightweight and uh, super customized. And maybe that's what he means by the Rand guitar. If anybody knows more about that, please speak up uh, so we can talk more about that. Because I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, by the time the Misfits started to tour and gained some national recognition in 1982, 1983, punk had given way to hardcore. So here you go. There's the change, people. Uh, it was a scene the band never fit into. Was it though? Is it really the scene that the band never fit into? I would say quite the opposite. They adapted very well. Even if the music suffered for it, you know, everybody embraced Earth AD. I would say, if anything, they were like they were like the fucking the the, the plow point, plowing the way for everything else with Earth AD. Man, I, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that that uh, that that sentiment. Um, the Misfits were punks in the more traditional sense. They refused to play by the rules. To them, anarchy didn't mean some kind of utopian political manifesto. It meant chaos, disorder, and a no-holds-barred fun. When a thousand bands yelled tuneless rants about Reagan, for the misfits, it was horror business, as usual. Yeah, okay, I, I, yeah, their music had no political agenda. At, to some extent, okay, did, did the misfits' music have any political agenda? Uh, no face value and you know i spoke to rocky about this i'm asking rocky what is this song about it and rocky jerry and doyle's brothers just like the songs are literally what they are at face value i turn into a martian is about turning into a martian uh you know like that sort of thing astro zombies is about astro zombies um but glenn was the one who wrote those songs and glenn was influenced by bukowski and there's definitely a lot th there's definitely deeper underlying stuff i mean it's not um what's going on kenny um it's not so i don't think it's so cut and dry as the misfits were non-political i hate that shit if you're creating art there is some sort of statement you are making and a statement that you are making is a political statement it doesn't mean like politics in the sense of like i think taxes should be higher or lower it means it simply just means like you know you're making a statement about something in the case of i turned into a martian is about like is the politics about being fucking different about being from another planet which you know if you really wanted to plug that into something being an illegal alien from an, another country is that what glenn is writing about no definitely not but i just think on some level all art has something innately political about it even if it's about even if it's a song like you know like, um, you know, uh, I don't know, e even if it's a song about fucking, you know, or about having sex, like there's something that that, that could, you know, that, that there, maybe there's like sex politics in it. I don't know. Uh, Peter brings up a good point here. He says, I don't think they were picking sides in politics. I, I just want to clarify, Peter, I agree with you. I'm not that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that they're picking sides in politics. I'm just saying that when you are an artist, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're 
whether you're um, writing songs, whether you're you're painting a picture, whether you're shooting a film, whatever it is that you're doing has some sort of message behind it, whether you agree with it or not. You might do it thinking it's nothing. Maybe you're an abstract artist who's just drawing scribbles for the sake of drawing scribbles, but somebody is going to, you know, look at your art, pull a message out of it. Like someone looks at all the scribbles and goes, life is chaos. That's the message. And that's politics on some level. So I'm not talking, saying like, oh, like liberal versus conservative politics. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there is, that there are, there are messages. And, you know, you could say, well, when I created this art, I had no meaning behind what I was saying. I have no, I have no meaning behind what I'm saying at all. Fine. But, you know, the reception of art, it's a two-way street. You can create the art, put the art out in the world, but then you have an audience that's taking in the art. Now you might walk down the street and go, oh, I turned into a Martian is about like, you know, Martians. Yeah. Martians from Mars. But me, I go, wow. Like, you know, all my life when I was growing up, this is a true story, folks, true story. When I was a little kid, I was called the, the boy from Mars. Right. And they used to call me Gonzo. Cause I got a schnozola and maybe cause my face is fatter. It doesn't look so, so big. But when I was younger and skinnier, I had a big fucking schnozola. It really stuck out. And people call me Gonzo. Gonzo turned out to be from another planet. So, you know, hearing the song, like I turned into a Martian is incredibly political for me, but it's not political in the sense of like, you know, it's not, it's not fucking like presidential politics. It's the politics of being, a teenager it's the politics of being on the outside of things you know um so in that way all stuff is political even if there is no you know um political agenda on the forefront like it says in this paragraph uh peter says i agree with you i think glenn would use horror movie titles but the songs have deeper meaning you know you know you know who's a great band that does that too um blitzkid blitzkid does that as well blitzkid is really, really good about writing songs about monsters or writing about human emotions and using monsters to do it. They're, they're fucking King. And they're really, that, that's not original on their part. They're just, they're just doing what has been done from the fucking very beginning of time since movies were a medium, you know, all monster movies are really just allegories for the horrors of being a human being. You know, I'm ugly and I'm unlovable. And how could anybody love me? Look at beauty and the beast, man. You know, I mean, it's just, it goes, it just goes, it, it goes all the way fucking back. Um, Peter says he wouldn't sugarcoat it with the titles. Yeah. Or he would sugarcoat it. Yeah. Sugarcoat it, you know, veil it, whatever you want to call it. There, there are, there are underlying po socio-political messages in all forms of art, even the misfits even if it's not like politics in the way you think of uh, politics, especially punk politics, which I think is what is being expressed in this writing right now. Um, I, I would love to hear how is Ghoul's Night Out a good example of uh, sugarcoating the, the title about a bunch of ghouls eating meat. What is your interpretation of that song? I have an interpretation of that song, but I'd like to hear your interpretation of that song. But I'm going to move on right now because... We've, I still want to make sure I get through this. Uh, I got I got a hard out at nine o'clock. So let's let's keep going. We're going to keep fucking moving on. Um, while a thousand bands yelled tuneless rants about Reagan for the misfits, it was horror business. And as usual, their music had no political agenda. They were about pure, unbridled energy, dangerous and fun entertainment. If sometimes fantasy and reality blurred and it all spills over into real blood and violence, hey, that was just too bad. One incident in particular did much to alienate the band from the hardcore scene. Okay, now we're going to hear, once again, this is exciting. Once again, we're going to hear about the San Francisco incident, but from Jerry Only's perspective in 1993. Let's take a look. Mike Stacks, going back to your guys, uh, uh, going back to you guys on tour, there were a couple of incidents that are now legendary, it, and this is again pre-internet legendary. That this 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 tale has circulated without computers. Okay, um, the one that everyone still talks about is the gig in San Francisco at the Elite Club. Now, what happened there? Now, mind you, 
I, I don't know. We've not really, I've heard Rocky talk about this in my interviews for this documentary. We've heard Glenn talk about this in the Pusshead uh, tapes. We've also heard um, someone who was there that night, who was a promoter, uh, his point of view. What's going on, Rue? How are you? We heard his point of view, and now we're going to hear Jerry's point of view. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, basically, justice was served. I hate to say it. We had gone to the show, and we had to fly all the way out to San Francisco just to do this one show, okay? We were down in L.A., we flew to L.A., and then we drove up to Frisco to make the show. There were 10 bands on the bill, and every band that gets up there is getting full cans of beer thrown at them, and they're getting beat up, and they're just letting it happen. And, okay, so this is what Glenn was talking about, how there was no security. Glenn claims there's no security at the show, uh, which is great. There's no buffer between the audience and the band. This is also kind of what happened to Randy from Lamb of God, right? There was a kid who jumped on stage who ended up dying, and Randy had a manslaughter charge placed upon him. And uh, there was some sort of culpability from also from the, the bouncers in the sense that the bouncers are there to run interference. You need bouncers. And by the way, I am not excusing anybody or anything. I, I am I am so there. I have no horse in this race. I'm not here to defend or prosecute. I'm just simply commenting as a complete outsider, 35 years removed from the situation. Right. Um, but their security in their defense. Well, <laughs> I just said it in their defense. What a fucking hypocrite. Um, from their point of view, there is the ve a venue should have some sort of security to prevent people from getting up on the stage and, you know, fucking shit up with the band in some way, shape or form. Or if someone's throwing fucking stuff onto the stage, you know, that the, the bouncer needs to run interference and remove it so that the performance can continue. Right. Uh, so there were 10 bands on the bill and every band that gets up, there's getting full cans of beer thrown at them and they're getting beat up and they're just letting it happen. And they're trying to smile and shrug it off. So I'm all pumped up. So Jerry previously is telling us how he gets pumped up for shows and he's probably pumped up in other ways. If you know what I mean? Again, I'm not insinuating anything just from what I've heard. Jerry had the ability to pump himself up in, 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 in more than one kind of way. Um, but you know, the probably the same adrenaline from, you know, like I said, you know, going out there, playing the game, playing the football game. <laughs> Kenny Morgan says, reminds me of evil live when Glenn says one more time, motherfucker, one more time, motherfucker, you die. Uh, I believe someone was throwing things at him. Yeah, man. I mean, that's what happens when you're in this sort of scene. Look at the channel club footage where there are kids just piling on top of Glenn and Glenn is still somehow holding onto that mic for dear life as he's fucking singing his heart out. Like what the fuck, man, that is tough. All right. Sorry. So anyway, um, so I'm all pumped up. This is Jerry. So I'm all pumped up and I'm watching from the balcony and I turned to the guys and I said, listen, I don't know about you guys. I says, but the first motherfucker who hits me with a can of beer is going to wear me for a fucking coat. Ha ha ha. Know what I mean? L take that weight. This is crazy. Jerry only <laughs> Listen, I don't know about you guys, I says. But the first motherfucker who hits me with a can of beer is going to be wearing me for a coat. Meaning Jerry is going to be right on top of him. You know what I mean? Because I didn't come all that way to get abused. So, okay, it starts winding down. That's that okay thing that they do. So, okay, it starts winding down. So we go on. So we're playing and there's no mention of the language. You know, apparently the the, uh, the F word, you know, uh, derogatory word for gay people is uttered. The, the term gay is uttered a bunch of times from other sources. Uh, if we're painting, trying to paint an objective, fair picture. So there is some antagonizing because I was part of the, the misfits persona and stage character, but there's not one mention of that from Jerry in 1993. So we're playing and we're playing four songs. We're banging them out. And then the kids start acting up, you know? So then there's this one kid in front of Doyle and he's throwing full cans of beers at Doyle's head as hard as he can, just out of reach. He can't grab them. So that's what Jerry, I think that's what Rocky was saying about the, corralling Rocky mentioned that he was trying to corral him with his guitar he's trying to reach this kid that's antagonizing him um so i'm watching this kid out of the corner of my eye and i keep saying to myself as soon as this set is done as soon as it's done i'm not gonna throw my guitar against the wall i'm gonna 
<laughs> I'm gonna jump out. I'm gonna hold on. Let me let me switch this over. <laughs> I'm gonna jump out of it and jump, and I'm gonna jump out of it and jump and grab this motherfucker and kick his ass. That was what was on my mind. And as I'm thinking that, Googie jumps right over the drum kit, right out into the crowd in one leap and punches this kid in the face because this kid was just trying to hurt somebody, you know, and then fucking Jersey represent, Jersey represent. So he punches the kid in the face and the kid goes flying back into the soundboard. So Googie goes chasing him and we're still playing, you know? Well, what happens is this really big guy grabs Googie and Googie can't get free. So my brother was running uh, the sound. So that's Rocky, right? Rocky is running the sound. Um, and uh, he, he went to help uh, Googie. Um, my brother was running the sound. Uh, there's a brother between me and Doyle. So he goes running over and smashes the guy in the side of the head, you know, and he lets Googie go. And then my brother takes over because he said the guy was like a monster. So I guess Rocky took over for Googie. So Googie starts running and the guy couldn't catch him. So Googie gets free and he grabs this kid, the kid again, because he was really pissed off because he's watching this kid too. And he hits him in the face and the kid comes flying from the soundboard back into the stage. As soon as he hits the stage, Doyle smacks him on the head with his guitar. Ha 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 ha. And the kid, oh, there was blood everywhere. His guitar got fucked up and the whole thing, you know, and the whole place went quiet when the kid, when they heard the kid get kicked in the head because everybody was like grabbing each other. Okay. So hold on. Let's pause for a second. Let's, let's pause this real quick. So the, another account that I've read on here on the, on the podcast, on this, whatever, this Facebook Eve Live show says that Doyle hit the wrong kid. Doyle hit a 14 year old boy that had nothing to do with anything. He was just standing by the side of the stage, wrong moment at the wrong time. And apparently this kid, the legend goes that two years later, he's hanging out at school and he pulls <laughs> such bullshit. It's not real pulls a, a two inch piece of wood, a splinter out of his skull. But apparently that kid, that kid had not, that kid was just not, that kid is not the same kid. So maybe in the chaos, Jerry is, is targeting or thinking that it's the same kid that got hit deservingly when really it was a different kid who had nothing to do with anything, who was just there at the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know. But it's interesting. This is this to me is the is the best part about reading these interviews and reading about the same story over and over again because the events are so different. It's not the same story. It's a different story. Um. So Googie's chasing. Well, what happens is this really big guy grabs Googie and Googie can't get free. So my brother was running. Blah 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 blah. Um. So he starts running. The guy couldn't catch him. So Googie gets free and he grabs the kid again because he was really pissed off. So. Uh, uh, cause he was wearing, uh, cause he was watching this kid too. And he hits him in the face and the kid comes flying from the soundboard back to the stage. As soon as he hits the stage, Joel smacks him in the head with his guitar. And that kid, Oh, the blood was everywhere. His guitar got fucked up. Uh, and the whole thing, you know, and then the whole place went quiet when they heard the kid get kicked in the head. Cause everybody was like grabbing each other and pulling and shoving. Uh, and we're looking around once this kid got hit, everybody shut up and we're looking at the kid going, holy shit, everybody, the crowd, and us, everybody was just standing there with their mouth open because it just got out of control. And then the next thing, this big, I'm just using, uh, Jer I'm just using, Jer I'm not going to, all right, I will, uh, in an effort not to offend. All right, just for the sake of, I don't know, is this like, can you say this shit? Like, you don't know what the fuck you can can and can't say anymore in the world, like without fucking offending people. And then this the next thing, this big lesbian looking chick. Let's just say that this big le butch lesbian looking chick um, goes imitates in a screeching voice. You killed him. Ha 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 ha. Much laughter. And the whole place broke out into a fucking mad riot at that point. Now, I remember Rocky telling me about this big girl, this very, very big girl who got who got kicked in the face by somebody who, yeah, somebody kicked her in the face from the stage. Um, I mean, God, could you imagine if fucking Doyle had killed this kid? Like, he so could have fucking killed him. It could have fucking happened. 
Um, from my understanding, Doyle was terribly upset by the whole situation. No matter what you hear that that guy was upset. I don't actually know, but that's what I've heard. Mike Stacks. So how did you get out of there alive? Jerry only. Well, the thing was that we had no problem walking off the stage. It was just senseless, you know? There was actually like a thousand of them and four of us. So, I mean, it would have been a hell of a time. If they really would have understood the odds, they wouldn't have hesitated. You know what I mean? They could have easily got us, but we just stood them off. And then we went back up to the dressing room, which was, uh, which in the elite club is up on the balcony. And there's the stairway. And you can only fit one person at a time up the stairs. So I said, well, look, if they come up one at a time, we'll throw them down on the floor. Ha, 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 laughter. They can only come up at us one at a time. And between the four of us, we'll just pick that person up and throw them off the balcony onto the floor. So they're basically like staging, like it's like 300. The Greeks are holding off the Persians 300 style at the, at the hot gates uh, in San Francisco. It was fucked up. It just got out of hand. But those these details, you don't hear any other account of this story with those details. That's why you interview everybody. That's why all the guys that are not like Glenn, Jerry, and Doyle, that's why you want to hear their versions of the stories. That is what I'm hoping, to some extent, we'll, we'll see a little bit of in They Came From Lodi, the documentary. You know, that's the idea. A little bit. Um. That's crazy. So they're just like going to hope that they're going to come up one by one because that's all they can climb up the ladder. And at that, you know, at, w when you have the hot gates, you know, uh, numbers don't matter anymore when you when you have the hot gates to defend. Uh, so those are the hot gates for, for those guys. And then the way that story ends, apparently, is that the misfits go to a college or a radio station campus or something and they steal a bunch of skulls and they spray paint San Francisco is for a bunch of F words and leave. Which to me, I thought hilarious, not using the, the, the slur against gay people, but just the, <laughs> the idea that the misfits would break in somewhere, steal skulls, get a can of spray paint and then spray paint that as if they were doing battle with the whole, you know, town of San Francisco. I don't know. It's pretty fucking funny. Mike Stack. So you guys never played San Francisco again? Jerry only. No, we never went back. Glenn would go back with Sam Hain and, and sort of nullify with some of the guys that were at that Frisco show. Mike Stacks. I read somewhere that you were arrested for grave robbing in New Orleans. Jerry only. You're pretty well informed. What happened was, all right, so now we're going to the, these are like the, the big, the big incidents uh, with uh, the misfits. And they're, they're just great fucking stories. Jerry only. You're pretty well informed. Mike Stacks, I read somewhere that you were all arrested for grave robbing in New Orleans. Jerry only. You're pretty well informed. What happened was we played for this guy. He was a mercenary. He was booking stuff in San Francisco, and then he moved down to New Orleans. He called us up and he said, hey, guys, I'm booking this new club. It was called uh, Tupelo's, and I believe it's still there. I believe. He said, listen, I'm trying to get some big bands here, but it's kind of a small place. You guys could pack it. Why don't you stop in? I says, all right, what the hell? Whatever we can do to help you out with your new job you got it so we went down there to play and we did uh dot 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 there's there they are with the big shark that's at universal studios the big jaws shark there's the band look at googie sticking out like a sore thumb with his blonde hair you know um just always always a misfit amongst the misfits themselves but I mean, there you go. That, that's the class. I would say this is really the classic lineup, right? This is the classic lineup for two years. The Walk Among Us lineup, the, 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 the iconic lineup of this band with Twins of Evil. You got the, the Iceman and the, the, the torn up Rickenbacker. Glenn's wearing his crossbone shirt. I mean, this is the iconic band that is the Misfits. It was a pretty cool gig. It was a cool show. And they said, hey, down here, they bury everybody outside in these mausoleums. So why don't we why don't we go and take a look? We'll show you what uh, sorry uh, we'll show you what the graveyards look like. We said, all right, cool, let's go. The one thing was this guy had a Harley Davidson, and what we didn't know is that we drove into the worst section of the United States. There's a murder there every two minutes or some shit like this. So we pull into this place, and it's surrounded by projects, you know, like apartment buildings. And there were these two graveyards, maybe the size of a football field, 100 yards by 100 yards square. So there's two of them. And there's this big, long alleyway, like a straight road that goes right down the middle and connects the projects with the train station and the main street. So we park in the middle of this thing with this guy with the bike when we're 
in there, we get surrounded by cops, okay? Like the whole place. The cops are going with the searchlights and everybody's ducking, trying to stay away and shit. Robo was in, I don't think Robo even entered the cemetery. He was in a van humping some girl, as far as I understand. Mike from I Hate God, who's supposed to do an interview with me. I even was there at St. Vitus and we didn't get a chance to do the fucking interview. It was really, God, someday I got to get that guy. He was there for that. He was a teenager at the time. Uh, Mike from I Hate God. Uh, there were a bunch of people there. The Necros were there, um, except for Todd Swallow, who was staying. He was crashing with some chick. Um, so, <laughs> so the thing was, I didn't see any harm in it, you know? Hey, look, we're fucking checking out the graveyard. What the fuck? Um, that's what Jerry's saying. Let's just say that there were some more nefarious plans for that graveyard. Maybe Jerry wasn't aware of them at the time. What the fuck? You want us to leave? We'll leave. You know what I mean? So I hop over the wall and I go and take a look out to our friendly officers, you know, and bang, they got me up against the wall. Spread your legs, lean on the wall, the whole deal. By the time they got the whole band, a couple of them got away. They ended up bailing us out and shit. But what wound up happening was the cops had a field day and they had a bunch of fucking northern boys down here. They got them caught in a bad spot. Mike Stacks. Well, that probably took one look at you guys. Mike Stacks, well, they probably took one look at you guys in the graveyard. Jerry only, yeah, we kind of threw him too. We explained, hey, look, we're in a band. Our buddies wanted to take us around. What are you guys doing out here? Drinking and doing this? Oh, yeah, we had two six packs of beers with us. I mean, we, were, we weren't out there making a, uh, a mess, but they didn't buy it. Uh, Raymond says, Mike from I Hate God has mentioned being there before. I'd love to hear him elaborate on it. There, he did an interview for some New Orleans punk talk where he actually talks about the story in full. Uh, so it is out there, Raymond. You got to find it. Um, Mike Stacks, did they press any charges? Jerry only. Well, the thing was, we bailed ourselves out. We were supposed to appear in court the next day. And the problem was, when we got out, we had a show that night in Hallandale Beach, Florida. And the club was right on the beach. And they gave us a free room in a hotel. So if you think about it, what are you going to do? Are you going to play a club on the beach in Florida? Or are you going to wait for court the next day? What are you going to do? Mike Stacks, well, you're going to play, right? Jerry only, you're damn right. Ha, 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 ha. So we blew town. I love that they just left. They they had to, they were due for court, and they had to drive all the way back down there at a later date. Now, he doesn't mention the bail story at all. Rocky had all the money. Rocky also didn't get caught. So he had to go down and bail them all out. And they played a joke on Robo where Robo thought he, they didn't have enough bail money. And they said, sorry, Robo, you got to stay in, you got to stay in jail overnight. Um, Mike stacks, you made a video for brain eaters and another song, right? Jerry only here we go. He's talking about it here, man. Wow. You never hear talk about this. We were working on one for skulls and it never came out. We had done some tapes. We were doing some effects with skulls blowing blood out of them and crap, but it never gelled anyway. Wow. So the, so the, so, so, okay. So we have a bunch of music videos from the misfits. This is, this is all of them. Ready? You have the night of the living dead video that was shot by Corey Rusk in 1980, 81. It had to be 1981 um, with members of, I forget which band being zombies and the misfits are pushing over tombstones in a graveyard. It's on umatic tape. Then you have the brain eaters video, which everybody knows and has seen a billion times. And that was done up in Boston. And we heard in that 83 interview, they're talking about the day after they filmed that video and then this is unbeknownst to me. I didn't know any details about the skulls video. Uh, I guess the skulls video is literally this. We were working on one for skulls, but it never came out. We had done some tapes. We were doing some effects uh, with skulls, blowing, they're shooting blood out of skulls, but it never gelled. Mike Stacks, what's the story behind the Brain Eaters one? Jerry only, well, the Brain Eaters song was sort of like a horror chant song. And what happened was we went up to Boston. A buddy of ours had a restaurant, actually a very famous restaurant, and they were renovating the third floor, and they allowed us to go in there and set up all these tables. They gave us all this china and these glasses and beer and whatever we wanted for the video, and they shot the video for it. All the bands from Boston came down and sat around, and anybody who was anybody wound up getting in the video. Uh, it was just good, clean fun. <laughs> Mike Stacks, what did you use for the brains? Jerry only, er, brains. Ha 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 ha. Mike Stacks, cow brains or something? Jerry only, yeah. 
Mike Stacks, what brains, uh, pff, what bands were sitting around the table with you? Um, that Jerry only says that I'm not even sure. I believe it was gangrene SSD control. We heard in that other video in that other thing. <laughs> Pete says, um, that sounds awesome. Blood shooting out of skulls. I would have loved to. I want your skull. I need your skull. Um, Gordon asks, "Are uh, these are back porch videos? They're not. However, there was a video for skulls that was done, but it was using footage from Greystone Hall uh, on 1983, the very last show uh, that they used, which at the time." Oh shit. Yikes, that just came off. My pinky toenail just ripped off. Like like Glenn Danzig's tooth in the Danzig Legacy sort of. Hey, my tooth just came out. Um Raymond says, Do you know the cemetery they filmed the Night of Living Dead video in? I'm from Ohio and love to go there. I'm from Cleveland. Raymond, I don't know the precise cemetery. I, Todd Swalla would know that answer. I do know it was shot on Umatic tape, which was an early form of like VHS tape. The tape apparently still exists. It's in Corey Rusk's possession. Um, they did use images, still images from the video uh, for show flyers. So if you look carefully enough online, you might find the flyer. Somebody probably has it. Someone knows where it is. Somebody put it in, put it in the thing. And th there's my favorite lesbian of all, Rich. Blow me a kiss. Uh, hope you're well, Rich. Um, I'm not even sure. I never used to get too buddy-buddy with anybody. He's referring to the bands in the Brain Eaters video. Mike Stacks, what other bands were you friends with? Jerry Only. We were friends with the Necros out of Detroit. We were friends with Black Flag in California, Crow Mags out of New York. Basically, anyone who was playing along the same lines as we were, I don't think the Chroma, I mean, I guess the Chromags had formed in 84, right? I'm not too brushed up. You know, it's funny. I was just talking with Paris Mayhew from the Chromags on my other show, Pizza Punk, which is due out very soon. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. I forgot to ask him what year that was that the Chromags formed, but the Misfits were very friendly with Harley Flanagan. Maybe that's what Jerry is referring to. Harley Flanagan was asked to do the drums on Earth AD and turned it down because he was so involved with the Cro-Mags, I guess. So maybe 83 was when the uh, was when the Cro-Mags first started. Uh, Mike Stacks, when Glenn wrote songs, how did he present them to you at practices? Here we go. So this is so here is where we're probably going to get um, this is where Jerry is going to talk about, you know, his input in what he did in in the band. Right. Like what? what he did and didn't write, which is from the beginning, the, the very first uh, part one of, of this series, uh, we were debating on, on what he would say. So here it is, Jerry Only, um, or Mike Stacks. When Glenn wrote songs, how did he present them to your practices? Jerry Only. he just bring him down and go, er, let's go from here to here. Mike Stacks, did he get out a guitar and do that? Jerry Only. no, uh, not really. Mike Stacks, he just tell you the chords? Jerry Only. Yeah, E, A, and whatever we would come up with in the cuts and the arrangements and stuff like that. That's why, to an extent, it kind of bugs me that we never got any credit for anything. Half of the great cuts and drum cuts were me and Doyle and the drummer working those, thing, uh, working those things down. But such is life. What are you going to do? Ha, ha, ha. Uh, so there, there you have it. I mean, he doesn't really seem to make a big deal about it. I, get, I don't know, man. I, I, we, we've been over this. I don't really know where I... I stand on that. I still think that Glenn Danzig is the singer songwriter of these songs, but I think it's wrong to, to say that th those guys helped him flesh some of that stuff out. He did in some, on some level in some way, shape or form, but does that qualify as songwriting credit? That's the ultimate question. Does this qualify as songwriting credit? Yes or no. I don't know. Um, Mike Stacks, tell us a bit about the Fiend Club. People would send you weird shit like skulls and stuff. What was the weirdest thing you got? Jerry only. Tesco V from the Meat Men. Tesco was a huge Misfits fan. He was a big friend. He was very good friends with Glenn for, for a spell. And uh, the Meat Men were one of the touch and go bands from the Midwest, along with like the Necros and Saccharine Trust and, and things like this. 
Tesco V from the meat men sent me a dead tarantula and man, did it stink. Ha ha ha. I just remember it. Not because it was the most vulgar thing I got. It just smelled so bad. Who knew tarantulas stunk like that? We were afraid to open the box. Something's fucking dead in there. What is that? So we opened the box and we were all expecting to find something really fucked up. And it was Tesco spider. His spider had died. At the time, we had this place called the pit. In the pit, you've heard of the pit demos. And the pit demos are not really demos. What they are, this kid at the time, is he was a kid. His name was Dave Scott. Dave Scott is from a band called Adrenaline OD from New Jersey, um, who used to play shows with the Misfits and were big Misfit fans and went down to the pit. The pit was at the Kayafa residence in Lodi, New Jersey on Grove street where the misfits would rehearse. And so Dave, uh, Dave brought his tape, reco- uh, tapes, uh, tape recorder to the pit and recorded a practice. And in this recording, you hear them working out queen wasp, mommy. Can I go out and kill tonight? Just a bunch of songs, right? A bunch of, uh, later, later misfit songs. And so when they're, when they're doing, uh, when they're recording the tape, the uh, when they're recording the show, that would become not Evil Live. No, I'm wrong about that. It's not Evil Live. So the Mommy Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight that's on Walk Among Us is a live version. It's not the studio version. Whatever live show that was, kid in the audience, Dave, I believe it was either Dave or maybe it was Bruce Win- Wingate. Well, I, uh, I wish one of them was here to clarify that for me. One of them was familiar with the song from this pit tape that got, you know, circulated as the pit demos. It's not demos. It's just a rehearsal. It's the misfits rehearsing and flushing out the songs. And you can hear Glenn going over there. Do they do die, die, my darling. They do a bunch of songs. They were just kids in the neighborhood who had brought a, a, a tape recorder. You know why? Cause I think they were interviewing, they were interviewing them for some sort of fanzine or, New student newspaper or something. Maybe that's what it was. And that's how the, the pit demo. So, so that's what Jerry's referring to when he says the pit. The pit was a uh, the, their practice space. And it was a pool house, I believe, at one time. And that's the pool house with the, the riser. They built a riser in the pool house. And you see a lot of static age photos of them posing in, in the pit. Um, at the time, we had this place called the pit. The pit was in my base. Okay, so it was in the basement, not, not in the pool house, whatever. And they had the giant cave stalactites hanging down that they had cut out of foam. It was in my basement in Lodi. We took all these shag rugs in, in black and red. And then I made like a black, a, a bat wing platform with bars in it, cement walls. I had like this dungeon room in the back. I took the whole, the whole downstairs of this two family house and made it this real plush dungeon thing. And then what I did for the shelves, I took pieces of four by eight plywood. And I would cut long bends in it. So you would put four of them in a row and it would come together as points. And I chained them to the beams and the ceiling. So the shelves were four foot wide and they just stuck out in points. It was like bat wings all around the corners. We had all our toys and robots on, uh, out, up there and shit. It was great. Just like a, they created a layer in the pit. So I'm sorry. The pit was not the pool house. That was a, a different a different scenario. Mike Stacks, where's all that stuff now? Jerry only. Well, I still got all that stuff, but that room has been busted up. We sold the house and we moved up here to Vernon, New Jersey. We live in the country now, which is cool. Instead of having one house, we got four or five. I've been to this place. So I've been to the neighborhood where Jerry and Doyle both live. Um, I went to a certain someone's house who lives in one of those four or five houses. And um, did some interviews. That's where I interviewed Rocky and some other people. Um, I never knew which one was Doyle's house. And I never knew which one was Jerry's house. But I was there in that neighborhood. And it makes me realize that had I come out at the right time with my equipment, that I might have seen those guys had they been there at the time when I was recording my interview. However, you know, I mean, Rocky was there. So who's not to say that the other guys weren't around? Um. Marty says, Marty, Marty, Mar, Mar, <laughs> Marty, Mar, Mar, Mar says, Jerry once told me he wrote the intro to Astro Zombies. Interesting. Andrew Taylor. I've been wanting to get a bottle since I lost my previous one during a breakup. That stuff is great on everything. I am assuming you're talking about the hot sauce. Hot. Hey, you know what they say? The sauce is the boss. 
Um, so that's interesting. Well, I still got all that stuff, but blah, blah, blah. we got four. So instead of having one house, we got four or five. So they sold the house. They bought four or five up in Vernon. I got my own place. My mom's got her own place. My grandmother's got her own place. We used to live together before I was married and shit. Me and Doyle used to hang out downstairs. My mom and my other brother had the middle. And then my grandmother was upstairs. But now everybody's got their own place and it's cool. Wow. That's interesting. And it doesn't mention his dad. Before I was married and shit, me and Doyle used to hang out downstairs. So that was their bedroom. My mom and my other brother, Rocky, they had the middle. And then my grandmother was upstairs. But now everyone's got their own place and it's cool. And we got our own factory. That's the that's Pro Edge. And that's cool. And that's where Jerry, both Jerry and Doyle rehearse for a few years. It was just gorgeous Frankenstein rehearsed there. And then Jerry's Misfits rehearsed there, you know, back and forth like that sort of thing. Uh, I really don't mind too much that I don't got have all the fucking money, but you know, that's money. You can't, uh, you can't wipe your ass with it and you can't eat it. Huh? I don't regret what I had to do. It's just a shame. The greatness doesn't exist. I really don't mind too much that I don't have all the fucking money, but you know, that's money. You can't wipe your ass with it and you can't eat it. Okay. In 1983, Googie left the band and was replaced by Robo from Black Flag. Mike Stacks, why did Googie leave the band? Okay, this is great because we just did a whole video about why Googie left the band. And I mentioned that I had spoken, and I have. I've spoken to Googie. I've heard Googie's point of view as to why he left the band. Go watch that video on my YouTube channel if you want to hear what Googie had to say, sort of. Um, Here's what Jerry only has to say. And I have no idea what he's about to say. This is a surprise to me. This is going to be so much fun to read. I've never heard Jerry's point of view on Googie leaving the band. Jerry only. Well, Mike Sachs, why did Googie leave the band? Jerry only. Well, Googie and Glenn didn't get along, okay? The reason being that one, Googie wanted to get paid. Ha ha ha. You see, Googie and Glenn would fist fight over things. We were out in California one time, right? And there, and things were getting suckful. I love how to use the word suckful. It was getting really bad and shit. There was no money. The gig sucked. We didn't get the money we were supposed to make. I borrowed three grand to put on that tour for my old man. And I was going back with nothing. Basically, the tour fucking flopped. And Googie wanted two cheese. Here's the famous cheeseburgers incident. From Jerry only, the cheeseburger incident. Um, And Googie wanted two cheeseburgers instead of one, you know? The thing was, him and Glenn had a fist fight. Me and Doyle said, hey. We didn't get any money we were supposed to make. I borrowed three grand to put on the tour for my old man, and I was going back with nothing. Basically, the tour fucking flopped, and Googie wanted two cheeseburgers instead of one, you know? The thing was, him and Glenn had a fist fight. Me and Doyle said, hey, you two guys better just sit down. This sucks enough. You guys are fighting over cheeseburgers. I got to go back and tell my old man I blew three grand. It's one thing for you guys to fucking argue over a 59-cent McDonald's fucking cheeseburger, I said. We've been living on my old man's credit card out here and we're and we're up to about three grand and we got nothing to show for it, you know? So Googie and Glenn had an argu- uh, had an argument at that time and pretty much Googie told him to kiss off. I don't blame him a bit. If Doyle wasn't in the band at that point, I probably would have packed it up too, you know? The most important thing uh, is that it's fun. If you're having fun, everybody can feel it. And that's what makes you believable is that it's true. Ha, 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 ha. It's not like it's the same show. If you go to see Van Halen, it's the same joke night after night. Every show we did was something else. Some other bullshit would come down. The thing is, on a daily basis, you just got to handle your problems a day at a time. And that's it. You get uh, you kick it. You kick their ass. You kick their ass and fuck it. You're on your way. So that was one of the problems in the end. When it was really time to break up, it just sucked to go play at that point. I knew it was senseless. That was there was nothing left because in the end, Robo came to play in our band and then we started doing the thrash shit. Robo was in the band. And when Robo left, we had only learned five new songs, I think, for Earth AD. You know, we were just doing the thrash shit and it was kind of disheartening. You know, it's fine for a bunch of skinheads that come to the show. But if I don't like playing it and Doyle don't like playing it and it's really not the right direction for the band, why pursue it? All right, doing an Earth AD album. But let's get back on track. Meaning, like, let's go off in this direction. Let's explore it. And then we'll get back on track. 
that's where I was kind of surprised to hear Glenn's new stuff because it's not thrashy at all. Now you hear him. Oh, they're playing 50 million miles an hour. Yeah, you fucking dragged us that way, you know? You want us to play this thrash shit. How do you play this thrash shit slow? Ha 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 ha. So that really morphed into a whole nother answer. But that's the cheeseburger incident. That is not why Googie claims that he left the band. Go listen to that other video to hear why Googie's side of the story. It is interesting to hear Jerry tell his version of that. He thinks it's the cheeseburgers. If you were, um, if you followed Misfit Central for years, they, they used to have compilations because everybody on the board had a band. And one of the compilations was called You Can't Have Two Cheeseburgers. And it was named specifically after this incident, which probably came from this mag fanzine, because I don't think magazine, because I don't think I've ever heard that story told anywhere else. It was about the, the two. This was then reported on Misfit Central in the timeline. That's how everybody knows knows about it but to get back to the earth ad stuff you know he's talking about oh they're playing you know getting resentful they're playing 50 mile 50 million miles an hour you know when glenn wrote that stuff first of all a lot of that stuff was supposed to be for sam hain right there was a bunch of it that was going to be for sam hain and some of it was supposed to be really slow and it's glenn who claims that they sped it up so who's so who's really to blame here was it Glenn who wanted them to speed up the Earth AD stuff? Or was it Jerry and Doyle listening to Van Halen and wanting to play faster as a result? Or was it the fact that they're playing with all these hardcore bands and playing just breakneck, watching these guys play breakneck speed and, and jumping in there? And then, you know, again, the music suffers. Whereas there's no there's no space for melody when Glenn sings. It's just all, I am the bees. You know, just super fucking, you know, just barking there there he's no longer vocal there he's not fucking singing he's a vocalist now you know he's not really singing the stuff as much as he's just fucking barking it barking it the earth ad album is something of a backbone of contention among misfits fans but while jerry's dismissal dismissal of it as thrash it may be a little harsh the consensus seems to be that it is their most disappointing release fuck dude that is such bullshit man you know whatever uh 37 years on that thing is like that's the bee's knees man it's the bee's fucking knees you just got to be in the right mood for earth ad there's nothing wrong with earth ad earth ad is phenomenal you just have to you know it's like selecting a wine from the basement oh i think i'd like some red wine as opposed to some white wine <laughs> uh marty marmar says I had a Doyle Found Club flyer back in 8990. I called the number on the flyer and asked the girl answering if we could talk to Mo the Great. I was put on hold, and soon after, Jerry actually picked up the line. That's awesome. I ended up taping some calls I made by putting another phone on the speaker. Uh, called him a few times, being a 15-year-old kid. Had friends around listening. Jerry was awesome to us kids. Marty, if you find the tapes of you talking to Jerry on the phone, I will motherfucking play those tapes on this show. I'm, I'm, I'm just straight up telling you right now, you fucking DM me on the They Came From Lodi page. I hate checking. I, I, I'm so bad with checking messages. I will fucking go look in my inbox now to, to go find that shit. Um, to clarify, the phone number was for the machine shop, and Jerry took the time out of his work to talk to us a few minutes. Yes, I believe I had heard that, actually, that it was the, the machine shop. That's the, back then. He was that accessible, man. You could just call that number and Jerry would just talk to you. Jerry loved talking to people. Um, back to the Earth AD album. The power and the violence of the music are intensified to a level where melody and song structure are smothered in a wall of overdriven guitar and feedback overdubs. I think that, it, wow, that is fucking, mwah, that is so good. I love the way he described it. The power and the violence of the music are, are intensified to a level where the melody and the song structure are smothered in a wall of overdriven guitar and feedback overdubs. I like that a lot. Oh my God, how much? Jesus fucking Christ. Are you fucking kidding me? There's still so much more to go. All right, well, let's fucking power through it, huh? Overall, the standard of Glenn's writing is well below par. Cuts like Wolf's Blood and Hellhound are relentlessly powerful but virtually hookless, while other stronger songs like Earth AD and Devil's Lock are almost lost in the oversaturated production. That's not to say that there aren't some amazing tracks. Queen Wasp is a furious, blasting, buzzing tour de force 
while death comes ripping wins with distinctive whoa 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 sing along backing vocals and a de- de- a de- a demoniacal a demoniacal arrangement Demon- demonical demonical where's the a a demonical arrangement of thunderous of thundering drums vicious guitar and a finale that seems trapped in hell's wor- whirlpool whirlpool most inspired of all though is the staggering green hell a ruthless exercise in- i love the way this guy writes i love the way this guy writes a ruthless <laughs> exercise in dynamics which drags you from high tension one chord guitar and bass chug to explosive blasts of rapid change switch and yell one of the most crushingly intense pieces of music ever committed to vinyl and their best on earth ad the misfits sound compelling and invincible at their worst just like noise hmm oh no i read that wrong let me take that again at their best on Earth AD, the misfits sound compelling and invincible. At their worst, they just sound like noise. Unlike other records, which hook you the first time, Earth AD takes some getting used to. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I have an idea. Guys, you are in luck. Or maybe you're not in luck. Maybe you don't give a shit. What I am going to do is do something that I've never done before. I am actually going to come back. Come back. Little Jeffrey and talk me to death. Um, Marty says, I have one or two tapes. My buddy still has one, but I stole a James Taylor tape and tried to tape over you, motherfucker. You taped over that shit with James Taylor, you son of a bitch. Marty, let's fucking do, dude. Let's, Marty, you digitize those motherfuckers. I will play that shit on the fucking air. And I will talk about it the way I'm talking about this interview. You fucking contact me, buddy. You contact me and I will fucking do that shit. I will do that in a fucking heartbeat. Kenny says, Earth AD is the fire under Cliff Burton's ass. That's right, man. Metallica was heavily, was massively influenced by Earth AD. Yes. Tony says, Jerry was a really cool guy when I met him after a show in Bogarts in the 90s. Uh, Doyle just went to the back. Uh, Jerry said Doyle just wasn't really into talking to the fans. You know what, man? Hey, how you doing, Nick? What's going on? Um, you know what, man? I, we, I mean, we say it every episode. Jerry, Jerry's not a fucking bad guy. He's not. I mean, don't I? I would say you know, Jerry is when it comes to business is 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 you know, he, he fucking strong arm you. But you know, he's a fucking good guy, dude. Who does you know? He's really fucking good to his fans. So here's the deal. Like I just said, for anybody who's just tuning in, I am literally going to be back at 10 o'clock. We're going to do part two of this episode. How about that? I'm going to duck out for an hour. I'm going to start a brand new broadcast. You're getting two episodes in the same day. We're going to finish this sucker and we're going to take our sweet ass time doing it. Sweet. Just just sweet. We're going to milk it. Going to milk it like milk of magnesia. Okay. So I'm going to come back. I will come back. Come back. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time, uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. (laughs) So right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee. But it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this 
endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. <laughs> the YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just wanna thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes, that's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents. Come on, Crabble. It's supper time. It's supper time. <laughs> Come on, crab on. Do -do -do. Come on, crab It's supper time. It's supper time. Yeah, sorry. I've been on a little shop of horrors kick lately. I told you I'd be back. I'm back. This is unprecedented, folks. The truth is, I just don't want to have this carry over into another week, even though really I, I could stretch it out. If I really wanted to stretch it out, I could stretch it out. But there's more important fish to fry. Tonight's uh, choice of seltzer is Dragon Whispers. Dragon Whispers by Polar. Yeah, baby. I love these little half pint cans. They're They're wonderful, but they're also incredibly frustrating because the flavors are great. They just don't. Oh, my God. I just spilled seltzer all over myself. They just don't last that long. Isn't it amazing what an hour makes? An hour ago, I was stumbling through my, oh, I can't read. And now, like, I'm, like, super, like, jacked up, hyped up, like I did a bunch of cocaine. Did not do any cocaine. As a matter of fact, I am a sober person. I am sober. I don't usually announce that. I am sober. I do not take drugs. People ask me all the time. They say, Jeff, what kind of drugs are you on? And you know what I say? I say, I don't take drugs. I am drugs. Salvador Dali. It's my favorite quote from Salvador Dali. But before we go there, we have to go to our sponsors. Like, Jeff, we already did this in the last episode. I was like, yeah, but we're doing two episodes. So I'm two bites of the apple, baby. Two bites of the apple. Oh, <laughs> I just lost two viewers because I popped this sucker open. Listen, you got to get your merch. This merch supports this channel i'm not asking you to buy me a cup of coffee anymore although that would be nice too all of those links are still available you can also rent a movie on vod um but if you want to support the creation of this content like a really great way to do that and represent is buying one of these fucking style and shirts you're like oh i don't like i don't like orange jeff how about a lime green Ooh, lime we got a lime green or is that a neon i can't tell if that's lime green or neon or maybe you like pink or maybe you like a dark blue. Whatever the case, we've got you covered with apparel, okay? We've got, what are these? These are die-cut stickers. Um, we've got a variety, a plethora, if you will, of long sleeve shirts. We've got hoodies, baby, hoodies. Do you have an Android phone? We've got tons of Android cases. Look at all the different Samsung cases we have. We have lots of them. We also have iPhone cases. You, Oh, man. You want to represent on an iPhone case? You can totally do that. What color do you ask? Tons of them. We got tons of colors. Would you like an eggshell green, seafoam green? You can do that. We can put this on a seafoam green. We can do a an Easter purple white, yeah, uh, purple, Easter purple pastel, if you will. Um, we can do uh, uh, another a seafoam green. I guess you'd call that seafoam green. Uh, so yeah, the, the options are, are, are endless. So here's a nice, beautiful, uh, female tank top of sorts. Although, 
you know, you don't need to limit to what you can and can't wear. Here's a salmon, a salmon tank top, if that's your deal. Okay. You're going, fuck, this guy won't shut up about his wares. Well, I have one more. I'm going to, I'm going to just one more. I'm going to shove down your throat. And we're going to move on here. Look, we can get the, you want to get that sour cream. You can get it with the yellow. You can get it in this. I guess this is neon. Wow. That, that is a weird choice. I don't know if I would go with for that guys. The options are there, but it doesn't mean you want to go for them. I think black is honestly the best one you want. You can get that again on your phone case. You can get a, a, a coffee cup. Um, when you make a purchase in the merch store, your credits get added to 1979. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. I'm uncle Jeff. Hey, it's me. Uncle Jeff. I'm uncle Jeff, you know, like uncle Glenn. Hey, um, so you can get a mug. Uh, and like I said, when you make a purchase, your, your name gets added to the executive producer credits for 1979, a year of horror punk, which is our deep dive into 1979 coming very, very, very soon. Um, okay. Enough of that stuff. We're done. We're done peddling our wares people. Okay. Where is the zine? Enough with the preamble, Jeff, pull up the zine. Okay. Here it is. We were talking about earth AD, I believe. Look at this photo of Doyle. First, let's look at this photo of Doyle real quick. Look at him. Look at him there. The blow dryer on his hair. I mean, that is like, that is like the most hardcore devil lock I think I've ever seen. Have you ever seen such a devlock? I think this is our thumbnail. Hold on. No, no, let's do it like that. Yeah. No, it didn't work. How was that for a how was that for a thumbnail? I don't know. Okay, that's a pretty good thumbnail. Got it. Uh, look at that devil lock, man. Look at this dude. Look at this, this specimen, man. Austin says, Uncle Jeff, can we now refer to Robbie Bloodshed as nephew Robbie? I don't understand your comment, Austin. Why would I do that? By the way, I did see, you know, I was going through back through your thing. You you posted about how Graves acknowledged that uh, uh, Chud has some Me Too stories. He said Ch uh, Michael Graves said he could name off 25 situations with Dr. Chud and the Me Too shit from whatever episode that was that you sent to me. Interesting, interesting. Um, I don't understand what you mean, though, about Nephew Robbie, Uncle Jeff, Uncle Glenn. You're not making any sense there, Austin. Um, but look at this devil lock, man. I mean, this thing is fucking glorious, man. Like, I want this thing in a museum. Like, I wish we could have freeze-dried Doyle's hair, shaved it off. He, his hair grows back, you know. I mean, that's like primo devil lock. That's that's before he started putting, like, the, the rubber tape on it or whatever. Whew, it's fucking crazy, crazy situation. All right. Back to the text. Overall, this we're in Earth AD right now, and uh, Jerry is, is – is, well, actually, this is like a – I don't know what this is. This is like a, a – an expose in between the Jerry Oli interview. This is like uh, an analysis by Mike Stacks, who's, who's doing the interview for Jerry. Overall, the standard of Glenn's writing is well below par. Cuts like Wolf Blood and Hell, Hellhound are relentlessly powerful, but virtually hookless, while other stronger songs like Earth AD and Devil Lock are almost lost in the oversaturated production. I don't really know. I don't, I think oversaturated production is the wrong, wrong thing to say here. It's not, there's nothing oversaturated about the production. The production is like, it's, it's live production. If anything, it's, it, they do it live in a room, you know? Um, and then uh, are they lost songs? No, man, it's not lost. It's just Glenn's Glenn's vocals are buried for one. Number two, Glenn doesn't have any room for melody. As we said, they're just, it's just, it's crazy. It's a crazy situation. Wolf's Blood is a song. I mean, again, I don't remember which of the songs that were written for Sam Hain. Does anybody remember? I don't remember which ones were, but you know, again, these songs are probably not, they're not written to be sung like misfit songs. That's why they're misfit Sam Hain songs, misfit songs written for Sam Hain. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it kind of makes sense that Wolf's Blood it would not be uh would not sound like you don't know who i'm talking to no whatever 
Lord, when I get like this, the love of the head in my hair. My blood, red blood, 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 on my face. I mean, I, like, how would it sound? Like, it needs to be barked. You heard John from Voice of Doom. He did it so well. You know who I'm talking to. No, I never did. You know, it just, it just sounds better that way, I think. Austin, Austin writes, I hope, I'm hoping you'll do a part two on Chud. The more you know. No. No, I will not. Unless Chud talks, unless Chud says anything more, I'm nothing more to say about it. Honestly, it's done. It, it's all done. N- no part two. Um, let let Chud fucking rot in obscurity. That fucking guy. Chris says, "Will these be sold in Walmart?" I'm assuming you're talking about the t-shirts. Uh, they will not be sold at Walmart. The only place you can get them is at the web store, the, the, the Teespring web store. I, I mean, you shouldn't have said anything because now I have to fucking get the links and post them in the thing so that you can see where, where to get them. And now I'm not on a, uh, here we go. All right. So if you want to buy, anybody wants to buy a shirt, you can do it right here. If anybody wants to buy a shirt, you really would be a deer. Would really help me out. These are horror punk apparel shirts. Sour cream and Misfit Story. Okay. Anyway. Any which way. So. um, That's not to say that they aren't some amazing tracks. Queen Wasp is is furious, blasting, buzzing tour de force while death comes ripping. Wins with distinctive whoa, 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 sing along back vocals and a demo. I couldn't read this in the other episode. Uh, a demoniacal, a deem, a demoni. <laughs> How do you say that fucking word? A demoniacal arrangement of thundering drums, vicious guitar, and a finale that seems trapped in hell's whirlpool. Most inspired of all, though, is the staggering green hell, a ruthless exercise in dynamics, which drags you from the high tension one chord guitar and bass chug to explosive blasts of rapid changing switch and yell. One of the most crushingly intense pieces of music ever committed to vinyl and they're be- and they're best on Earth AD. The Misfits sound at their best on earth ad the misfits sound compelling and invincible i agree man they sound compelling and invincible they are it's an iron fist fucking drenched in green hellfire that punches you right in the fucking face uh and at their worst just sound like noise i don't think any of it sounds like noise man i just think you got to know what party you're coming to you know what 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 party is this am i going to this kind of party am i going to that kind of party you know, you got to dress appropriately. Uh, unlike their other records, which hook you in the first time, Earth AD takes some getting used to. But now here's the one question that I have before we move on. Is Earth AD the same band as the Static Age band? I mean, that could be its own episode alone where we just pour over trying to understand how this band could be this band. Because when you look at those two lineups, they are so different their world's different earth ad is not static age like when you think about like i'm thinking about the band it's just not the same band you can't how can you call them all the misfits it just gets so confusing it's so nuanced that the, there's endless layers to this mike stacks where was earth ad recorded the production is kind of a mess ouch oh here jerry only is about to dish ready jerry only You want to hear something? We played the Whiskey Owls Bar and went right to record the album that same night, okay? The guys from Black Flag hooked us up and we recorded at this place. It was a giant concrete garage, which I love. I love a live-sounding room because you just get some really great shit. That's how we got all those feedback tracks, throwing the guitars on the floor for a whole song. What happened was, when we were there, Glenn fell asleep. He didn't have nothing to do with the recording of the music. It sounded like a fuck. It sounded like fucking Motorhead on fucking speed. It was great. Motorhead had just done that Ace of Spades thing and shit. This pissed all over it. Then what happened was he went back and remixed it later on and took all the fucking aggression out of it. 
If I was to play you the original versions, you would cry. You know what I mean? Wow. So, all right, a lot to take from this thing. First of all, I had heard this. I had heard uh, they were talking about they got feedback tracks throwing the guitars on the floor for the whole song. So I did not know that. I guess they actually threw their guitars for the whole song. It was always my understanding that at the end of a song, they would throw their guitar in this concrete room, close the door, and then just record the feedback as it would just drain out of the guitars or whatever. Uh, I didn't know it was in a concrete room. That's so interesting. And then, yes, it's it's a fucking it's recorded live. It's a it's a live record. They're playing live in there. And, you know, I'm baffled by the fact that Doyle plays so well. I mean, Doyle plays really fucking well on this recording. He does. They're, they're so tight. Doyle, Jerry and Robo are locked into such a groove. And um, yeah, that Glenn fell asleep. I don't know if Glenn fell asleep. Maybe Glenn fell asleep for a little bit. You really think Glenn slept while they're recording this album? You think Glenn wouldn't want to be awake? I would love to ask Glenn about that. I would love to hear his version of uh, his point of view of, of this time when they were recording. I'd love to hear what Spot has to say. Spot would be the most interesting person to listen to because Spot is completely unbiased in all of this. He would tell you exactly whatever Spot says. I would go, okay, this is, this is what happened. This is what happened. I, I, this is what I would believe, um, through, through, through spots testimony. And they claim he went back and remixed it later on. Maybe this was after the band had broken up, right? So the band has broken up and Glenn is gotten the, the cover back from mad Mark rude. You've seen that glorious fucking cover. That is the cover. And, um, remix the album without the the band or the input of the band or whatever you know again the it sounds like there was no plan whenever glenn records or has recorded in the past there always seems to be a plan when it comes to earth ad i mean sorry there always seems to be a plan when glenn records you always i always hear this in interviews i hear about how glenn knew exactly what he wanted when they went into the studio and it feels like earth ad there was no vision. There was no actual vision behind Earth AD. Earth AD is a, is a smattering of, of circumstances and conditions and, you know, in environmental situations that all come together in a mixing pot and create this beautiful accidental demon beast monster thing. Right. Um, Jeff Pierce says, spot has a book coming out soon man i gotta get you let me know someone let me know when that book comes out we got to read about earth ad it'd be crazy if spot didn't talk about earth ad in that book that that's going to be a wealth of gold um but think about it so earth ad is supposed to be an ep or something they only got five songs jerry's venting about how they only learned five songs since robo was in the band or whatever since googie left the band whatever you want to call it they only have five songs to record and then Glenn kicks in four other songs that were meant for Sam Hain. What are those songs? Blood Feast, Death Comes Ripping, Hellhound, and Green Hell. Does anybody know? Can anybody confirm that? Oh, shit. Jeff Pierce says, Spot also did a recent interview with Nate on the podcast called The Vinyl Guide talking a little about the message jeff please set put that link please 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 put that link in the comments or or dm it to me on on the lodi facebook page i want to fucking check that shit out or maybe i'll just come back here if, if you do neither of those things but it would be a big help if you could do it for me buddy i appreciate it thank you so much <laughs> daemon call daemon oh 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 jonathan james with the with the clutch ready it's demoniacal, demoniacal, demoniacal. That's how you say, it. dude. Thank you, thank you. And you know what? I'm not fucking too embarrassed to admit it. There are just sometimes you read a word and you just it's demoniacal. What did I say? <laughs> I mean, you just gotta laugh. You just gotta laugh. You can't even. You, I mean, demoniacal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that, buddy. Really do. Uh, Rue says, I remember hearing Glenn say he didn't want the, uh, he didn't like the way Earth AD turned out. Something about the final mix. So, so you know, Rue, 
yeah, that's interesting. So, so Jerry here is talking about, oh, uh, he, Glenn remixed it. Maybe Glenn didn't like the way it sounded initially, you know, period. And, you know, redid that final mix in, in an attempt to save it, an attempt to make some sort of sense. Maybe, maybe that mix is like, okay, I'm going to conform this to hardcore thrash as much as possible. Um, because I don't like the way it sounded. It's supposed to be slow, you know, slow atmospheric Sam Hain sort of shit. We're speeding it up to match these other five songs that are part of the, so that, oh, okay. So that makes sense now. Okay. I think we crack the nut. We literally are cracking the nut in real time. You have five songs that are sort of written to be hardcore songs, right? Those five songs. Then you have Sam Hain like the slow Sam Hain songs that are added on to those five songs, making the double EP earth AD and wolf's blood, right? Um, four songs, death comes ripping Hellhound, blood feast and green. Hell are those? The four songs are supposed to be slow atmospheric Sam Hain songs. And then you have the five hardcore songs. That's where all the different interview conflicting interview shit comes from. So you have Glenn saying, oh, Earth AD was supposed to be slower. He's referring to just the four Sam Hain songs. You have Jerry talking about um, the five hardcore songs that were probably written in coming into Earth AD, you know, much faster that were written to sort of mirror that stuff. And then you have, uh, and then they, uh, it all gets, it all gets played at the same speed when they're recording the spot, right? And much to Glenn's dismay, but also it's Jerry who's pointing the finger back at Glenn, going, "No, he wanted them fast, but he's only referring to those five songs, not the other four songs." That's where the disconnect comes in. And then Glenn, maybe Glenn, after the band breaks up, Glenn is remixing the songs so they all kind of sound uniform because when you listen to earth ad songs and again someone mentioned it the other day um in another broadcast where they there was a reason why the masters had disappeared oh they got sent to germany and they never came back so the masters are lost right thank you jeff pierce put the the link in the thing and marty marty what are you saying here marty i always wondered what earth ad would sound like with googie or even if walk among us had robo earth ad is definitely the most compelling record but makes a little little sense in retrospect as a transition into makes a little sense in retrospect as transition to Glenn's Sam Hain material. I don't know if I 100% agree with that. First of all, if you want to hear what Earth AD would sound like with Googie, just listen to the pit demos. Those pit songs, the you know that that tape I was talking about in the part one of this two parter episode, which is really part three and four of the only only Jerry secret history. Um. Th that's Googie. That's Googie practicing the songs. That's Googie doing Earth AD songs, or just listen to Googie do it live with the band. I mean, it's really not. I mean, that's not. That's not that much of a mystery, truly. It ain't a mystery, baby. Not to me. Um. And then, does it make a little sense in retrospect as a transition is Glenn's Sam Hain material? I I don't know, man. If you listen. When you listen to those, when you listen to those, uh, that first Sam Hain album, man, that's something to do. Listen to Earth AD and then listen to Initium and try and see the the, the continuation. Devil Man has always said that really each band is just a progression of Glenn Danzig songwriting. So the Misfits, they all have the same, and they all have the same like you know instrumentation. It's guitar, bass, and drums with Glenn fronting the band. And so in a way, it's always just been an evolution of, of the Glenn Danzig fronted band. First is the Misfits, then is Sam Hain, then is Danzig. And you most certainly can hear the transition from Sam Hain to Danzig in those four Sam Hain Grimm tracks that are on Final Descent. You hear that early twist of Kane, you hear that early possession, you hear um what is it? Twist of Kane, Possession, Final Descent, and Trouble. Those songs with London May drumming, it's still London May drumming, but John Christ on guitar. And that you could hear, wow, that's how they transitioned right into Danzig in 1987. 87 was a, tran uh, a transition year for Glenn musically 
as he's working with Rick Rick Rubin. But in 83 is also a, tra a transitional year where I guess, yeah, maybe, okay, so maybe that Earth AD material sort of um, undergoes a gothic transformation and that's how you get Black Dream. Could you, here's the question, could you imagine Black Dream on Earth AD? Could you imagine Macabre on Earth AD? If I had to take a guess, and again, you know who could fucking clear that up? Steve Zing. Steve Zing would know. Maybe you should text him. Um, Steve Zing would probably be able to answer when Macabre was written. And then to ask him, hey, Steve, is Macabre, was Macabre like, you know, kind of like the same vibe that, say, some of those Earth AD tracks were, right? So it's like, it's like, I could imagine maybe Glenn's going for that slow atmospheric vibe of macabre and then turbocharged those Sam Hain songs so that they matched the other five Sam Hain songs, you know? Um, but I don't know. Again, all speculation. I'm just talking out of my ass. I don't fucking know. Just nerding out. What else do you have on all murder, all guts, all fun? Would that be, could you, could I imagine that on earth AD? Maybe. Maybe more on like the Die Die My Darling EP, which is actually not Earth AD material. It's Walk Among Us material that's sort of mixed more like Earth AD, if anything. Um, what else? What else would match? I guess maybe Black Dream. Dream, dream, Black Dream. I could imagine. I don't want it. I don't need that. Doom. No, 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 no. You could almost imagine Black Dream being like turbo boosted. To sort of appear on something like Earth AD. Um, what about Macabre? Macabre spirit uh sped up. Spirit us, suck you bus. Life is pain. But imagine that like Earth AD style. All right. Challenge for any band out there to go out there and fucking record Initium tracks like their earth ad songs hey john voice of doom I fucking challenge you i fucking challenge you to do that record macabre fucking oh record sam hain record wait a minute let's think about that boom but -ba boom but -ba boom 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 salt the dead you close the veil to change your shapes is alone on us autumn goes brings the pagan death who seek the war above the Sawai fire? No, man, that doesn't, that would never be on Earth AD. It's too slow. It's too like the, the, I don't know what you would call it. What do you call it when the drums are, the drums, it's just a different tempo or whatever. It's just not, I couldn't imagine Do, uh, Robo playing that. Boom, 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 It's just, no, it's different, man. That's fucking different. Sam Hain is different. And Sam Hain was written in, I think, 83, right? The song Sam Hain. Um, Archangel's the earliest track. Okay, Archangel is a good look at that. You know, you think about Archangel. Hmm. Could Archangel have fit on Earth AD? There's no mention of Archangel when they're recording Earth AD. There's no, there's no talk about, hey, let me take some of these Sam Hain songs. When Glenn is deciding what's going to go on Earth AD, he's not going, hmm, should I put archangel on there too would archangel a fit where would it have gone if anything i guess i would make that the ending track yeah jonathan james says it's tribal jonathan james also says i always felt like a lot of the legacy of brutality re-recorded versions of those misfit songs had a real sam hain vibe you know what it's been a minute since i listened to legacy legacy of brutality i'm gonna go back and check that out i mean i guess that would make sense he recorded them while he was in sam hain right he was Firmly in Sam Hain when he when he re-recorded that guitar, those guitar and those bass, bass, uh, bass drums. Um, so this is wow, but this is cool, man. Uh, e e even I mean, this is totally Jerry's sort of thing. So Jerry is really talking about Motorhead and Ace of Spades. I mean, those guys were firmly planted in metal when they were doing um, Earth AD. It's it's punk, it's punk, it's hardcore punk inspired by heavy metal. That's what Earth AD is. Think about that. Think about that fucking think about that concept for a second. Uh, in the way that Metallica or whoever 
is influenced by Earth AD. That's metal. That's influenced by hardcore punk, right? So in a way, Earth AD partially is sonically, and you and man, I guess Jerry and and Doyle must have their imprint if they're making that shit super fucking speedy fast. Amy, you say yep. I don't know what you're saying yep to, but I want to know. Whoops, that's Marty. Marty says, I think Archangel was a demo given to Dave Vanian to sing. It, it was, but but Archangel was was uh, for a, a side project, was for a Sam Hain side project. I don't know if he had the name Sam Hain back then. When did Halloween 2 come out? Because that's when I think Glenn first latched on to doing Sam Hain, right? That's when Glenn was like, uh, this shit's really cool. You know, uh, let me see. Halloween do the night yeah okay so that's the 81 i think that's when glenn gets the idea of to use sam hain as a band name at some point he sees he sees halloween sometime in 81 or 82 halloween 2 and it's like what what is sam hain oh amy is saying metal and punk are close cousins they sure are man they sure are so in a way earth ad is metal is Hardcore punk inspired by metal. It's just crazy how that gets reinterpreted through the brain of, of the musician. Jerry only says, um, oh, Amy also says uh, early Slayer and Circle Jerks. I, I agree with that, too. I would definitely agree with that a little bit, for sure. Um, Marty says, oh, whoops. Jonathan says, Jerry and Joel were into goofy metal, not thrash type stuff. Yes, but but that's my point is that that thrash type stuff, I mean, that that goofy metal, like the goofy metal, like is basically influences it. it uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? I'm, I'm, I'm spacing on the word I want to use. It inflects, doesn't inflect. It um, imposes. Yeah, I guess impose it. Uh, it informs. That's the word I want to use. The goofy metal informs hardcore and the result is Earth AD. That's part of it, a little bit. Glenn brings Sam Hain songs and those guys in their goofy metal phase inform those songs. Earth AD. That's it. That's it. All right, moving on. Jerry only... Um, Jerry only says, well, the reason that it's lost is because he lost the basic tracks. The basic tracks got over swamped with all the extra. Hmm. Mike stacks. Yeah. There are all these guitar tracks and shit, but the bass and the drums are way back there. Jerry only right. That's the problem. The problem was, okay. Glenn fell dot, dot, dot. Who's this guy? He's got a headband. He's got a, a misfits t-shirt on Mark rude. Oh, that's Mark rude. So here's the guy. So Mark Rude, who used to wear a Mad Max Road Warrior jacket, um, did the cover for Earth AD. He did. He it took him a year to do that cover. Mark, Mad Mark Rude. I believe there's a documentary about him somewhere. He passed away, man. I would have loved to have heard his his like whole. Look how long that devil lock is, man. That's just from growing. Look, look how long that fucking thing goes down. I don't know if you could see with my little like etch a sketch here. God, the thing's fucking long. Long, not wrong. It's long. Uh, Mark Rude and Jerry in discussion, San Diego, 1992. So Jerry says, right, that's the problem. The problem was, okay, Glenn fell, fell asleep because we had just done two shows. So, all right, this is a little bit of a load of horse pucky, a little bit. I'm sorry, Uncle Jerry. Don't get mad. Don't you know what I'm talking about, Uncle Jerry? You know what I'm talking about. He says, Glenn fell asleep because we had just done two shows, Whiskey and Al's Bar. Me, like I said, after I play, I get ecstatic. <laughs> right. You get ecstatic. I'm in outer space. It brings me to life. We went and recorded we recorded the whole album one take after the other just banged him because we were playing all night i was never so loose in my life i stood there in a pair of shorts we put robo in the middle my amps facing one direct one side doyle's facing out the other 
and me and Doyle stood right in front of the drum kit watching each other uh, while we were playing. And we played into this live room, no padding at all. And the tracks came out so good. I said to him later on, Glenn, I don't even really like this shit, but we just kicked its ass. I said, not for nothing, but you got it. If that's what you wanted, it's on that tape. And that's how good it was. He didn't mix it until after. Yeah, there you go. He did. He didn't mix it until after the band broke up. And when I heard it afterwards, I wanted to cry because he ruined it. Wow. All right. So again, let's fuck this, 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 uh, this um, Earth AD tangent is going on way longer than I intended it to, but it's just, it's just too good. It's just too spicy of a meatball not to talk about. So, so, all right, this is great. Yeah. J uh, I think Jerry was, was stimulated. Jerry was stimulated. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying that he was, but this is crazy. I mean, this is so cool. We recorded the whole album, one take after the other, just banged them out because we were playing all night. That's right. So they played two live shows. They are loose. I was never so loose in my life. I mean, they're all warmed up. I stood there in a pair of shorts. We put Robo in the middle. So Robo's in the middle. My amp's face in one side and Doyle's face in the other. So they have this room. You have one amp here and you have one amp here. Let me just minimize that. Look, you have one amp here and you have one amp here facing each other. So that's why the, the sound just bleeds in. You have Jerry's bass bleeding into Doyle's guitar, and then you have Robo weaving it together with his drums, right? And, and then he says this, which I think is so telling. And me and Doyle stood right in front of the drum kit watching each other, uh, watching each other while we were playing. So they're watching each other while they're playing, while Do uh, Robo's there. There's no, that's why it sounds so good. It doesn't matter. Cause you know, when those guys are playing live, they're not looking at what, what they're doing. They're probably watching each other for the changes like Doyle. Uh, you know what that is? That's that, that's the, that's the element that they need the, for the recipe being the secret ingredient is the coordination between Jerry and Doyle, probably locking eyes and like playing in such synchronicity you know, it's not like they're on stage and there's a bunch of hardcore kids like rushing them and like bumping into them and stuff. It's just like they're in the room. They're locked in. They're super loose. They're concentrated. They know exactly what they're doing. And they're just they're 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 completely simpatico. And that is how you get the sound of Earth AD. And then apparently the mix is stepped on by Glenn, but it sounded even better. And you know what? I fucking believe that. I believe what Jerry's saying there. And I'm sure Glenn would never admit it. You know, because Glenn, Glenn, how could Glenn be wrong if it all comes from his head? You know, um, Amy says Nina Hagen, monk sex, monk knock is not gnarly punk, but she is considered the queen of punk because she encompassed the movement. Be fucking unique and have no boundaries. People at shows used to bleed out on the scene. That's what comes through the guitar. The blood remains. Hmm. Um. Kenny says Robo was the mess misfits drummer in my humble opinion. Robo was a great drummer, man, but not for nothing. You know who fucking would have killed that material? I believe it dollars to donuts. I think Mr. Jim could have fucking, I mean, it would be so weird to hear him do that. Cause that's just so not his style of playing. I think Mr. Jim could have fucking done it. Mr. Jim could play fast as fuck. I think he would just fucking crush it, crush it. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, I man, I wish we could have heard those original, the raw, the raw tapes of Earth AD. We'll never get to hear them. Maybe we will. Maybe there's some mixed down tape that's locked off. You would imagine they got a mixed down tape of that stuff. Maybe that's what is secretly, secretly exists. I don't know. Uh, Mike Stack says the die die, my darling, twelve inch. Did that come out after the band broke up? Um here's okay wait we're just gonna look at this one comment uh jerry's uh off on the tour info the show he's referring to are from spring 82 tour with googie you're right because al's bar was the last time they played wow and then they did the first aid earth ad session while on tour in october once robo joined the band according to mark kennedy hmm yeah, you might. I guess you're right about that. Because why would Googie's last show was Al's bar? Huh. 
and they did the whiskey with with him too. Did they do the whiskey with Robo as well? Maybe. I don't know. Mike Stacks, the Die Die My Darling 12 inch. Did that come out after the band broke up? Jerry only. Yeah, it was recorded, I think, at the same time uh, we were with Robo in that room. That is wrong. That's not true. Um, those tracks, maybe We Bite. Does Robo play on We Bite? Who plays on We Bite? Who plays on We Bite and who plays on, um, well, shit, let's do a little digging, shall we? All right. We're go <laughs> We're going on an investigative mission, people. Hold on. Let's find this out. Ready? Boom. The one and only. All right. Let's let's do some deep diving. Let's see what Misfit Central says. We're going to find out right now who did. All right. We have recording sessions. What are we looking for? We're looking for Die Die My Darling, but DI. Okay. Let's go down. I don't know if you can't really see it that well. Um, okay. Wow. So we bite does come from, hmm. We bite was in 1983. We bite is 1982. All right. So that is, yeah, Glenn's doing guitar. So that's like a guitar overdubs session, vocal session. So October Three, 1982 they do an instrumental of wolf uh or earth ad we bite daemonomania wolf's blood the instrumental queen wasp devil lock mommy can i go out and kill tonight that's at santa monica that's with robo on the drums so robo plays on on we bite and he plays on mommy can i go out and kill tonight the studio version however die die my darling comes from where does it come from? Died in my darlings from 1982 with uh, Googie. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. That's from 1981. Look at that. You guys can't see this. It's too small, maybe. So Died in my darling is from 81 with Googie, but it doesn't come out until 1984. Holy shit. Yeah, this stuff, You, if you go through this, this will really blow your mind. There's a lot of interesting information on here. And this shows all the different things. So this is the this is spot Rutherford, New Jersey, Robo on drums. Yeah, see they're prepping. Huh. This recording session was stored on two 16 track tapes. The first tape included previously recorded songs one through seven. That's from October 3rd, 1982. And uh June 1983. And the second included songs eight through eleven at this session. The band added vocals and extra instrumentation to song one through seven and recorded tracks eight through 11 for the first time. So death comes ripping green hell, blood feast and Hellhound. Ah, so these are the four Sam Hain songs. I was fucking right. I was, I was right about that shit. How about that? I pulled that out of my ass. I was really not sure about myself. I bet you. Yeah, man. Those are the, cause I, we know that death comes ripping is a, is a Sam Hain song. We know that Blood Feast is, and they play both of those in in uh, in Samhain and Green Hell. Yeah, man, Green Hell is in Howlhound, and then Die Die My Wow, this fucking blew my mind. According to Danzig, Die Die My Darling was taken from the Walk Among Us sessions, right, and remixed to sound like the other tracks from the session. The extended version of "Mommy Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight" from Collection One in the cassette release of Earth AD ends with an extra second of feedback. <laughs> oh yeah, that's really extended. Collection two includes a version of We Bite with the one, two, three, four introduction edited out. My God. So there you have it, folks. There you have it. So Robo plays on up. Oh, I wasn't even looking. Thanks, buddy. I didn't even see that. Oops. Yeah. So Robo's playing on We Bite. He plays on Mommy, Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight? And so Mommy Can I, I Mommy Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight is both a walk among us song, but it's also an Earth AD song, if you think about it, um, in terms of like they recorded both at those both of those times. And then um, um We Bite is for sure a, a Earth AD track. They just left it off, they left it off of uh Earth AD. 
initially left it off her birthday day, right? Wow. All right, back back to the we'll, we'll if we need this again, we'll open this up. Well, shit. Shit on a shingle, Christ on a cracker. There we go. Okay. We're going to get through this, people. Because I'm not doing a part five of this fucking thing. Yeah, it was recorded, I think, at the same time we were uh, we were with Robo in that room. So, But he's not referring to Die, Die, My Darling. He's talking about the other songs. Mike Stacks. Because that has a much better sound than Earth AD. Jerry only. Oh, yeah. I think it had more of the original sound to it. So that's interesting. Without all the bullshit, you can hear the difference. So if you want to listen or have any kind of idea as to what maybe the original Earth AD sounded like before meddling in the studio from Glenn or anything, just listen to the Die, Die, My Darling 12-inch and, and those tracks and what they sound like. This is where vinyl rips come in such hand in, in hand. They come in handy. Another great example, Damien, Pete Damien Marshall. You can't hear any of his fucking guitar on CDs, man. You can only hear his guitar work if you, um, well, maybe not for November's Fire, November Coming Fire, but definitely for Unholy Passion, the original, the original um, vinyl, vinyl rips. That's the only way you're going to hear Damien on Sam Hain tracks. Um, Marty asks, how come the Misfits may be the best band to devolve <laughs> as far as musicianship is concerned? And it makes complete sense for what they became after Mr. Jim. I don't know, man. I don't know, but they do it well. <laughs> they really do. But could you imagine Mr. Jim playing Earth AD shit? It would just be crazy. It would just be a crazy situation. <sighs> I don't know, man. I could just talk so passionately about the Misfits forever. I don't know why that is, but I can. I can do it about the Beatles too. You think this? I for for all the stuff I talk about the Misfits, I could equally talk about the Beatles, if not more. I'm a Beatles historian. I could motherfucking profess a Beatles college course if I so wanted to. Um, I take pride in that. Uh, and don't you dare say the Beatles fucking suck. I just don't even want to hear it. I don't want to fucking hear it. I hate that edge shit. It's it's a fucking fact that they were great. Whatever. Don't argue with me. Um, oh, yeah. I think it had more of that original sound without all the bullshit. You can hear the difference. I don't even know if Jerry, maybe Jerry doesn't know what he's talking about. Maybe that's like, maybe he's just saying that to, to move on to the next question. Who knows? Mike Stacks. So when you were doing Earth AD, the band was basically starting to break up. Tell me how the breakup happened. Okay, here we go. We're going into the breakup. Jerry only. Well, the breakup happened because Glenn wanted to be the boss. The thing is, there is no boss. We were a team. Glenn would book the shows. I would pay the money to get us there, okay? He would manage it, but I would produce the band. If the guy with the money is the producer, you know what I mean? In other words, he'd say, we're going to play here, we're going to play there. I would do all the mailings, all the t-shirts, all that, all the kind of shit like that out of my company. Basically, the money was my end of the deal and the performance and the getting the shit done. Oh, we need a stage. We need a van. We need this. We need that. I made everything go. I was the wheels of the whole project. I believe that. I truly believe that. I, I believe that Jerry was like a producer of things. He was a facilitator. Glenn was Glenn would, you know, uh, figure that out the, the booking. And, and Jerry would figure out how to make it happen. Really was teamwork. So what happened was Robo split. When we came back off the last tour with Robo, what happened was my mom said Robo's nearly as old as I am. What? So what happened was Robo split. When we came back off the last tour with Robo, what happened was my mom said Robo's nearly as old as I am. I really don't want him living by my house. Oh, oh, I see. I see. So, so, so. Robo was was crashing because he probably because because Glenn Glenn probably got sick of having him in the basement at uh, 49 MacArthur. So Robo, you know, crashed at the Kaiafa re residence and Jerry's mom said Robo is as near as uh, is as old as I am. So that Robo was was much older than Jerry. I really don't want him living by my house. Uh, la and and then he laughs. 
I wasn't about to argue with her because the thing was, we just put up a whole bunch of bands like Black Flag and Social Distortion. Anybody that was fucking in town wound up at my house. I had a pool and a basketball court and the whole deal. So you could park your bus in my backyard and spend the whole week if you have to. No problem. The thing was, Robo went to live by Glenn. Glenn wasn't booking any shows like he was supposed to, and Robo kind of got a little bored by that. The way I picture it is, Glenn invited Robo to be in the band to move out from California. The band should pay his fucking room and board. That's my opinion. Like, if I call you up, hey, Mike, want to play drums in my band? And you get out here, and 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 I don't book any shows, and I want to charge you rent? Now, that's pretty fucking stupid. So he started being a jerk to Robo. Huh. So, Glenn, yeah, so Glenn got sick. <laughs> Glenn got sick of, of, of having Robo by his house. And then Robo eventually went to live with Jerry, but Jerry's mom got sick of that because she was having all these bands stay at the house. That, that's that Lodi hospitality, the gregarious Lodi hospitality. Uh, Jeff Pierce says there's some good Beatles stuff on the same podcast. I guess he's referring to the one with Spot. Okay, I will keep that in mind. Um, Jerry says he would have Robo. Oh, no. What happened? We lost it. We fucking lost it. There we go. He would have Robo dot, 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 waiting for the next part, waiting for the next part. Oh, no, I did it again. Why do I keep doing that? Hold on. Just a second. I'm glad we did, man. I would have rushed through this. I would have rushed through this and we wouldn't have had the, the, the wonderful chance to pour over. God damn it. Stupid fucking computer. It's a stupid. Here, let me try this. Maybe that will help. Okay. Just gently. Yeah, I wanted to make this. Mrs. Kayafa, fucking saint. Yeah, man, you're spelling that name wrong though. It's like Canada. You got to put the A's where the where the A's are in Canada. That's how you spell Kayafa, as I've learned. Coolest lady ever. I man, I think so. For a mom who just like totally like you know um, indulged her children to being creative and supported their dream. I mean, I bet that mama was so proud when they're when her kids played Madison Square Garden sold out all that fucking, you know, all, all that um, encouragement, man. I, I can tell you as a father of a five year old boy, I pray and hope that if my son is artistic, that I can be as supportive as I possibly can to him and his dreams, whatever they may be, as I remember what it was like having my own dreams and, you know, wanting that same support. So, um, so Robo, so Glenn would have Robo sit down. <laughs> so Glenn's putting him to work in his basement. Glenn would have Robo sit down and glue 45 sleeves, sleeves. Glenn would have Robo sit down and glue 45 sleeves. Glenn was a stickler at saving two cents. I told him, Hey, listen, I work 12 hours a day. I build my own equipment. I practice with the band. I make sure the band knows what they're playing. I don't have time to glue 45 sleeves. I don't care what you're saving. You don't want to pay to have them done that way. Then you glue them. Ha ha ha. So he had Rubu glue 45 sleeves. So he's saying 45 sleeves, like 45 record sleeves. Um, and the first, uh, uh, and first you have to cut them out. They weren't even cut out. So Robo eventually said, Hey, fuck this. All I want is money for beer every night. Cause Robo would drink a six pack and watch TV and then go to bed. So Glenn wouldn't give him any money. And then he started hassling him about paying rent. You know, this is fucking, this is honest. This is honest. This is real. Like you can't, like if I had to put this through my bullshit a meter, like this is the truth. Like there is, n there's no agenda for Jerry at the moment. He's not, he's not doing the misfits. He's in a lawsuit with Glenn. He's going to speak so like candidly and frank about the situation. This is too funny. Uh, Marty says, well, the brothers should have found a new singer and drummer and started writing Christ the Conqueror American Psycho back in 1984 or kept Robo. Saw a trailer for a movie about Robo or something. Have you seen it? Yeah, there's there's a movie about Robo coming out 
that looks really great. I really do want to check it out. We should definitely, I'll, I'll post that trailer at some point, support Robo. Um, I never met Robo, but I did meet his son who grew up in Vernon and his, you know, he, he grew up with Jerry's kids. Jerry told my buddy back in 89, 90 that Robo worked. With, yeah, he worked at Pro Edge. He worked at Pro Edge for the rest of the 80s, man. He met a woman uh, and they had their son, Vinny. And Vinny um, was good friends with Jerry Jr., Jerry Other. And like, you know, uh, and then, you know, eventually Robo got back in, in the band through Jerry's Misfits, you know, with Dez. Jerry, Robo, and Dez were going out touring but this is so funny i gotta i gotta read this one more time because it's so fucking great it's just so great because just imagine glenn glenn gets robo puts him uh puts him up puts him to work because he's just like because and you know it's funny someone recently posted about how like glenn knows glenn is able to tell what's a bootleg and what's not because he hand glued things himself right he literally was talking about it in the clip from the verotic premiere Someone brought an, an, an evil live seven inch for him to sign. He turns it over, looks at it for two seconds, goes, yep, this is an original. And I guess that's because he looks, he's looking for certain markers, meaning like he knows when something is, is glued, is glued the right way, you know, uh, or glued, glued the wrong way for that matter. Is it ready? So Glenn was a stickler at saving two cents. I told him, hey, listen, I work 12 hours a day. I build my own equipment. I practice with the band and make sure the band knows what they're playing. I don't have time to glue 45 sleeves. I don't care what you're saving. You don't want to pay to have them done that way. Then you glue them. So he had Robo. So instead of doing it himself, he's like, I'm like, all right. He's like, all right, Jerry. And he turns to Robo. He's like, Robo, glue those sleeves. He's just making Robo glue sleeves in his basement. <laughs> and all Robo wants is a six pack. Robo's just like, give me a six pack. And like, he'll be happy with a six pack watching TV. And then he just goes to bed. Like, he's a pet. Like, he's a pet drummer or something. Give him a six pack, let him watch TV, and then he'll go to bed. Um, because Robo would drink. So Glenn wouldn't give him any money. And then he started hassling him about, hey, Robo, you got to pay rent too. Uncle Glenn, Uncle Glenn, so grumpy. It's not even Glenn's house. That's the funny. So, so two things come to mind when I hear that one Glenn's mother and father who I, I don't, I don't know anything about Glenn's mother and father. I would imagine that they are, they're incredibly generous, like the Kayafas in the sense that I've heard some stories about just them being very hospitable. I doubt, I don't think that Glenn's parents are going, Hey, Glenn, robo needs to pay rent because glenn's got the basement so he's and again again i don't know i don't know we're just talking we're just this is all spitballing speculation i don't fucking know i really don't know so glenn's already living in his parents house so then glenn turns around <laughs> glenn turns around and goes you have to pay rent to live here he's like you're drumming in my band and this is what you do for a living but you have to pay rent um, so Glenn wouldn't give him any money. And then he started hassling him about paying rent. Then Robo came to work for me and he was making a paycheck. But when he went home at night, he didn't want to see a 45 sleeve and Glenn, I didn't realize how jealous he really was of everybody, but it really rubbed him the wrong way that Robo was able to say, here, you want 50 bucks for rent? Here's 50 bucks. Leave me alone. I'm not gluing sleeves. You follow what I mean? So, okay. So, so. So Glenn is bothering him about rent, but Robo doesn't have money for rent and he's not giving Robo money. So he's going, okay, here, Robo, take these 45 sleeves, glue them together. He's making, <laughs> he's making Robo cut out the sleeves and glue them together. And then, and then, and then, um, Robo's like, fuck this glue. <laughs> he's like, fuck this glue. I'm going to live with Jerry and Doyle. He like what runs off to go live with Jerry and Doyle. And, um, and uh and then he makes or or he goes to work for jerry and doyle and then he's he has the 50 bucks and that rubs glenn the, the, the wrong way um robo gluing sleeves for records he didn't even play on yeah i mean i guess because earth AD didn't come out until the band breaks up so robo hasn't played on that so robo's glowing sleeves to, to for records he didn't even play on 
and Robo gets his face smashed in the brains in the brain eaters. But yes, he does. I mean, Robo was the butt of a lot of jokes. Robo, they bury his face in the thing. They did it without him knowing. He did it. They, they just uh, uh, smushed his face. We kind of talked about that. Uh, go back to the 1983 interview. We're, by the way, guys, this is a trilogy of interviews. We're going to do the 2003 interview next to see how Jerry has evolved. We heard Jerry in 1983, even though it was mainly Glenn talking. We're hearing Jerry now in 1993, and then we're going to hear Jerry in 2003. And if somebody can find it, find me an interview, a, a, a print interview of Jerry from 2013, so that we can say that we've gone through 40 years of Jerry interviews uh, by the year three in, in, the, in the last digit of the, of the date. I think that would be a lot of fun. All right, moving on, <laughs> moving on. God, this is so, this is hilarious. I mean, nobody else would find this funny except for us. Um, Kenny says, wasn't Glenn's dad a straight-laced Marine? I, yeah, I mean, he was a Marine. I don't know how straight-laced he was. I think he was also, he worked in the post office. You know, from my understanding, from what I know, um, Glenn's parents were just like real sweethearts. They were just really sweet, nice people. I don't know anything about them, truthfully. I really, 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 really don't know. I really, 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 really don't know. Sorry, I was just looking at something on my phone. Um, my bad. All right, sorry. Let me continue. So, um, and Glenn, I didn't realize how jealous he really was of everybody, but it really rubbed him the wrong way that Robo was able to say, here, you want 50 bucks for rent? Here's 50 bucks. Leave me alone. I'm not gluing sleeves. So, so Robo was gluing sleeves because he didn't have rent money. And now he has the rent money. So he's giving the money to Glenn. Glenn's getting mad. Um, so he kept picking on Robo, pushing him to fight him and shit. So Robo just came to me one day and said, listen, this guy's an asshole. I'm getting the fuck out of here. I like playing with you and Doyle, but this guy's just pushing me to my limit. I don't need this shit. I'm not getting paid. I said, well, Robo, I really don't blame you. So Robo got on a plane and split. Now, Robo did that. And two weeks after that, we had to play a show in Detroit for the Necros. Uh, buddies of ours put on the show. They had gone out in the cold and hung up posters and whatever. Okay. Then two weeks after that, we were supposed to go to Germany for the Earth AD fucking tour. We were supposed to do a German album that Glenn was sending tapes to or some shit. We were supposed to go to Germany and make some big bucks. So what happens was, this is four weeks before I got, uh, I, I got to leave for Germany. Now, I just can't walk out of my factory for a month without covering my ass. I can go for a month as long as no one needs anything I make. My factory, my factory still has to function. I ship about $10,000 a day. I can't go for 30 days and lose $10,000 shipping for 30 days. That's $300,000 fucking dollars for me to go to Germany. You know what I'm saying? Ha ha ha. So I told him, listen, Glenn, if Robo splitting, I think maybe you better apologize to him and ask him to hang because I don't have the time. By covering my ass, it's going to take me a month to cover my ass for a month. So he's saying that, he needs another month just to cover his ass for another month. Bottom line is, if you want to go away for three weeks, you got to make three weeks worth of parts. You got to cut and make those parts besides what you got to make anyway. So Glenn's all, oh, I'll find us a drummer. Let's put a pin in it just for a second right there. Um, Maybe look at the Maximum Rock and Roll Jerry interview from 1994. Uh, can you send that to me? Please send that over to me. But that's not, it doesn't end in a three. I want the two. Th All right, send it to me because we'll we'll look at it eventually when we run out of when we run out of material, we'll look at that. That will be interesting because that's the year when the misfits are almost poised to, to return as the resurrected misfits, you know. But um send that to me if you would, please. So Metallica ripped the misfits off by treating Newstead the way Glenn treated Robo. Ha ha ha. Um, I don't know much about Metallica other than I know that I know that some kind of monster kind of is all about um, Newstead leaving because he wanted to do a side project. Right. And and James Hetfield was like, no, you can't do that. You have to stay here. And then they go to therapy, which is probably the most unmetal thing. The Misfits therapy is <laughs> Robo. <laughs> you better make some more 45 sleeves, you motherfucker. You know. All right, so this is interesting. Hold on, let's go back here for a minute. There's a lot of information here, right? And again, this is 10 years removed from the incident. And I think this is pretty, I mean, 
again, like you really like th the reason why this is such an important landmark interview is that it's just like an unbiased Jerry, just sort of like, just sort of like, you know, doing the thing, you know, just doing his thing. Um, just explaining, explaining everything. So Glenn is being mean to Robo because he doesn't like that Robo has 50 bucks to pay him. Robo says, hey, I'm tired of being treated like shit. I'm going to leave. Now, here's the, in okay, here's the interesting shit. Ready? So, so, okay, this is what I wanted to mention. So the flip side of this is that Glenn went to Henry Rollins at the Santa Monica Civic Center show in over the summer of 83 that they did with black flag which was the largest show that they had done and he told henry that i'm leaving the misfits so unbeknownst to jerry and doyle dude so jerry's telling this side of his story but he doesn't know that maybe and maybe this is why the, the shows aren't really being booked anymore or glenn's not so concerned about booking shows anymore as much because he's thinking about leaving the band, but maybe it's not concrete yet because at some point some there's a Germany deal. And the, the, and that's where I believe that's where Wolf Wolf's blood comes from. But even in 1993, Jerry doesn't really understand what Wolf's blood is. It seems because he's going, he's saying here, he says, um, we're supposed to go to Germany for the earth AD tour, but we were that there was supposed to be a German album that Glenn was sending the tapes to or some shit. He it sounds like he doesn't really know what's what's up, what's going on. I who knows? Maybe he did. Um, but Glenn sent those tapes, and those tapes were the Earth AD tapes, and those tapes never returned. And that's why we can't have like a remastering, remixing of Earth AD. It just doesn't exist unless there's some mixtape out there floating around in the ether. Which I mean. I hope someday, uh, um, I hope someday we we get to see that, um, and that they're going to make some big bucks. So they're, I mean, they are planning to go to Germany for Earth AD. They don't, they have an album, you know. So even if Glenn is telling Henry, "I'm planning on leaving. I want to leave the Misfits," at some point, they're like, at some point, they're like, th there must that must be like. There must not be like completely like concrete yet because they're going to fucking go to Germany. They're going to uh, support the Earth AD album. Uh, and then Jerry's going, I can't just walk out of my factory for months. And you hear the Glenn side He's like, oh, all they ever wanted to do was work for their dad because they broke all their gear and spent all their money on drugs. Now, again, somewhere in the middle is the truth. Did Glenn, uh, did uh, Jerry and Doyle or just Jerry break all the gear and spend money and spend a lot of money on drugs uh, or on cocaine or whatever it is that they, that they may or may not have been doing possibly. And Glenn's like, well, no, the only thing I want to do is be a musician and uncompromising in that aspect. So I'm not going to work a straight job because the thing is, and I can tell you as a, as a guy who, who creates art on some level and works a straight job. And as a family, you got to work a fucking straight job. You know, you got to fucking work a straight job. Oh, here we go. We also, BWM says and uh Canada show was canceled. Okay. So there you go. But when you work a straight job, you, when when you have a family or when you have obligations, you got to work a straight job. Glenn has no family. Glenn has nothing. Glenn's only has his dream. Nothing can nothing stands in his way. Jerry, I don't know if Jerry was uh had, was was Jerry's girl was pregnant by then, but you know, at some point while he was in the Misfits, I believe he had his daughter, right? He didn't have his daughter. His daughter's born in uh, Kath, Catherine, Kathy or something. She's born in 82. So Glenn got, I mean, Jerry got married pretty early. And then that's when they, they left the Kayafa house. They moved out to Vernon. And by that point, Jerry is has a family while he's doing the band thing and working in the factory. And he's responsible for a lot of shit. And so he's talking. So there's that aspect, too. So is like, is it all just like Jerry working for his dad because he's got, he's got a bunch of broken gear and whatnot and this that and the other, and on the other on the flip side is um, uh, uh, Jerry saying you know oh oh Glenn doesn't want to book shows and doesn't want to do anything, um, I got to make sure that my ass is covered if I'm gonna go and and do this tour, you know uh, there's the the truth is in in somewhere in between the two of those things. 
Um, where was I? Was I when I pinned in it? Okay. So, so by covering my ass, it's going to take me a month to cover my ass for a month. It's going to take me a month to cover my ass for a month. So it's an additional month. Bottom line is if you want to go away for three weeks, you got to make three weeks worth of parts. You got to cut and make those parts besides what you got to make anyway. So Glenn's all, okay, I'll find us a drummer. So Glenn is now tasked with going to find a drummer. So no drummer starts coming around and I tell him, hey, listen, Googie said he'll play the drums. Uh, sorry. Hey, listen, Googie said he'll play the gigs, but he wants to get paid. At this point, Googie is involved or shortly thereafter, Googie's involved with a band called Antidote and he's known going by Bliss, which is just Hare Krishna name. And um, they put out an, ant uh, uh, an EP called uh, Thou Shall Not Kill. And they even did a show with the Misfits when, when Robo was the drummer, right? That was Googie. Googie was on drums, I guess. That was 83. Um, I don't know why. Why didn't they just ask Todd Swallow to do it? Why, uh, uh, you know, maybe why didn't they go back to Harley Flanagan and say, hey, Harley, you want to you want to come? And I mean, Harley's an incredible hardcore drummer. He would have been fucking great. He would have filled Robo's shoes just fine. Didn't do it. Why didn't they get fucking Steve Zing? Why didn't they get Erie? I mean, they they I feel like they did have some options here and they just didn't, you know. Erie wanted to focus on Rosemary's Babies. Steve is doing Morning Noise. Harley's doing Crow Mags. And Googie wants to get paid for the gigs. If he's coming to Germany, he wants his cut and he wants it every night, which is fair. Googie got screwed over once before. But he didn't want to play with Googie. He said, I'd rather not play in this band if I got to play with Googie. I said, okay, but if you get a drummer, you work them in because I don't have time because Jerry's double time. Uh, Jerry's Jerry is overdriving now. He's trying to make enough parts so that he's covering his ass for the three weeks that he's going to be gone. So he doesn't lose any money. And he's leaving it up to Glenn. Glenn, work in the new guy. So that way we can go off and do these tours. Tony says a book called American Hardcore by Steve Blush or something like that has uh, has a little interview in the book with a woman. I forget her name. She says the misfits were definitely not straight edge. I'm sure they partied. Um, Stephen Blush is in this documentary. I interviewed him for this documentary. So you can hear Stephen Blush talk about the misfits, the, the author of American Hardcore. You can hear him talk about the misfits in this movie whenever the fuck it gets released god damn it's gonna take a long time but it's gonna it's fucking coming it is fucking coming or 1979 will come before that um so jerry's like okay but if you get a drummer you work them in because i don't have the time and there's no way if i tell you that hey the bass player and the guitarist have to go to work to cover their ass you gotta break wait let fuck let's take that again sorry people and there's no way if I tell you that, hey, the bass player and the guitarist have got to work to cover their ass. You got to break the drummer in. How are you going to do it realistically? Right. He's basically saying because he's basically saying because he has to go. They have to go and go to work. How are they going to like who's going to play guitar? Who's going to play bass? I guess I guess Glenn. I guess Glenn could play fucking guitar and just have a, a drum player play play the drums guitar and drums now here's the flip side of this jerry's saying you got to break them in you got to get us a drummer you would think that like jerry for you know being as integral into the operation as possible whether he has time for it or not or maybe he's relying on glenn for teamwork but you would think that jerry'd be like okay like we gotta you know all of the them together have to be there to fucking break in the drummer the misfits have a history of this especially after 83 there were so many times where they would just fucking you know uh they wouldn't be present there were times where uh there, there was one like for instance when mike hideous uh took over for michael graves michael graves um wanted to go play hockey um apparently he wanted to go play hockey for a hockey camp when jerry had booked some tours and you know what's funny everything that happened between michael graves and jerry is so indicative of everything that happened here with uh with glenn and with a drummer and whatnot because once again here's a guy here's a singer telling jerry oh i'm gonna go play hockey i'm not going to go 
do this tour of South America or Europe, the big money tours from the Misfits in 1998. And especially when they, they, I mean, they had spent all of 1997 on the road and now here they are, they have a little R and R and, and Jerry's going, Hey, Michael Graves, get, get your act together. We're going on tour again. And Michael Graves is like, fuck you. I'm going to go play hockey. And Jerry's like, fuck me. Fuck me. You're not going to uh, listen. I once fucking before I uh, had a England tour blow up in my face. I had a Germany tour blow up in my face. You think I'm not going to South America where we have like the biggest crowds waiting for us? Fuck you. I'll get a new singer. And his name is Mike too. And so Jerry gets a new singer. He gets Mike Hideous to come into the band. Mike Hideous is famous from a band called the Empire Hideous, um, which is a goth band from New Jersey. There's a documentary about him called Living the American Nightmare, directed by this guy, Paul Bazile. Although Paul took the, the documentary in a completely different direction if you watch it, it's kind of, um, I mean, it's a bit of a mess. It's not focused. It should be focused on Mike. And instead it just goes into all this stuff about New Jersey and everybody, nobody knew what they were fucking doing. And some people thought it was a documentary about bands from New Jersey. Some people thought it was about horror punk. Some people thought it was about Mike hideous, you know, um, nobody knew what was going on. The doc, that documentary fell apart, but they talked about all this stuff in the documentary. And so a lot of people that were interviewed for that documentary are in my documentary too, including Mike Hideous. Mike Hideous is in my documentary. Rocky's in my documentary. All these guys. Um, point being is that, is that Jerry at this point is like, fuck this shit. I've already dealt with this shit in the, in the past. It caused the band to break up. You think I'm not going to like, I'm going to just replace you. So when they're replacing him, and this is my point, it's like, Jeff, this is such a long, crazy tangent. I know, but this is my point is that when they're rehearsing Mike hideous, it's just Jerry and Mike hideous. Doyle is not there. And Chud is not there. They're both not nowhere to be seen. So who do they bring in? They bring in Jason Trioxin. Jason Trioxin plays guitar uh, because Jason was friends with Jerry and had roadied or was going to roadie for Doyle at some point. I don't remember when or who or where or how. So, you know, this is your new singer and you're not going to fight or your temporary singer, whatever they thought, because at the time, Mike Hideous thought he was going to be the new singer of the Misfits, thought Michael Graves was going to be out forever. It was it was Doyle and Chud who was like, you got to get Michael Graves back. We don't want this guy in the band. And Mike Hideous had no idea. Mike Hideous thought he was writing a new album for the band. So he got he got really fucked over. He got burned bad in that situation. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Maybe you can also look at it as, hey, got to sing for his favorite band. Misfits were his favorite band. Mike Hideous was, was friends with Jerry and Doyle through the 80s and did work for the Fiend Club and the Doyle Fiend Club and was a big Sam Hain guy. I don't know. Um, but... The point is, is that like you got to, you're getting a new drummer. Glenn's getting a new drummer. You're, you're tasking Glenn with, you're tasking Glenn with, 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 with breaking in the drummer when the drummer needs to like be cohesive with the guitar player and the bass player. That doesn't make any sense on, on that side of things. And then the flip side of that is like, hey, we're an independent band. I'm funding the band. The only way that I can fund the band is with this job. The only way that I can do this job is or, or cover my job is to make sure I have enough inventory for the time that I'm going to be gone. And you can't understand it. It's like the two guys can't understand each, each other's point of view. Uh, if we ain't going to sit there and spend time, there's no way that Glenn with his limited playing ability can t Oh, so here you go. Okay. It's like, I, I either answer the question or I ask a question. The question gets answered for me ahead of the fucking you know i just got to keep reading and we'll, we'll, we find out more 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 stuff is is revealed um bwm says my bad 1995 not 1994 best i can do cool man thank you I'll, I'll take a look at that i will i will read that thank you for that find something from 2013 that's interesting we'll, we'll tackle that too it has to be 2013 um so here's where, where Jerry is just once again talking about Glenn's limited playing ability, which also kind of lines up with actions. What are the actions? The actions are that why the Misfits were never a three-piece, except for <coughs> when Glenn was on a keyboard, right? So Glenn, and that's a keyboard. That's not a fucking guitar. Whenever it comes to having a guitar, Glenn would rather have somebody else playing guitar than playing the guitar himself. 
if we ain't going to sit, uh, sit there and spend, uh, spend the time, there's no way that Glenn with his limited playing ability can teach a drummer how to play 35 fucking songs in two weeks. I bet you that's fucking true too. I bet you Jerry and Doyle would have been integral to, to that, to facilitating that. So I told Glenn, I said, okay, Glenn, no problem. If this is the way you want to play it, then this is how we play it. You get the drummer. Uh, we'll practice like a week. We'll try and get as many practices. Uh, we'll try and get as many practices in as we can. We gave him the benefit of the doubt. You want to be an asshole. We'll try it your way. So what happened was we took the kid, this drummer, and we go all the way out to Detroit, 18 hour drive. And we go to open with 20 eyes and the kid gets nervous and can't fucking keep on the beat through the whole song. We're playing in front of about 3,000 people and we look like jerks. So what do we do? He play, apparently he lasted two songs. Uh, so what did we do? Doyle walked over and tapped the kid on the shoulder and said, fucking go backstage. And we used the drummer from the Necros, Todd Swallow, and we did the whole set because Todd had toured with the Misfits for so long. I mean, they were the they the Misfit, they were the Misfits little bro, baby brother band, right? Like the way that the you have the MC5 and the Stooges, you have the Misfits and the Necros. And so, of course, Todd, being a fan, also knows all the fucking songs. So Todd steps behind the kit and they play what is their last show. Glenn has the pentagram on his chest. He's wearing the dog, the, the hound mask that he would later wear in Sam Hain. And that was it, man. That was the final show. He says, this is the last show. And it was, he was happy fucking Halloween. This is the last show. Uh, and the clip, he claims there's 3,000 kids. If you look in the video, it doesn't look like there's 3,000 kids at Greystone Hall. I don't know how what the capacity of Greystone Hall is. I don't even know if Greystone Hall is still around. But, I mean, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, we just... Uh, so... But me and Doyle, we just stepped back and sat on our top of our amps and let Glenn handle the whole fucking show by himself. You know what I mean? Because without every piece being there, you can't get the job done. If you got four wheels on your car and you take one off, how far do you go? Haha. <laughs> you may get to the end of the block, but you're not going to go around the country. You wear it right down the fucking garbage within 100 miles. And that's what happened. So here he is putting all the blame on Glenn. But like, so if that's the case, then Jerry, why not? Why are you, it's almost like Jerry is snatching defeat. You know what I mean? Like, why not like be more vocal or be more, I know you said you had to work. He said he had to work. Uncle, Uncle Jerry said he had to work. Still, I just feel like there's a little bit more responsibility on Jerry's side of the fence. Not to say Glenn is incredibly responsible. They're both, they're all responsible. They all got here by their own actions. You can't pull a drummer out of a band two weeks before a big show in Detroit and four weeks before a fucking tour of Germany and not being willing to deal with any old people who know your stuff. I mean, look what happened to fucking Doyle. Fucking Chud, Chud tried to extort him for money on the Doyle tour and they fucking picked up the dude from TSOL. Tiny, teeny, tiny who had been with TSOL for 10 years. And they, he did a good job, man, for, for learning those songs in like 36 hours. T uh, Tiny had 36 songs. And that that show at, at uh, Blackthorn in uh, Queens, Black 51, whatever the hell it is, Blackthorn 51, where we did the rock and roll cooking episode. You've seen the, the, the Halloween episode. Um, that was like, that was Tiny's like third show, you know, on the tour. And he had just learned those songs like instantaneously. So I don't think it's impossible but who knows? I don't know. Um, we had to teach Googie five new songs. I couldn't have done that in two weeks. Glenn had to step down. Okay, so that's it. So he's saying if Googie had come in, they would have they would have had to teach Googie five new songs. I could have done that. Oh, I see. Interesting. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to understand what he's saying. And not being willing uh, to deal with any old people who know your stuff. We had to teach Googie five new songs. I could have done that in two weeks. So if they had gotten Googie, they could have te taught him the five new songs. Uh, he could have told me in Detroit, hey, you guys were fucking right. I was wrong. Call Googie. We still got two weeks. Let's go to Germany. So he's saying if if after that show with with his name was Bra brain damage he played literally two songs at the last misfits show he's the last official misfits drummer um <laughs> probably played the least out of anybody in the original misfits 
uh, even more so than uh, of fill-in members like Rick Riley and Barry Ryan or Todd Swalla. Um, call Googie. We still got two weeks. Let's go to Germany. He, he said that Glenn had to step off his high, high horse and deal with Googie for the good of the band, but he wouldn't do it. He could have told, because by that point, Glenn's just like, fuck it, I'm going to do Sam Hain. He could have told me in Detroit, hey, you guys were fucking right. I was wrong. Call Googie. We've still got two weeks. Let's go to Germany. That's what he could have said. He couldn't even admit that he was wrong. So when I saw that his ego was more important to him than the safety of the band, I realized that he's a shitty leader. I said, Glenn, you know, it's one thing to want to be the big guy. It's another thing if you suck at it. Ha, 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 ha. You don't make decisions based on emotional fucking opinions. That's true. If he would have come up to uh if he would have come up with this kid and this kid would have fucking cranked, we probably would still be playing. Mike Stacks, did you ever get to rehearse with this kid? Jerry, yeah, I did what I could. I had a show coming up in Detroit and I wanted it to be good. I wanted to believe that it was going to be a good show, you know. You need that. You need to believe that you can succeed, and that would make that's what makes you try. But instead, it turned out to be your shittiest show ever. Well, yeah, I would say some would some would say that 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 would that is the case. Whew. I could not have done this. Could you imagine if I tried to split fill all this in 15 minutes? Um, let me see here. Is this the last page? Oh, there's two more pages. It's never going to end. That's okay. Ah, uh, Chris says, we appreciate all you do, Jeff. Hey, Thanks for tuning in, man. Thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for watching. I appreciate you for for showing up week after week. Marty says Jerry put up so much money into the band. Doyle was a misfit before he could legally drive, but Jerry didn't get his name on the publishing, songwriting, licensing credits. I know nothing about the history, but licensing, songwriting credits, etc., were probably not something those kids knew all about. Did Jerry think the misfits would last long term? I can't imagine being so invested in a band with that situation. But who knows back then it would be the legacy that is. Yeah, but there were no contracts back then. They had no contracts. They just, you know, uh, Glenn had all the master tapes. Glenn had everything. Jo uh, Jerry didn't. As a matter of fact, the reason why you have the 95 Misfits in the first place is because Jerry fucking reached out to Glenn in the mid-80s and said, Glenn, let me get a couple T-shirts. And Glenn said, fuck you. Glenn was like, go fuck yourself. And that began the legal stuff. Had Glenn given him some T-shirts? Maybe. Jerry wouldn't just kept doing his thing. They would have just focused on Christ the Conqueror. That would have been it. Glenn didn't have a family business to fall back on if everything failed. Uh, but back then, none of them knew they were going to sell out MSG years later. And real jobs probably seemed like a good idea. But we know where Glenn went with his hard work as an egotistical leader. Yeah, man. I mean, look, <laughs> you, you can't. I mean, listen. Glenn, Glenn reached success. It took a couple of years, but Glenn found that success in, in what he was doing. And Glenn was ruthless. Glenn could be a ruthless dude. He really could, you know, um, from, from everything we've seen and heard. So it's like, I don't know, man. I, I you know, I, I, I see Jerry's point. And again, that's why it's so good to read all these different perspectives because there's not, there really is no one right thing. It's not all black and white. It's so, it's so, there's so much nuance. This is, Glenn at North Park Lions Club in San Diego, 1982. Uh, Jerry only. Well, it happened to be Glenn's first solo show. We moved back. <laughs> so, so Jerry is saying that the last Misfit show was actually Glenn's first solo show. Well, it happened to be Glenn's first solo show. We moved, we moved back and actually hopped on top of our amps and played our set sitting down because he betrayed the strength of the band. He betrayed all the basic rules, which made our band what it was. The thing was, all he had to do was admit it. He never even admitted it to himself. He was wrong. He was so fucking wrong that it was so obvious. All he had to do was fix it and say, look, I don't know what the fuck was in my head. Mike Stacks. Some people just can't do that, you know? Jerry only. Well, that's too bad. Then don't make a call if you can't accept when you make a bad call. That's true, too. That's true. If you're going to be a fucking leader, you know, if you make a bad call, you got to admit when you make a bad call. So that's how the band ended up. And I haven't talked to him since. Wow. And that's going on 10 years. Um, In this big quote box, you got to be able to laugh at yourself, to be open-minded enough to improve. Once you think that 
you can't make a fucking error. That's when you lose fucking imagination. Um, Mike Sachs. So after you got off the stage that night, what happened? I heard the other side of the story from Russ Gibb. Russ Gibb put up the misfits at their house for this final show. Russ Gibb was a radio DJ who worked with the local Detroit kids um, who did target video or back porch video to record. They recorded tons and tons of bands. There's so many tapes. I don't know what happened to them all. This is, I, I was in contact with him about eight years ago. I always intended on interviewing him, but that required the time to go out to Detroit, which I could not do. I never got a chance to interview Russ Gibb and he passed away, but he did tell me the story or he told me his perspective of them the next day sitting around the table. Uh, his wife was making them breakfast. Uh, everybody's nice and polite, not really talking to one another. Something about them doing their hair too. I forget. And that was it. And that was the last that they drove all the way home. Didn't talk that sort of thing. I, I really, that's what bums me out with about some of these interviews. Like there's a lot of people that I've interviewed who have passed away. I've, I've interviewed five people who have passed away. And um, so that's a good thing. But at the same time, it's like such a bummer when like one of them gets away like Russ Gibb and Russ Gibb was famous. Do you know what Russ Gibb was famous for? He was famous because he was the guy who popularized Paul is dead on the radio. So when the theory, the conspiracy theory that Paul McCartney had died in 1966, that was Russ fucking Gibb, the guy who put the misfits up. He was the one who pop popularized that Paul is dead. <sighs> Robbie says, uh, as weird as it would have sounded, I wonder if they ever thought about bringing in any of the old drummers who did know their stuff, like Joey, Jim, Manny, or shit, even Merp. I bet Merp, out of all those people, it would be Merp, who knew how it would sounded. Manny and Jim, they didn't have a bad falling out like Googie. I think Merp divorced his wife by then, who dragged him out of his last practice. That's right. So he could have played. I don't know their thoughts on Joey by 83 if things cooled off. No, Joey was, Joey was a junkie man. Not to speak ill of the dead, but it's true. Joey was a junkie. Joey had, um, Joey, had, Joey had like, Joey fucked them over bad in, uh, in England, really, really bad. And, um, that was, yeah, they were done with Joey. I mean, G G Doyle and Jerry patched things up with them when the 95 missed, when Chud and, and Michael left, you know, the band. They, the very next day, they had Joey Image do a set with them. Uh, which you can hear with Jerry singing. Um, in terms of Manny, at that point, Manny was Manny was out of any sort of music making. wasn't in bands. Matter of fact, I think Manny was you know Manny had uh, drinking problems, and um, at some point, maybe he was lost in the bottle. And Mr. Jim, probably out of all of them, I would imagine it would be Mr. Jim. But Mr. Jim, Miss, by that point, Mr. Jim is playing. I don't know if Constant for Callers broken up. He's playing in another band with the guys from the victims. Steve Berman and Rick Riley from the victims had a band with Mr. Jim called aces and eights. So I think maybe Mr. Jim is playing in that band, but Mr. Jim, I don't know if he fit. Does he fit the look by that point? I mean, the look is so different from back then. Would they have pulled him back into the fold? I don't know. Could Mr. Jim have handled himself with the material? 150%. I think with enough practice, uh, getting him up to speed, he literally would get up to speed and would have crushed it uh, doing those songs. Um, Mike Stack. So after you got off stage that night, what happened? Jerry only. The kid got real drunk, the drummer, and Glenn wanted to leave the kid in fucking Detroit. Can you believe that? I told Glenn, I leave you here before I leave that fucking kid here. We drove back and we were driving my truck with a U-Haul. So Glenn sat in the back with the kid and me and Doyle talked all the way back. We were talking about football. It was football season. So we had enough sports in our head to last us all the way home without any tensions. When we dropped Glenn off, he all he took was a suitcase full of clothes, his shit. He didn't own anything that the band owned. He didn't even own a microphone. So that was the last time you talked to him? Jerry only. Yeah. Mike Stacks. Have you seen him or anything? Jerry only. Not actually face to no, not actually face to face, but that doesn't bother me. He probably still won't admit it to himself, but we had a big opportunity with this band. I don't care how much money he individually is making off his new project, and he made a lot of money off of the Misfits recordings too. What we would have made as a band, he would have made more if he had split it with everybody. 
I, might be true, man. Might be true. If it wasn't for us sucking it up and putting out the cash, he would still be down in his mother's basement. I don't know what kind of following he has now. Oh, he has, this is okay. So again, so maybe this is uh, Jerry being a little resentful now because Glenn is at the height of his popularity. Not only is Glenn at the height of his popularity, he's written songs for Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison. He's got a song in the top 40. Mother is broken out into the top 40. He's on MTV. He's touring the world. Not only is he touring the world, but he's fucking like, like discovering bands like Marilyn Manson and Korn and Soundgarden and bringing them out on tour too. You know, he's, he's opening up from a fucking Metallica and doing last caress with them on, you know, sold out shows, you know, uh, selling out Irvine Meadows and, and making, you know, uh, home videos and music videos of all kinds. I mean, he signed to, uh, uh, signed to American recordings and working with one of the hottest producers of the nineties, Rick Rubin, you know, even by that point. So it's like, this sounds like a little bit of sour grapes from Jerry at this point, because Glenn did Glenn got out with his little suitcase and he fucking went out, fucking took over the world. You know, I mean, he did, he, and he did it without the misfits. He didn't without any of those fucking misfit songs, not a one. He didn't do it with the crimson ghost. He did it completely. He reinvented himself. That's what you have to remember about Glenn. He reinvented himself. He did it first in Sam Hain, and then he did it again in Danzig. And he just fucking, he, he did it on his own with his own fucking songs. He didn't use those songs anymore. He used a couple of the songs at the beginning when he didn't have enough material for a full set list. So he's, he's you know, some of those Sam Hain misfit songs are bleeding through. Songs like London Dungeon and Horbiz, Mother of Mercy, To Walk the Night, maybe? I don't know. He did Halloween too one night. That's pretty fucking cool. As Danzig. Uh, they could have gotten the Merp. I think there's a lot of things. There's a, there were a lot of options. I think that they had, but it just sounds like by then the, the, the rift was too big. Glenn wants to move beyond Jerry and Doyle. Jerry and Doyle are, you know, uh, working hard, but doing it in their own way. Um, here's okay. So let me finish, finish this up. Um, if it wasn't for us sucking it up and putting out the cash, he would still be down in his mother's basement. I don't know what kind of following he has now, but I think he's sold out. So he thinks he's sold out. Uh, Glenn has never sold out. That's the thing. Glenn never sold out. He kept going and doing his own fucking thing. I think the closest you could say to Glenn selling out is not even selling out. It's Glenn just listened to Rick Rubin. He listened. Rick Rubin had some great feedback and suggestions for for sort of um, restructuring Glenn in a way that he would be more digestible for more mainstream audiences. Even if Danzig was still underground, Danzig is a part of the metal scene. And the metal scene at that time is huge in mainstream music in terms of like, you know, look like the headbangers ball and stuff. Metal was huge, man. Metal today is so fucking like niche and like such like a subgenre. But in the nineties, it was fucking Jay Norris. It was this big fucking branch on the tree of music and now it's just dwindled it's died it's it's broken in half and sort of fallen off you know relegated to the same sub subcategories that are, you know you and ha you have punk rock and hardcore punk and yada 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 alternative indie it all falls under the indie blanket these days i guess so who knows um i think he's just taking all the kids for a ride selling them fucking bullshit you don't sell devil shit to a bunch of fucking young kids why because it's selling invent a better hula hoop or something, you know, but you know, Jerry says that. So here now, you know, before I was kind of like siding with Jerry, but now I'm flipping back to Glenn again. It's just not, it's not fucking, it's not a one to the other. It's not a cease. It's like a seesaw, man. Some of them, one guy is right about some stuff and the other guy is right about the other stuff. And you know, the truth of the matter is man, like here's Jerry talking mad shit, but Jerry's like fucking playing songs. Last caress. I got something to say. I raped a baby today. I killed a baby today. I got something to say. I raped your mother today. You know, like say, you know, devil's whorehouse, you know, just we bite, you know, I mean, it's just like, it's kind of like uh, my mother, my mother was a whore. My father was a wolf. I don't know. I don't know. Jerry, uncle Jerry, um, Mike stacks. That's what I don't get about it. It seemed like the misfits with the misfits, bleh. Mike Stacks. That's what I don't like. That's what I don't get about it. It seems like in the Misfits, you have this whole horror thing. 
but it was always with a really good sense of humor, total fun. And that's the difference between, say, Sam Hain and the Misfits. You've b- both bands are about Halloween. One band, w- one band is about like trick or treating and fucking, you know, dressing up all ghoulish and, and fun. It's all fun. And then the other band is like dead serious. That's what Sam Hain is. It's 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 about Halloween still, but it's about dead serious. It's about all the stuff that Halloween's based on. When you strip away all the modern pop culture connotations of Halloween, you're left with Sam Hain. And then Sam Hain morphs into the fucking bluesy metal stripped down vibe of fucking Danzig. Um, Jerry only says, right, that's it. Total fun. Um, Mike stacks. Now he seems to be taking himself really seriously with all the Satan shit. Jerry only. Well, that, and here's Jerry. This is the beginning of Jerry only being like long with his long winded answers. Ready? Well, that's the problem. You see, the thing is you got to be able to laugh at yourself to be open-minded enough to improve. Once you think that you can't make a fucking error, that's when you lose your fucking imagination. Ah, man, that's fuck. I, that's true. I agree with you, Jerry, uncle Jerry. You wind up stagnating yourself because you think you've got the answer and the answer is something different for everybody. You know what I mean? It's a floating type of thing. What you believe is the best thing for you today. By the end of the week, you may think that it's another way, but if you get too close minded, he's playing his own song. That's all. And that's unfortunate. The thing that aggravated me was that a lot of publicity about his band to make his band sound good was by slagging off uh, his old band. How great's your new guitar player? How much do you hate the guys in your old band? What's your issue? Ha ha ha. What are you trying to tell us? Because the other band is a bunch of jerks. Your band is good now. It's got nothing to do with the two. Ha 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 ha. There's no comparison between the two. You see, he blew his big chance. Not true. But I know he's ripping off his new guys. I know everybody's on salary. That's true. Glenn had Erie and John Christ and um, fucking Chuck. Chuck Biscuits, they were all on a meager salary. Um, and that's the way Glenn runs the show. That's just how he does it. Um, nobody owns a piece of his action. He's a one-man show. He'd rather be the big guy in a smaller bowl than a big fish in a big sea, and that's his problem. But I guess that's good because he's got the wrong attitude on what to sell, you know? The B-movie Misfits from the late 70s was the thing. He's still living in that shadow. And it's a shame he, and that is true. So here, okay. So now to flip the coin here, it's true. Glenn always lived in the fucking shadow of the misfits. And that's why he never wanted to talk about the misfits. He never did. He never wanted to fucking talk about them. He gets so fucking mad. If you brought up the misfits in the nineties and that's true. He did. He took himself fucking really seriously, but it worked. That's what Jerry doesn't understand in 1993. It worked. It worked up until a certain point, Danzig 4. After Danzig 4, the band begins to change. It's no longer a band. It becomes a rotating band with different players. And though there have been some great uh, pieces of music since the number four Danzig album, he's never been able to achieve the same sort of musical success that he did with those first four albums for being honest for being truthful is that to say there are not fucking great songs on certain records yeah man i fucking love uh i love kiss the skull believe it or not i love wiki wicked pussycat i think that's a really fun it's a right he's rapping it's hilarious it's he's a rap song i think um shit what else a black angel white angel is a great song Skin Carver. I love that he opens the set with Skin Carver. Great fucking song. Um, Come to Silver. Great fucking song. Uh, most of Death Red Sabaoth, Sabaoth is fucking great. Most of fucking Danzig Sings Elvis is fucking great. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving some stuff out. Point is, I will say this. I said this in the Danzig Sings Elvis episode. Pocket Full of Rainbows and Always on My Mind are two of the most interesting tracks that Glenn has done since 1994. Sorry to say it, but it's true. I've heard people say that both 
four and five are like secretly Sam Hain albums. I don't really understand that. Robbie says as much shit as five gets. Uh, one of his best vocal performances is Ashes from Danzig Five. You know, I'm going to have to give that a listen. I haven't listened to Five in a very, very long time. So I don't really, I can't really speak to that, but I will give it a listen to check it out. Check that shit out. All right, let's finish this fucking sucker. I think he would have been more successful if he would have worked with everybody that is on his side of the fence. I don't like people that need you when they need you. And if they don't need you, they can give a fuck about you. I always found that that's shallow shallowness. It's self-centered. I'm not that way. I never felt that way. I never felt that we were anything special. The pat on the back wasn't what it was about. It was about everybody saying how great you are and telling you it wasn't about everybody saying how great you are and telling you, Oh, you guys are cool and all that. We like doing it. And if everybody else liked it, that was great, but we were never, but we never put ourselves above John Q public. You know what I mean? Cause you're not the real heroes are the guys who get up and go to work every fucking day. That's hard. And that's precisely what Jerry does every day. He's kept very busy running his factory where Doyle also works in their spare time. They work on writing, playing and recording music with their new band, Christ the Conqueror. Musically, what's the story with what you've done since the misfits? This will be very interesting because this is right before Christ the Conqueror turns into Misfits 95. Both Christian themed bands, Christ the Conqueror is Christian themed, and Misfits 95 is secretly Christian themed. Could you imagine how mad Glenn Danzig would be if he realized that they're releasing? Because he probably has no idea. Glenn probably has no idea that any of the songs on American Psycho or Famous Monsters are secretly Christian songs. So He'd probably be fucking furious, especially in the 90s. Maybe not now. Maybe he wouldn't care as much, especially not right now when him and him and Jerry are making tons of music. Could you imagine Jerry only in 1993, like learning that he would reunite with Glenn, that they would sell out Madison Square Garden and each get paid a million dollars to play together? (laughs) It's like fucking insane. Fucking insane. Jerry only says since they've since the Misfits. We've improved our playing technique. We've improved our equipment. We've improved our outlook. We know what we want. What I want out of music is I want to enjoy it. When I play it, I want to like it. The thing is, like I tell Doyle, you know, we try and practice and keep the thing going. The main thing, I think this is the final page. My God, this was a, this was a, um, a marathon. This is a marathon fucking thing. Is that the final page? Oh my God, there's fucking more. Ugh. I'm not complaining. I just, you know, it's just a lot. I don't have any more seltzer. My throat's really thirsty. I'm sorry. I'll shut up. I'm complaining too much. Um, <laughs> There's Christ the Conqueror. Look at them. Look at them, man. Look at them. Look at those fucking guys. No makeup. Long ass fucking hair. Their guitars. So crazy. You know, in another fucking world, they would have become Christ the Conqueror would have become like the new man of war, you know? Huh. It's pretty funny. Um, it's the, the the paragraph continues is to produce something we're happy with, whether it pays for you or it doesn't, is not really the issue. The issue is that the music in the most part, uh, people use it as a business. They play shit. They promote shit. They promote garbage because they're making money. So they don't really care about what they're doing and what they're playing. It's very misleading. I'm not going to prostitute my love of the music for fame and fortune. I won't do it because what, and here's, here's, here's Jerry, Jerry money fucking talks, motherfucker. You know it. Glenn knows it. They both fucking know it. (laughs) I'm not going to prostitute my love of the music for fame and fortune. Uh, Come on. Um, I won't do it because once the fame and fortune take over, then everything else winds up sucking. It's like you get one bad apple and throw it in there and everything. And eventually you get a pile of fucking mush. It stinks, you know, and that's what happens. You get people harping in on your money. You can't trust this guy. You can't trust that guy. It's a lot of fucking bullshit. There's a lot of real parasites in the music business. And there's a lot of fucking wannabe people who want to hold positions in their jobs. You know, you know, they fuck around and I see it all the time. I got very little respect for the whole business in a way. 
I feel that I got spared. A buddy of mine told me that he was talking to Glenn after Glenn started getting some cash. And Glenn said he still felt like he was missing something. Even with the money, it doesn't comfort you. Oh, well, that's interesting. First, look at this picture of Jerry. Cool picture of Jerry. Look at Doyle's. Doyle's fucking devil vein down to the chest, chesticles, man. So he says that Glenn started to get cash and Glenn said he still felt like something was missing. Hmm. Up here, we're tight. I got my kids. We're married. I got horses. We got it all. Uh, Mike Stacks. When did you get married? Jerry only. Oh, I got married in 1980 in 82. I had a kid when I was in the band. Wow. So he had, so he got married in when walk among us was coming out. Uh, now I got a family and we do things. We go bowling or we go skiing. We got ski slopes out here. It's perfect. If I was a big star, I'd have to be on the road all the time. I wouldn't get to enjoy my family. So maybe I got to work hard a day, probably just as hard as driving from town to town, playing the three hour show. But at the same time, I get to go home every night and sleep in my own bed and watch my TV or take my dog down to the football field and run around those luxuries. Maybe the people who are big stars and shit, they don't mind, but that would bother me. I take it as it comes. The thing is you got to be happy with what you got. If you can be satisfied with what's dealt to you, then you're going to live a much happier life. That is true. I agree with you, Jerry on that because you're not always going to be uh, wanting shit. You can't have, you know? So I try not to screw anybody over. I try to make good on the, all the deals I make. Sometimes I got to pay through the nose. But I try to do that and keep my hands clean. So this uh, this is from a guy. This is from a guy who is making peace with the possible idea that he's never going to play as the Misfits again, even though he's fighting for the Misfits name. And once the Misfits are, once the Misfits are fucking back in action, you hear like in 1998, there's some interviews, and you hear Jerry say. The Misfits never died. We were just trying to get the name back. So this is wildly different from this is a guy who's made peace with the fact that he may never have uh, the life of a successful musician. But in a very short period of time, he's going to win that name back and all of this is going to go flying out the window. It does. You know, not to say that he doesn't have his family and his business and whatnot, but, you know, at, at a certain point, um, Jerry, for the next five years, Jerry, well, I mean, even longer than that, but the next five years, Jerry heavily starts touring as the Misfits again and, you know, starts making mo money, lots of money being in the Misfits. Eventually down the road, even further down the road, he, you know, uh, him and his wife split up for whatever reasons that they split up. You know, it changes. It all fucking changes, you know? So this is, but at this point in time, Jerry is trying to find contentment in his domestic life and there's nothing wrong with that i think that's beautiful man and it sounds like even if jerry is fighting for the name back it's really more about like the honor necessarily than happiness i don't think jerry and again this is just from what i'm gathering from reading this i don't think jerry is like you know it's not like winning the misfits name is going to make him happy again i just think that it's you know it's it's more about honor and validation on some level all going back to when, you know, he's realizing that he's getting not making fucking money and Glenn's making all the money from the stuff. And his dad is like, Jerry senior is like, what the fuck are you doing? Jerry, get out there, get your fucking band back. I spent all that money, you know, and like, go get a lawyer, you know, who knows? Um, Mike stacks, what's behind the name of your new band? Christ the conqueror, Jerry only. Well, basically I wasn't very happy with the Danzig project. Like he had, so, so Christ the conqueror, is literally the answer to fucking Danzig. That's that's his answer to Danzig. So even though he's disassociated from the band, he's talking about how Glenn is shitting on the old old on the guys when you know about not being experienced. And really, I think he's more talking about the eighties. He's talking about the Pusshead interview. He's not talking about in the nineties because by the nineties, Glenn's not talking about the Misfits anymore. He's talking about fucking. He's talking about um. Uh, he doesn't want to talk about the misfits. This, this is the Sam Hain days where he's still more openly talking about the misfits and slagging on his old band, band members and celebrating how the band in Sam Hain is so much better, you know. But here's Jerry doing the exact same fucking thing, right? He's doing the exact same thing, 
He's fucking, you know, um, uh, responding to Glenn as Danzig by being Christ the Conqueror. Well, basically, I wasn't very happy with the Danzig project. Like he had the T-shirt printed up with the demon killing Christ and shit like that. I kind of felt like it was very misleading. The problem is he's living off of his misfits fame. I mean, a little bit, but not really, man. Glenn is not actively promoting himself as ex misfits. He's not doing that. You know who does that is that's Bobby Steele. Bobby Steele, who today will not talk about the misfits at all. Try to interview Bobby Steele. He will not fucking talk to you. I've, I believe me when I was doing 1979, I was trying to pull interviews that were not my interviews because I don't, I want to keep that content exclusive for they came from Lodi and you wouldn't believe how hard it was to find him talking about the fucking misfits. It's come 2016, I think he stopped talking about the misfits. So the last four to five years, uh, Bobby doesn't talk, but he still goes by Bobby Steele, ex misfits. I mean, that's how he sells. That's how he, you know, that's part of the promotion for the undead. I, I'll never understand it, but you know, at the end of the day, that's his severance, man. That's, that's, you know, the misfits name has kept Bobby Steele eating for a very long time. Um, not in a bad way either at all. Like, you know, does think about all the fucking work Bobby put into that band and, you know, his playing and his playing on the recordings and he didn't see, you know, a fraction of the fucking money that he should have seen maybe from the royalties. Who knows? Um, I once, Bobby once told me that the, all he's ever made in 30, 40 years of misfitsdom is about $70,000 by his, by his, account seventy thousand dollars from from that stuff um so jerry here is saying the problem is is he's living off of his mr saying and this is the beginning of when jerry just talks mad shit about glenn in interviews he would do it all through the 90s it just would never stop and then around the 2000s he starts to be like oh you know glenn and i never really had a problem with glenn me and glenn glenn and, glenn and i are good you know that sort of thing and that was probably in response to because 10 years from now, Glenn and Jerry are going to meet in L.A. to talk about doing a reunion. Nine years in 2002. And, and Jerry will ruin it. Um, the problem is these kids, uh, they just come up and they don't know about it. They think great band and they see these guys in Glenn and they think that's the same uh, kind of thing we were into is what he's now into. And that just isn't the case. So I guess the name was a reaction to that, to, to stuff it in their face. I knew it wouldn't, uh, I knew it would be hard to work with, but I really didn't care. And the logo is halfway decent. If you haven't heard my stuff, when you hear it, you're going to shit. Cause I think it's where the misfits should have went with Christ, the conqueror, Jerry, AKA Mo the great and Doyle have traded in punk for heavy, heavy rock, but their goal is to still make music with the kind of power and energy uh, that they used to unleash in the misfits on their CD cassette. They have, uh, they thunder through six hard rock and songs with a force that would make most other heavy groups cower like March of the Megamites. In spite of all the bitterness surrounding the breakup of the misfits, Jerry speaks with real pride about his past. He knows that no matter what happens, he will always be a misfit. I think that is prevalent in this interview. He does talk with pride. You know, and why shouldn't he, man? In the same way that, like, you know, he's resentful that the band got so big in the 90s, left such an exquisite corpse, and Jerry can't have any of that fucking, that any of any of the, the milk of that success. And he wants it. Now, this is a picture right here. See these gloves? That's, I believe, even with the misfits in the background, I believe... And yeah, because his, his devil lock is short because he started doing the devil lock again. This is a late era Christ the Conqueror fucking Mo the Great. I don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it is. And the reason why this right here, he didn't have that when he was in the Misfits. That all came with Christ the Conqueror. So again, if someone wants to prove me wrong, correct me, please feel free. Mike Stacks. Uh, why do you think it is that the Misfits' popularity has grown ever since the band has broken up? Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Danzig, Jer and later Misfits 95. 
Jerry only. To be honest with you, the thing about the Misfits, it's like American Pie and Chevrolet. It's the American dream, man. It's the artists. The Misfits were the artists' American dream, especially when it came to the fucking Fiend Club. Notice that the Fiend Club doesn't get mentioned once in this interview. You know why? Because I don't think Jerry had very much to do with any of it. I think that was all Glenn. You would think that would have come up when he was talking about sending stuff out. I don't know. I, th- I don't know. Um, what it is, is meat and potatoes. It's doing powerful music, simplistic to the point. And at the time it was coming from the heart. That was the whole thing. We believed what we were, uh, we believe we were doing great stuff. Plus the fact that we were up against the odds. Nobody knew what we were doing. Everybody had no concept of what the fuck we were doing. Everything was not held back. You know what I mean? Mike stacks as a person. How would you say you're different now to when you were in the misfits? Jerry only none. Ha 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 ha. Mike stacks. It didn't change you at all. Jerry only. No, it's pretty much a constant thing. You know, I try to do what's right and work as hard as I can. I do believe that Jerry does work really hard. You can never, no matter what you ever fucking say about Jerry, you cannot take away the fact that that dude works his fucking ass off. He does. He does Doyle too. They all have a fucking work ethic. They do. Even if Glenn didn't work a straight job, he fucking busted his ass. These guys work their fucking asses off. Mike Stacks didn't change at all. Jerry only, no, it's pretty much a constant thing. You know, I try to do what's right and work as hard as I can at whatever the hell I've got to do. That's pretty much it. I always have the same outlook. There's a plan nine from outer space thing. And then here's the, this is the Misfits discography, right? Shows you all the stuff. The following discography lists all official of vinyl releases for reasons of space and sanity. If not bothered documenting the many variations in sleeve and label designs, color vinyl, test pressings, promos, or dozens of bootlegs of live and studio material, that would be another article itself. And that's in 1993. All are U.S. releases, unless stated otherwise. Yeah, Cherry Red is the U.K. and Germany. Aggressive rock productions. Although it says 12-inch singles and EPs. I believe Beware is a 10-inch. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe so. And look at this. Where's Static Age? You don't see it. Look at that. That is fucking crazy. Look at this. The discography starts with 1982 with Walk Among Us. Earth AD, Legacy of Brutality. This is the Static Age album, really. Uh, Evil Live, Misfits, and the Walk Among Us uh, reissue, and Flipside Vinyl Fanzine, which at with Attitude. So the idea of a Static Age album or 12 Hits from Hell is non existent at this time in 1993. Wow. Two fucking hours have passed. I can't believe we did two fucking hours on you know so come and subscribe here there you go zim you just do that go go and subscribe now people all right now i'm really fucking leaving box of saltines camel saltines Frozen pizzas, rice cakes, one dozen burritos, track to on DVD, a three little bottle of a mountain dew. Yeah! Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know. But I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full-time 
uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> So right now, I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers, and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee. But it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. <laughs> the YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes, that's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.